All right. Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to my stream today. Um, hope everyone's doing well. I've had a, a busy week. I was just at Netlify's uh, conference, Netlify Compose, this week, and uh, been just catching up. Come say hi in the chat if you're joining as you're joining on here. How was Compose? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> different kind of conference, right? Like we did Jamstack l last year, uh, and it was very like front end frameworks, you know, Tanner dropped his amazing router, um, and whatnot. So like it was, a uh, you know, a, a very different feel where, uh, compose it was a lot of enterprise customers coming in. We, there, a lot of the conversations were about um, connecting the dots. Um, there was developers and business people, people from different parts of the organization coming in. And uh, yeah, the, the focus was very much on um, building out solutions like in practical space. We had the like, um, uh, they get, uh, I think it was VP of technology from Riot Games uh, give a keynote and you, like it was a very much a, um, like it, it had a very different sort of vibe but um, you know it was at the Fairmount Hotel in SF so very nice uh, venue good food good drinks good company you know so I had a good time. That's where you found out about Clark, but Jamstack Conf last year. Finally, some news about Marco. Yeah, well, yeah, it's it's been a while, hasn't it? We had both Taylor and uh, Dylan on stream just over a year ago, but it's you know from the perspective, it's been maybe a little uh, radio silent. Hey Ryan, how's it going? Ryan works on the Marco team uh, and also is responsible for big part in creating Solid's router. Yeah, and Dylan's here too. Yeah. So, so, hey Brandon. Oh, my dad's here too. What, what do you know? Maybe. <laughs> or someone who has the same name that's misspelled. It's Carniato, not Caniato, but yeah. All right. Hmm. Yeah, I don't know what's up. I'm I'm pretty sure I'm still. Let me check the settings right here. Yeah, I'm I'm streaming at 7:20. Just the lighting is perfect today. Like, what's going on? I don't know. <laughs> all right, all right, all right. Just yeah, no, this is orange juice. Um, I I was a little slow. I know you're you're catching up on the comments. Let me open Twitch and make sure that people are live there. I, I should probably tell people that we're live on Twitch. Um, anyway, let me see here. My channel. All right, there we go. Cool, yeah. We've only got 10 people on Twitch right now compared to everyone else on YouTube, so gotta get, gotta get some, uh, some Twitch going. Hi, hi. All right, yeah. Um, yeah, let me get on the old it's funny I, I still call it Twitter but you know people keep on correct me out there I keep on hearing Marco the best yeah I mean often you know everyone talks about how you know their framework of choice is the best framework but unfortunately those people are all wrong because there can only be one best framework and that's clearly Marco so um, I apologize to all of you out there um, but, you know, you know, it's like Highlander. There can be only one. I, I recently had an eBay engineer I interviewed brag to me that he made his team migrate many things to React from Marco. And I was like, what did you say? What did you say that backwards? <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, there, 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 that, that's a whole other conversation. Um, yeah, 
it's the, I don't even know if we, if I want to get into eBay politics. I don't work there anymore. Um, but <laughs> that was always a fun piece. But yeah, let me actually tell people that we're we're live, right? Where are we? Um, where's the stream? Yeah, let me pop up my screen for a second. Yeah. There is some tension there because there's a lot of people who, who want to use the, you know, what they consider the latest greatest, but they, like, I, I've talked to them, they have no, like, they don't, they don't, they just don't know and they're, and they're kind of like, I want to use React so that in my next job I can, you know, I can do well. You're ruining my future, right? When my, two years of my stock, uh, you know, vesting cliffs, you know, then I want to be able to switch to a different company and yeah, um. Yeah, I th it was it was always amusing seeing the the push towards React when it was like clearly the worst a worse solution for what was being built, and it is like it, it's a fun argument to have because it's like there was there was no good argument. Watch the stream and you'll see that there, there's always a different philosophies, right? Like um, Marco, if if you had a spectrum where you had, you know, solid. New Svelte, not Old Svelte. Old Svelte was in its own zone a bit, but New Svelte and Marco, like Svelte would actually be kind of in the middle. Like Marco's taken the compiler beyond what anyone's dreamed of. So yeah, it's, you'll see. And I, I you know, I obviously have uh, interesting opinions about compilers and I want to see the technology flourish, but there's also like different zones you can work on. But yeah, okay, we're we're we're, we're killing it right now. We probably should bring our guest on pretty soon. Hey, Johnny. Uh, React is okay for internal tools. That's how we angular it. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Well, no, it, that's a funny thing. It was open source back in 2014, but maybe um, let me first tweet this out. So what is it? Quote tweet or quote post. What, what, I don't even quote. It's just a quote now. Um, live. And then Twitch. T this is where I get all the Twitch viewers. I tell them where to go. Um, that's my, yeah. Okay. Cool. All right. Let's, let's get down to business here then. Cause yeah. Did I hear zone JS? Don't you know zone JS is coming to the browser officially? It's called async context. Angular was always right. Just as they're getting away from it. Uh, it there's nuance to that, but I, I like playing with the perception. Okay. Okay. Um, anyways, let me, create a banner here. I'm actually really excited to have uh, our guest on uh, this week because um, he's been on before on a dual stream with him and Dylan. But if you've ever, if you know anything about putting Michael and Dylan together, like they make sure that neither of them can get a word in edgewise. So like we didn't actually get to spend the time talking to Michael about Michael. Dylan came back on and like suddenly you hear a whole different story. You hear about real, you hear about like, you know, how he got into development at Marco, but the, the first stream was just like them constantly like one upping and interrupting each other. So um, I think I think this will be good. And besides, I haven't talked to Michael um, legitimately for ages. Um, so we need to catch up anyways, and I can use the stream to justify my time. So yeah, uh, let's 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 get going here. So um, without further ado, I'm gonna welcome um, Michael Rawlings onto the stream uh marco visionary um i don't know about that but <laughs> i don't know what, what, do you, what do you do on the marco team we already know that dylan builds everything like he's the one actually writing the code he makes the compiler the yes. script i mean there there's a little bit of truth to that dylan is absurdly productive um yeah we've got a, a pretty good team now um i enjoy working on it um, I, I've been mostly focused on, um, Marco six and some things around, um, that, uh, and yeah, there's, there's a lot of ideas. Um, a lot of them are bad. Um, <laughs> and we, we have to, you know, go down a path to figure out that, that they were bad. Um, but right. Yeah. So your job is to think about, think, come up with all the bad ideas essentially. 
I guess so. <laughs> oh man. Uh, no, uh, in all seriousness, um, Michael's, uh, big part of like the think tank part of, 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 uh, Marco and, uh, he, he went away actually, I, I think it was on paternity leave, uh, for a month or so. And he came back. It was like March, 2021. I remember. Um, and you came back from maternity leave and you're like, yeah, I, everything we're doing, I, I, I don't want to do this anymore. And you basically, <laughs> you, after working on it for like, this was already V2. Like we, we worked on the first version. They worked for on the first version of Marco six for like a year before I got there. And then we picked up on V2 over the summer. And then Michael came in and he was like, no, no, this is. Yeah. Like, and I mean, Marco six has been dragging on and a, a lot of that has been, um, you know, rethinking, uh, approaches probably more time than times than we should have. Um, but, but to be and fair, I can probably be blamed for a lot of that, but to be fair, like some of like these ideas were incredible. Like we have a name for this stuff now, but when he came back in March, 2021, he pitched resumability to us. We just didn't know what to call it. Um, he, he was like, he was like, we were trying to solve some async thing. He's like, why, what if we just didn't run any, you know, JavaScript on the browser when we started up? Like, what if we just didn't hydrate? And, um, this, as I said, um, this, this was like a completely independent, uh, venture, like quick, hadn't even come out yet. Um, there was like no one, they, they were obviously working on it at the time. Yeah. Yeah. So. But it, like, but, oh, obviously. Cause like, like Mishko gave a talk in 2019, but as everyone knows, I basically had given up on angular a few years ago and no one was even paying. I like, if you told me that angular was where I was going to like find keys to SSR, I would have never believed you in a million years. Cause they didn't even have hydration. They had like destructive, redoing stuff. So I, I didn't, it didn't even occur to me to look in that direction. Misco went off on his own, ended up uh, making cute, which became quick. But uh, we we were kind of oblivious to that, even though he had like two years on us. And Dylan just, or sorry, Michael comes back from vacation and then just starts pitching this, this idea of how we could, you know, completely change the approach we do hydration, which caused version three of Marco six, which I believe is what we're still on today. Yeah, there, I mean, there's been some reworkings of the the mechanisms, um, but uh, let's see. Dylan's there. giving you cred. Um, but yeah, the 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 high level view of of Marco six hasn't really changed um, from that point on. Some implementation details have, um, especially around signals. Yeah. Um, we've got like this compiled signal thing that we've gone through several iterations of. Um, and yeah, I think that's finally in a solidified place as well. Nice, nice, nice. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so yeah, as, as I said, I think that kind of establishes uh, a bit of what um, Michael does. Michael has um, many accomplishments. Uh, um, for me, most I, I think one of his biggest com uh, accomplishments and gifts back to the community is actually he is my fa absolutely favorite um, meme artist, actually. You guys might not even know this. People don't really bother time, but this, this, this multi-template meme, which is, you know, you know, just amazing here, what ended up uh, being actually where it's actually three memes in one look. It's this meme, this meme, and this meme is actually one of his creations, right? Um, and yeah, Ember Ember had observable reactivity back in the day. That's why I actually chose it over Angular back then. But you guys might have even seen it, like originally. This uh, this uh, this 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 beauty from Theo originated anonymously, and I, I think we know where the source came from now. Let's con let's continue. Um, <laughs> you know, I seriously just some of my favorite stuff here. Um, introducing the new Marco logo. <laughs> this this is another classic. Um, I I, wa I swear I watched that documentary. This this is an this is another another classic. Seriously, it just keeps on going. 
Uh, anyway, for 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 those, I think of you... that's where it started. I I started having uh, I don't know some spicy thoughts. You didn't start having some spicy thoughts. <laughs> these these images just never left the private Discord or Slack channels <laughs> until until this point. You've been doing this for years, so yeah. If if you don't follow Michael, um, you might want to check it out because he's a, more than occasionally entertaining and criminally underfollowed. So just throwing that out there. This is a yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah might be true that's a distinguished meme artist yeah see little known fact about michael anyway um but uh how did you let, let's go back a little bit because i don't think we got to cover this uh previously but how did you even get into like like Marco Frimmerk people I was talking to some, some like it came up in the chat and someone's like you know uh, earlier was like I don't understand how Marco is it an open source library is it internal it, it's been open source all this time how did you even yeah. get involved like because you got involved after it was open sourced it, it was originally right. created by Patrick right yeah Patrick steel item um and yeah um so after college, I was doing some like, it, it was essentially freelance web development. I, I had a company and I did have like another employee, but it was really just like the, the two of us um, doing some, some freelance web development. And um, because I am the way that I am, uh, I couldn't just use frameworks that were like off the shelf or CMSs. And I ended up like building that, um, that kind of stuff, you, you know, know you are like you, <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't help myself. Um, and so, uh, I'd gone through several, um, iterations and, uh, I was currently working on, um, a, uh, like a visual kind of CMS um, that was still like developer driven, but then you could go in and like visually um, edit it. And I wanted like what you wrote as a developer to be like just basically HTML. Um, and I found Marco um, and Marco had compiler hooks kind of into the, the HTML. Um, and so I started digging into that for the purposes of like, um, doing transforms and I had, um, like some com components that could like query your database to pull in, um, information. And so like, you could, you know, go in and like add an item right there and it would add things to the database. This is circa, I obviously after open source, so like 2014, 2015, um, yeah. Why, why was this appealing over, say, something like React? Um, so, I mean, I, I had used React. I liked React. Um, for, for specifically what I was um, doing, because I, I was looking at, um, we, we had some more involved projects, but uh, uh, there were a bunch of people that just, like, wanted a, like, kind of marketing site. Um, you know, was getting requests for that, and I wanted to make it easy for them to to go and update, you know, their content. Um, and so, and, and and I had to build it myself because you know couldn't just use WordPress or something. Um, <laughs> of course not. So, um, yeah, for for that kind of site, like the, the the SSR that that Marco had was like, I mean, it it made sense to. Um, to go that route um, or what was, um, I mean, a pr probably what I should have been doing was just generating a static site from the CMS. Um, right. But, uh, I wasn't, you know, quite that um, far into to things to be doing like a, a build. It was basically, you know, deploy this and then, you know, just data changes in the database and it wasn't like right. a new build or anything. 
so you saw that Marco was very close to HTML and that was appealing. So you just like, I, I guess the, yeah. the, 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 to be fair is a lot of people on the stream might not even know what Marco is exactly. I'm going to, I'm going to pull up the website for just a second so okay. people can get a, a, get a, get a feeling for it. What, Marco or Marco, it's MarcoJS.com. Yeah. MarcoJS.com. So not the playground, just uh, all these shortcut links and autocompletes. Okay. I'm just going to throw this up here. Um, because Marco's a pretty cool framework in that, yeah, I mean, it looks like HTML. Everything is a tag, essentially. Like the for loops, the tag, everything's a tag. Um, components generally classically looked almost like web components. They they weren't, but essentially you just, everything is a, like a lowercase element. Um, and then you would add interactivity by like adding a class to it. So it's single file component format with this very XML or HTML based syntax. But what was cool about it, I guess, I don't know if this sold you on it is these ideas of like out of order streaming, like you see this. Honestly, the... what these, these were um, nice to haves. Um, yeah. I, the, the streaming was important to me because I was looking at other things. I had used dust for a project. Um, yeah. Dust at the time was like the only other Node.js template and language that supported streaming. Right. Um, and I had looked at Nunjux, um, which had async uh, support, but it actually still buffered everything. So I was like, well, if I'm going to be pulling this data from the database live, like I want to be able to flush out, you know, the, the static parts of the page. Um, right. But the, the biggest thing actually was the compiler and like being able to hook in and, and do stuff. Yeah, uh, I'm with that. Yeah, for for people who don't know, Marco compiler basically you'd write your code and it'd look a lot like this, like I'm showing here, and then it would auto generate the islands, and it would basically it was like an islands framework. This is why often people poke in my chat and say hashtag um, Marco did it first because they've had yeah you know, um, they they've had. Uh, these kind of features for like almost a decade now um, in different forms, right? Uh, but, oh, you're getting credit for another Marco did it first. Marco did memes before HTMX. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I think HTMX probably does it better. Yeah. But yeah, no, uh, th this is very interesting technology. I remember for me personally, uh, async fragments i'm just going to drop this in the, the chat here for a second uh just so people can see it this is an old ebay blog from december 8 2014 where the mark where the marco creator explains out of order streaming and basically exposes async fragment which essentially is like it's like the, i guess the await tag in some frameworks but it, it's kind of like shows like suspense back in like 10 years ago to be fair his, if I understand correctly, his inspiration for for this was actually stuff that happened a decade before that, and big time a part of it was Facebook's uh, big pipe, which was for their PHP backend. React ended up having that same influence, which brought streaming and and, and server components into modern days. But Marco basically had this about ten years ago in an open source yeah. JavaScript framework that any, anyone could use. But for you, I, I, I can kind of see it was like you, you were looking for like a, a server rent, like templating language primarily. Yeah, I mean, I, I just wanted to be able to like code up an HTML file. The components were nice um, and uh, just have the, the content editable. So it, it was it was even things like just saying like, um, like I put might put like href and then like colon editable on like as part of the, the attribute name and then I'd hook in with the compiler and like wrap that whole thing in a component that would like um if you passed uh like a, a query param and were logged in as like a, an admin of the site then it gave you this like editing interface kind of inline on the page right um so you started working with did you reach out to Patrick for bug fixes or how did you even yeah um so I started the, the compiler wasn't documented. Of course not. Is um, it? Is it documented now? To a degree. 
<laughs> um, so actually, if you go to compiler, um, scroll down and, and right and Advanced. now today, uh, it's under reference, reference. compiler. Yeah. Um, okay. Fair so enough. It, this is a lot more than there was at the time. Yeah. Um, and it also, the Marco compiler now builds on top of Babel. Um, so kind of at the end here, we just tell you like, these are the extra AST nodes that you have access to in addition to um, uh, like the, the JavaScript AST nodes. Right. And then. Um, okay. Yeah. No, this is pretty good. You actually talk about. And then about you can use like the Babel playbook. Yeah. You talk about the five stages in the Mar Marco compiler yeah. here. And, and then. It. It was non-existent at the time, so. Okay. Um, <laughs> yeah, this is. Oh so, yeah, I was reaching expecting. out, asking questions. Um, I was developing on Windows at the time, and there were some bugs on Windows, so I had to make like a couple PRs to fix some things. Windows. Um. So yeah, that's sort of how I got involved in the the project, and at some point, uh, Patrick was like. Do you have any interest working on this full time? And I was like, maybe. And so, um, yeah, the the job at eBay just kind of fell in my lap. Got on a ch chat with Patrick, um, and then uh, chatted with a, a couple other people from eBay, and eventually moved out to San Jose, California, from Virginia. Yeah. Yeah, I know. Virginia now, by the way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that was um, interesting. I, I moved down to San Jose to join the Marco team during COVID, and then by the time COVID like was lifted, the team wasn't in San Jose anymore. <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Dylan's just qu quipping in there. Yeah, um, no, he's he's right. Yeah, no, no concrete I, answers. But there uh, barely are concrete answers. That's part of the problem. Okay, so <laughs> you you the, you worked on Marco through, I guess, the Marco three and Marco four release time periods, generally. Yeah. Um, so this was I got started with Marco like just after the Marco three release. Right. Um, and then uh, when I joined, um, I started um, seeing a lot of things that I wanted to change. Um, and for some reason, Patrick listened, and we ended up with Marco 4. Ooh. Sorry, you, you still have the classic doc sites from the original version. So yeah. I can see just how bad the compiler docs were in Marco 2. Yes. There, there they are. It was like, you know, how to, how to pass the template to the compiler and like this is what it outputs. Okay. So. One thing though I do like, Marco actually the compiler is quite extensible like a lot of the newer frameworks kind of doing this compiler stuff they try and keep it away from you marco kind of exposed this um somewhat early days for plugins yeah. and stuff and i guess this was largely trying to it's tricky to try and do a lot of the logic around like partial hydration and stuff like especially if you if, if you rely on a compiler to do that you probably also need a it, it helps have access to a compiler to extend that. Yeah, um, I, I think a lot of it actually, you know, like the way I've seen the compiler being used, um, I think in a lot of ways was to just provide sugar almost. Um, and I mean, th there, there are some interesting things that you can uh, do with it, but like, even going back to like the CMS that I was talking about, it, it was kind of nice that I could just like, you know, do href editable, right? And then yeah. like have the compiler hook in and do something with that rather than creating like a custom H1 component that you could like, you know, do something with. I could just do that on a native tag and 
um, and change the behavior. Nice. Okay. Um, yeah. But I, I think as we're we're moving more towards the tags API, which I'm I'm sure we'll get into more and everything, um, we're we're hoping that people don't need to lean on the the compiler APIs as much right. as the language itself is sufficient to represent everything that you you need it to. Right. Right. Yeah. So like uh, just jumping a little forward in time here, <laughs> moved to San Jose, worked on the Marco project for let's see, Marco three came out in two thousand fifteen. So worked on it for roughly a year, and then Patrick's like, "See ya." Um, yeah. So, Leaving yeah. eBay, going to Amazon. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that 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 seems spicy. Just going from one e-commerce platform to the to the other platform. People don't know Patrick created Marco, but he also created Morph DOM, which is actually used in a lot of projects. Yeah. For doing uh, DOM diffing, like Live View uh, is is one that uses Morph DOM. I found out. Um, so his, his, his work from his early days and at eBay and that are still, it's still out there, um, all over the place, but, um, yeah, uh, suddenly, uh, Patrick left and Dylan, I believe who was hired on like uh, two months before that, um, and yourself were basically the Marco team. Yeah, we, we actually had, um, a third for a little bit, um, Austin, um, right. and uh, he left shortly after Patrick left, um, and it, that that was kind of an interesting um, dynamic because at the time Patrick and Austin were were kind of remote, um, or not kind of they were remote, um, and Dylan and I were um, in the the San Jose office. Um, but then when Patrick left, Austin was like the only um, remote one. And I, I think it is, um, you know, again, to the, the whole remote work thing. But I think it is difficult being the, like the only remote person um, on your team. Yeah. Makes sense. Uh, but you, you basically... Marco is pretty distributed um, now. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, we're in a different world now. It's just interesting because yeah. Marco 4 was like the the big i felt like that's when marco showed up on people's radars like patrick re released a bunch of articles about like marco versus react why is marco so fast this is when those benchmarks came out that like basically showed marco could like server render like 10 no actually back then it was like 20 or 30 times faster than react like and yeah the um server side rendering shootout if you wanted to pull that up you don't have to is it, is it still here? No, it's not linked from here. We never linked it from the, um, yeah, that, that was more just like a bragging article. Like th these other articles actually have some useful information in them. And it was written by Patrick. It was me, actually. No, it was you? Oh, yeah, you. Yeah. Okay. There. Michael Rawlings. Let's see if this will show up. Marco Preact Racks. This is the Alibaba framework, React and Vue. And it's like, server rendering is slower with NPM React. Yeah, like people in, on Twitter disbelief. They're all like fighting each other over a bunch of stuff. But it was like, they're like, I'm like this bit, like they're all fighting over this like, like little realm. And Marco's like, but like, I mean, um, it's it's string concatenation, right? And and there's plenty of other frameworks that are in this like speed range now. Now, right? now. is there? Spelt, Spelt is, is there? Yeah. Um, Vue actually, Vue is there now too. Okay, are they? I wasn't aware of that, but yeah. I mean, it, and it's it's pretty easy to get there, and on some level, it's right. It's like just create HTML strings on the server. Don't do all this extra stuff that you have to do in the browser. Hmm. I just, sorry, a little off topic. I just saw this comment about Kroger and about them going all in React and e-commerce. And it's this, 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 if you, if you, if you want to know more about Kroger specifically and this, I really, really strongly suggest people check out a stream that I did a year ago with another member of the Marco team. Um, let's see if I can, I can pull this one up here. Uh, do, 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 uh, this one. Yeah. It's with, it's with Taylor. Um, 
and he was working at Kroger. He was working at Kroger, and he basically. I'm gonna post the link down here. He uh, he basically sh showed off rebuilding Kroger with Marco, and he went through the process. He went on the Kroger website, bought cell phones from Kroger's uh, like store things they sold themselves uh set up a simulation of a network in india or china like places where these places like networks like were actually being used with kroger worldwide thing and absolutely showed how the marco app completely demolished every other like technology both kroger's react app which was like the worst in it walmart.com amazon what like it it was in like Amazon was respectable considering like this is you know a guy's project for six months versus like the actual site, but like every other one was just like horrendously like slow. Even the mobile app, the the thing he built with Marco like loaded much faster, and it was it was incredible story. I honestly w watch this even if you care about a real world use case of where these kind of loading performance metrics matter. Um, he, he, he also has a bunch of articles where he goes into detail. Um, yeah, really good articles. Yeah. I, I, if anyone wonders if that Kroger decision was a technical one, um, it's very clear that it was not that it, like they they had, he gave them almost zero room from a technical standpoint to justify the decision of react in any sort of way. Um, but they want react for, you know, other reasons and, they've got react and i guess we'll just have to see how it goes but it was like it, it, it's an it's an amazing story sorry just a tangent when i saw this no, talk um, anyway sorry uh yeah so yeah it's not just server rendering it's not it's saves savings on serialization savings on hydration um yeah i i mean marco 4 uh why is marco so fast yeah like talks about the compilation. I, I remember I remember this release going out and a lot of comparisons to React at the time because Next.js was just coming out, you know, and to be fair, yeah, this talks about how Marco compiles to just string concatting instead of a virtual DOM on the server, which just, it just blew things open on so many ways. Partial hydration, out of order streaming, like any other framework at this time doing server rendering um, like couldn't, couldn't touch it. Like yeah, it, it's interesting, like how we, we got here, uh, because Marco three actually only rendered to HTML. Um, and so, uh, it, and morph Dom was a way to diff a string of HTML with the existing Dom. Um, and so that's how. Marco three works like it would just render HTML on the server. That was really fast. Yeah. And then uh, it would render HTML in the browser and then diff it with the DOM. And that was eh, maybe fast enough. Um, with Marco four, we decided to go to a virtual DOM to reduce some of that overhead of creating right. the, it, it parsed the HTML to actual DOM nodes and then <laughs> diff these two DOM trees. So you know, we got to remove some of that overhead of creating, you know, real DOM nodes just to throw them away, away. By, by going virtual DOM. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And that makes a lot of sense. But on the server, it, it was always just a server string templating language. So like yeah. it always had incredible fast server rendering. It all, And then with the uh, Marco 4 really solidified the automated compiler islands thing. It just like, you just write your template and yeah, then... Before Marco 4, um, Marco Widgets was kind of the, uh, was this like extra package that you could add on for the client side interactivity. Right. Um, and that did have the, the stateful updates um, in the, I think it was version six, it was right. added. Um, and then, uh, but yeah, Marco, Four was the first time that we like actually unified that client side update with you know the the core framework, um, right? You know, under one roof. Yeah. Yeah. No. And it, yeah. And, and I think Marco was pretty small too. It was about thirteen kilobytes, I think, at that time period. Yeah. Uh, 
So like G zipped. Um, the, the, the big thing that we're not talking about here, and I think this actually people are missing here is yes, there's a language barrier. Marco, because it has islands and partial hydration, it, it's an MPA framework, a JavaScript MPA framework. Those didn't really exist before. Like people now know those because there's fresh and Astro, but Marco in 2013, 14 was like, yeah, we were JavaScript framework that does multi-page apps. That was like unheard of. So. Right. And I mean, it, it's kind of this whole thing, right? Like we were, we had this templating language that allowed you to like add, you know, interactivity at different points. And originally that interactivity was like hundred percent imperative. It was like, okay, you, you know, you, you've got this hook here to like get into this widget and we'll give you the Dom node. And then you just, you know, do everything in vanilla JavaScript or jQuery or, you know, whatever you need to do to make this um, thing interactive. Um, and then we added the the declarative stateful updates on top of that. So it just kind of evolved from this like base of just really zero JavaScript, right? Like just shipping a, a page that just has HTML, being able to layer in a little bit of interactivity. Um, and that wasn't fully automatic um, until Marco 4. Yeah. Uh, but at, with Marco 4, it was just like, you just write a component and it's interactive on the page and it just kind of works. Yeah, no, I'm just looking at this. The migration guide from Marco 3 to Marco 4 is quite length lengthy. If, if Marco yeah. was more popular, this would have been your Angular 2 moment. Um, yeah, um, and uh, actually, I mean, reality is uh, there are still these widget. Marco still supports that widget API. So, like, there are part of the reason that we have links to Marco three there. Marco two really isn't used, but Marco three is because like those APIs actually do still um, exist at eBay. We've kept backwards compatibility um, mm -hmm. for you know like almost everything uh, that yeah. could be a hundred percent safely migrated. Well, what what I'm getting to is. If people want to understand Marco's positioning a little bit, is Dylan and Mark and Michael took over Marco after Patrick left, and they they were basically in charge of upgrading all of eBay from Marco three to Marco four, which is not an easy upgrade to do. I believe it took two years. It went from two thousand seventeen to two thousand nineteen um, ish time period. Yeah. So. With just two people updating, I mean, obviously the product teams were part of it, but you know, they need an expert. With two people basically updating all of eBay.com and the guy who basically was the public face of Marco disappear, disappearing, just kind of going off. No one really talked about Marco for a couple of years, so much so that around by 2019, 2020-ish, I don't think it, it kind of faded from people's memories. And people were like, "What wasn't it that like pug-like like so, I remember someone saying, "Like, isn't it like Pug, like a server templating language?" And that's like it's kind of crazy because, like, when you guys first approached me after you know reading a couple of the articles I had about reactivity and stuff, uh, I I honestly was on the same boat. I had no clue that this technology was existed in open source for so many years, like just incredible capability that no one else had really focused on. Um, so yeah, no, it's it's it, it's kind of interesting because during that time, spent that whole time doing that migration. You guys started working on what we become Marco six. People might be like, "What about Marco 5? Well, Marco five is is just a update to, of the compiler to Babel. Like, is there a migrating Marco five upgrade guide? Ensure that your stuff works with Marco four. Upgrade your dependencies. So install some stuff. optional stuff like yeah. basically there was no migration from marco 4 to marco 5 yeah, it was it like it has the exact same uh runtime what did happen is we split out the so i mentioned that we still support um like the these widgets the um that got split out that compatibility got split out into a separate package so that's what that like longer section right um, was about was making sure that compatibility layers installed but yeah okay well in that case, um, let's jump ahead now to the okay. future because I think most of the other content and stuff you guys did during those early 
uh, the, the next stage we actually covered in our last stream. Um, but I want uh, that kind of gives you you all kind of like a, a bit of a history of Michael with with Marco and how Marco got here. Um, so been working on Marco six, and the other big thing that I think came out is uh, obviously a Marco run, which is uh, a meta framework. Yeah, and then um, uh, I guess TypeScript support. So um, let, let's talk about all three of those topics. Um, where should we start? Um, I mean, if people are coming from our last stream, maybe TypeScript is actually a good place to, to start. Okay, yeah, we can talk about TypeScript. Is um, there a good place for me to look at it in, in practice? Um, we could open up a, an editor. Sure. Or can I do it in a, one of these playgrounds? The playgrounds do not support it yet, unfortunately. Um, right. We, uh, I would like to get like a, a language server running um, in here, but that's not something we've done yet. Okay. Do Do you have a demo of the TypeScript stuff? I I think we were talking about this before at some point. Do Do you got anything? Or, um, I mean, I can share my screen, assuming that works, and and look at some stuff if you. Yeah, yeah. Let's let's sh let's let's take a look at what TypeScript because Dylan kind of gave us a a sneak peek of what was coming, but it wasn't ready yet. Last time he was on the stream, so I would, yeah. If you share your screen, I we can take a look at it. So, yeah. Okay, I'm gonna need you to blow up your um, font, your font a little bit. Probably not the best place to do, to do this. But... All right, that at least um, okay. visible. Yeah. So um, I don't know if this is the best example. It's just okay. Yeah. Uh, so we got like, a Marco. This is the the basic like if you run uh, npm create Marco, this is that. Plus, I've been messing with some stuff in here. Okay, I mean, if, if 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 Marco Run is a more logical place for us to talk, we can we can we can go to Marco Run first. Well, I mean, let's jump into the TypeScript uh, since you know we're. I, I do the base did is I'm on D story. On D story, what? <laughs> Instead of on D on D story. Yeah, that's uh, that's wrong. Thank you. I wonder yeah. if the... this uh, this component actually never gets destroyed. Um, yeah. So <laughs> that's that's interesting. But so this is can yeah. We run, can we can we run this example locally? It's fine. Actually, it doesn't really yeah, matter what, what it does too much, right? It's the one where you you hover with the mouse and then the yeah. Um... So yeah, you yeah, yeah. Around it. yeah. So that's what the logic in this component yeah. does. It basically has a div with a with a class on it, and then it it's base. It applies an inline style based on the the state of x and y of the the mouse coordinates. Right. Yeah, and then it does some CSS stuff. Uh, right. But not, but not super important. Right. So what? But in terms of the the TypeScript support for Marco, like, I mean, getting I I already see now types in the actual uh, classes which weren't there before, um, right? Which is nice. Um, is there any typing in the template or like? How, how yeah. So um, so this is expecting a string, right? right. Um, but I could as number this, and it's going to get upset. Um, Okay. Well, that's 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 cool. So you, you can put TypeScript right in the attributes. Um, yeah. So it's so basically anywhere that you can put JavaScript, you can put uh, TypeScript um, in a in a Marco template, and so that includes all the ex the the JavaScript expressions that are like part of your your template code. Okay. I got I got a personal grievance with the uh, the JSX um, DSL. Is it possible for Marco to know a div is a div? This is this has always been. So it does know a div is a div. Um, if you're so with the class API, I, I don't know that that's um, hooked. Okay, up. right. Um, it probably is not. I can I can check here. 
Right. I, I imagine that would be hard to do. You, your key is how you used to do refs, right? You'd be like, like the old get. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, I, I imagine making that work with TypeScript would be a pain. Yeah. Okay. Oh, it right. just knows so it's an tag. element. Yeah. Okay. Um, however, with the tags API, um, it actually does know the, the types of the, um, the elements that you're, you're grabbing. Um, okay. So okay. I, I'll um, show an example of that in a minute. Yeah. We, we can get to the tags API, but basically do, does, does this just work across the board now? When I start a new Marco project, I'm, I'm just going to get TypeScript support out of the box. Is there like Not a out of the box, but as soon as you add a TS config, um, in your project, then it switches over to TypeScript mode. Got you. And you, there's no, so there's no special file extensions or anything. It just like no special file extensions. Yeah. Um, I mean, obviously there are some differences between JavaScript and TypeScript. Um, but for the most part, they're, they're similar enough that, you know, it, it just kind of works. <laughs> I want that in my life. A div is a div. Yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's also, um, a way that you can, uh, define in your Marco JSON, um, to use, um, there, there is a comment a, okay. a moment ago, sorry. And it was funny about the on destroy isn't TypeScript supposed to catch that, but, um, in the class component, but I, I, I wonder if it could, cause you're defining a classic legally. Yeah. Could have I mean, any... move is here just like this custom thing. So, yeah. you know, I, I can make my own foo method too. So like it just thought that was a, a custom method. Yeah. I mean, that's a little bit unfortunate. Um, and, and that's another thing that like, so we have a life cycle tag in the, the tags API that would have yelled at me if I had misspelled destroy on on that one so yeah the, i mean i guess that's an interesting benefit of these hook or primitive based apis is that like they have a defined interface whereas like uh like technically a class has a defined interface that it could extend for marco's cases but you you can add as much to it as you want so it's not yeah right 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 unless you start getting into like <laughs> like like that where you're like forcing methods to appear um angular people twice. <laughs> <laughs> but um yeah so i mean so typescript is there you know everything that you would um expect to work um can work. you can you narrow the type of your children this is another thing you can't do in jsx that's an interesting so question. um I mean, so like the if actually will um maybe okay let me say this is string or number let's say so for now, x is string or number. Um, oh no way! You guys, you guys, you guys did that. Oh. So, so it knows number here. So we we do have some like type narrowing that you don't always get in a, a lot of places uh, with other frameworks. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it, JSX, like, generically can't know that a control flow is a control flow. But the if con component here is special. Right. Yeah, And it, it is specific to if um, in, yeah. in this case. There, so right now, the, the way the the TypeScript compilation works is we compile to a TypeScript file and um, we run that file through TypeScript and then map back any errors um, to the, the current template. And these templates are compiled independently of each other. Um, yeah. But the Marco compiler is capable of um, what we call child template analysis, which is not a really a technical term. That's just what we've been calling it. But it can kind of see into um, its children. So if you have like child here, um, 
we we make it pretty easy. I mean, I can't find this because this doesn't exist, but we make it pretty easy in the compiler to just be like, okay, now give me the AST of that child and um, any meta information that was uh, gathered from that, which includes like the the input data that's passed to it um, and kind of where that flows and maybe comes back out. Um, so we could potentially have type narrowing for custom tags in the future if we decide okay. to, to do that. Um, I don't know. <laughs> Because yeah. yeah, I don't know if that's going to fall on the timeline anytime soon, uh, but that is a possibility. That's that is interesting, yeah. Because like obviously one of the biggest challenges with that if being special, as you highlighted, is you know composition. My if suddenly doesn't do that, you know. You're right. But, but you're saying that the Marcos compiler has the potential to be able to do that. Yeah. Um, that's... Yeah, I mean, it would it would be some some work to to kind of follow those chains through through everything. But it, it, I mean, it would kind of be a recursive thing because you might need to walk into multiple children, you know, to figure out like, yeah, is this actually rendered? That this that seems case? expensive because I I mean I don't even know that TypeScript does that. Um, we so most of the cross template stuff that we're doing uh, is actually based on. Um, metadata that we collect from the the templates and that gets cached um for for every template so it's we're gonna need to compile this child anyways right um and so if you're not actually making changes in the child then you know that's not going to get invalidated so you know as you're typing here we're not like rewalking the child okay um, every time if, if that data is exposed to the metadata yeah. Um, so that that we pretty much try to put everything that um, will be needed by like a parent component in that metadata so that it can be cached and, and reused. Yeah. 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 No. And that has other benefits with the new hydration uh, or not hydration right. approach that Marco does. I'm just pretty happy here. And I think most people are pretty happy here to see that you can use TypeScript in your code in your templates but you can also use it like right in all the expressions right in the, it actually type narrows in the template around conditional logic like that's that's pretty powerful stuff that I'd, i'm not sure i haven't played with other sfc files but i don't know like i mean i don't i've never tried it i don't know if you can do that in spelt or view so it's... yeah the, the other thing that's kind of interesting is the generics um so we the the way you define your input is um, it's like this. And so, you know, if I had input for people uninitiated, Marco is props. Yes. Um, input is props. Um, so if I had a string here, then, um, and this is going to be a string, but I can also, you know, use generics and I could make this T, but then I could also say, um, that this type here is t and and that's actually valid that this the generics on input are special and kind of permeate the whole um template so now when i come here and look at x i see that's of type t um and and this is kind of interesting because um with, with jsx obviously you have a function so you have like a very natural place to uh put those generics, right. um, but and I, I'm curious what Svelte Five is going to do now that they've um, moved stuff. I mean, they could keep what they they have. I, I think they've got like a dollar dollar generics or something like that. Um, they have a doc on their TypeScript. Can you blow it up one, just font size, so I can yeah. see what you're looking at? Yeah, thanks. OK, so it may have never made it in. It may have just been in this RFC. Um, yeah, it looks like they were maybe looking at doing something. 
or like, you know, your generics, right? Like we were just like, okay, we're just gonna, you know, take the, the syntax and make that available everywhere. Um, and I think that works pretty well. Um, it, it, you know, different than uh, technically the way TypeScript works, but it feels pretty natural. Yeah. Last time uh, Dylan was on and he was showing us all the fun challenges of actually building a coding language, he showed us a little snippet of what the the code generated um, from yeah. a TS standpoint, which is like kind of crazy, right? Yeah, I, I can pull that up here. Oh, yeah. So we've got this. And, and you can see that, you know, this T ends up here, it ends up here, like the whole type ends up like in multiple um, place, you know, the T comes in here. So like it, it, there's a lot of like duplicated output. And then in order to um, support like all the, cause the, the Marco template has an API, right? It's got yeah. at least like render methods and stuff. And so all of those also take the generic um, and we actually have to like write out kind of the the type for the the Marco template in line. Um, the, we, we were definitely running up against like the the limitations of TypeScript um, making all this work. Um, are you familiar with like the term higher order types? Um, because I was not prior I, to to us going down this. No. What are what are higher order types? So you, you're familiar with higher order components, right? Yeah, and higher order functions. Yeah. So they're they're types that create new types. Okay. Um, and uh, TypeScript has very very limited support for um, what you can actually do uh, related to, to higher order types. It's not something that you typically need, um, but it, we would be able to write. It generate a lot less code if TypeScript did support um, that. But Dylan did. Uh, what's what's this mean? What does what mean? Doing extends Dylan's. He he Dylan just wrote. Oh, yeah. Do. Oh, he wants me to do an extends. But yeah, like that extends has to end up everywhere. Um, I don't know if Dylan, there was something you wanted me to to point out specifically with that. Higher order types generally come in on iterators, containers, futures. Huh. Yeah, this is this is beyond my TypeScript knowledge. Um, uh, yeah, Dylan's kind of the, the yeah. this was his uh, kind of project and it um, was like every other day he was like, oh, TypeScript can't do this. So I'm going to have to do something super weird. And and if you look in here, like there's some weird stuff going on. We've got this like render native tag and it's receiving like it generates a function and you call that function and call another function and then you pass this and um this is like well I'm, I'm not gonna do this right now but um because that doesn't really make sense but you in in order to get like these generics like being passed around and, and inferred you know we kind of had to do this like almost currying thing um and you, you may run into this in typescript when you're trying to to type something um there's times where like um, partial application of um, of generics isn't possible. Like if you define one, you have to define them all. Um, right. There's there's cases where like we needed to add a generic in, um, and so like there's this currying that's going on. So the generic that we add can go in like one function call, and then the generics that you add go in another function call, so that you'll get partial application if you don't define um the generics and it's like or not partial application but um partial inference is what i meant to say and you'll get the the inference since we're not uh defining some of those so yeah it's yeah i'm i'm not gonna pretend i know 
what that looks like. I, I just remember that Dylan wrote some, like, didn't ha he wrote a component with no classes or anything, but just a bunch of, like, looking like HTML code, and what he got out the other side resembled nothing <laughs> like, like HTML code. It was, it was kind of Yeah, there's, crazy. there's a lot going on here. Uh, he did a good job um, with this, kind of covering all these um, no, that's pieces. And it, it, the, like, the initial um, version that he had, like, the, the code was nice and pretty and it worked for like 90% of cases, but to kind of cover all of these, you know, being able to define generics, being able to do, um, you know, the the type narrowing and everything, you know, it, it just kept going deeper down the rabbit hole to actually get it to behave the way that we wanted it to. Yeah, and the the reason like on this side, it's th this is like a completely different territory. It's very cool that this kind of stuff exists. Like us using JSX and stuff have it really easy because even though I complain about JSX TypeScript support, it's like just inbuilt, and all you have to do is like type a couple things, be like, oh, type of this element, etc. These are the attributes. You know, you just set a bunch of stuff like that, and then. TypeScript takes care of the rest. When you have an SFC format like Marco, like Vue, like Svelte, I, for a while I didn't think this was possible, but then I guess Vue was one of the first ones that did it with like Volair or Future. Yeah. And essentially the, 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 this approach where TypeScript kind of handles JSX for us, this approach involves basically generating a completely different output Put of of typed information to like fit the types, which is kind of it's crazy. Yeah, it's like that TypeScript that I was showing you like will not run. It's purely for for type analysis. We we pass that to TSC to to get errors and then map those back to your template. Okay, yeah. So I, I I'm sure people care more about being able to use it than necessarily how it works. But I I, th I think it, I think it, it is cool that what what you've managed to accomplish here yeah so yeah i, I mean we're going to see probably typescript through the rest of what we look at today so i, I don't know if there's any other okay. points we want to fix in on right now on the typescript stuff before we see the other one but what's cool is everyone who uses marco 5 today now has the potential for typescript support right did you yeah, guys backport it to marco 4 um it yes so it, the the language server um, Marco four and Marco five are similar enough that the language server will like understand the Marco four um, files. Nice. And so it does work. Yes. Okay. Um, it, it's not like specifically backported to to Marco four. Um, yeah, but yeah, I mean that's cool. That's I mean it, basically. Because that's the thing, this has nothing to do with the actual output of the actual code. You just have a language server basically building in the background to generate these yeah. types for you. So like auto completion and stuff works and all of that. Auto completion kind of works, yeah. So if I like delete this, well, that's Copilot. But that, that is like a, a true right. auto completion. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, so auto completion yeah, with within... I. I should be able to to rename this to to be, and that goes and renames it here. Yeah. Um, so like e everything that you would expect to work from from TypeScript works. Um, all the the refactorability and um, yeah. No, oh, that's that. No, that's great. Yeah. So like yeah, right in your templates. Yeah, I mean this is huge. People have been asking for this for a very right. very long time, um, especially inside eBay. This was yep. like one of the main thing, you know, we were talking earlier about, um, you know, the React versus Marco thing. They would be like, yeah, but React supports TypeScript. Like that, I got to a point that that was like literally the only technical argument that they could make. Um, but yeah. So anyway. yeah, I, I think in, in some ways, I, the, the TypeScript support in Marco is maybe superior to the TypeScript support in JSX. Um, I mean, that's it, what I was su suggesting at because of just like, you, I mean, you, you have to go longer, but once you're there, you might as well go all the way. Like JSX assumes React or like TSX assumes React a lot, almost to its detriment. 
and it's, it's yeah there's there's things like even for react it's not 100 percent perfect and it it is you know like right yeah so yeah i mean i yeah i i think we've already seen a couple of examples of of that from um from you know the stuff you were doing with the type narrowing but i'm, I'm interested to see more as as we get going um yeah no typescript to marco awesome uh, let's, let's, maybe it's time to take a look at, uh, what do we want, what do we want to look at first? Marco run? Yeah. yeah let's, let's look at let's, Marco run. Yeah. So I, for this one, I think I'm just going to jump, jump in here because okay. uh, I, I, I usually do this. I'm not going to make a hacker news demo right now, but let's just see what the, what it looks like to make a new Marco run project. Can you guide me through that? Sure. Um, yeah. so are you going to drive, are you going to share your screen? Yeah, I'm going to share my screen in two okay. seconds. I'm just getting my window open and ready. Yeah. So, first of all, what is what is yeah Marco movies when yeah I I'm, I, I uh, the movies demo they're talking about. You familiar with that one? Yeah. Um, um, I I wanted to to make one. Did you see the um the enhance? Uh, well, that wasn't movies. Um, but the the enhance music player. No, but I didn't. I do think Enhance made a. There is a movies demo for Enhance. I haven't looked yeah. at it yet. It's okay. It's an MPA. Okay, actually, I, I haven't looked at this one yet. New incognito window. I just want to very quickly see what we're dealing with here. Because yeah, we definitely should make this. Yeah, the, the movies app is a lot of fun. This is an MPA, so it's not like um, it's not like apples to oranges kind of thing but yeah main page let's discover all yeah yeah it's pretty nice so it's it's about a and let's go into a movie details page yeah that's the thing with the movies app i'm surprised the astro version is as large as it is um it is about a five kilobyte 4.7 kilobyte yeah it's about a five i wouldn't be it's like hacker news i'd expect it to be about 4.7 kilobytes of javascript for some reason the uh the taste the the astro demo it wasn't built by the astro team is like 15 kilobytes i don't know why it's yeah i don't know if that redirect is but basically it's yeah 16 kilobytes i sort of don't know i i have to imagine that this site could be a smaller because the solid version of the movies app which has client side routing you know, like actual, like no yeah. page reload is only 13 kilobytes. So, you know, and this is, this has full client side navigation. So yeah, I don't know. Um, but anyway, sorry, we got, we got thing. Yeah. It's time for the Marco movies app because the Marco hacker news app, Marco six hacker news app has my, um, my record, right? It, it's a 1.6 mega or 1.6 kilobytes gzip <laughs> for the com yeah yeah so 1.6 kilobytes gzip for the comments page which is insane right my my solid astro is 4.7 kilobytes on the on the uh comments page and um yeah, i mean solid islands are uh, like with client side routing is about eight kilobytes on that page. And I mean, to be fair, the, the Marco one doesn't have client-side routing, but like nothing is even close. The quick version's like uh, zero kilobytes until you do something, in which case it's like 18 kilobytes. Uh, it's like uh, one kilobyte until you do something. Yeah, okay, fine. It's, it's, it's <laughs> you don't see that on your network. Um, yeah. That's true. It's inlined into the yeah, exactly. Yeah, I'm not counting inline stuff because Astro inlines and so does Solid in those cases, and a bunch of us do inlining. So yeah, um, but yeah, it's basically no no external JavaScript until you load it, and then it's about 18. Uh, solid start version, and I think is 16. Svelte Kit is 19, but yeah, Marco's 1.6. So I, I'm I'm looking forward to that demo, the Marco six um version of the movies app anyways sorry little sidebar but i don't know anyways let's let's get back to let's get back to business here um uh, let's 
I'm going to go into my examples folder here and we're going to get started by how do I get started here is, is does Marco run have its own like sub section docs how do, how do I find that um, you can go to Marco dot run really cool Marco dot run it's, it's not really set up but there's a logo here and you can <laughs> click on that and it takes you to get up read me okay okay <laughs> <laughs> we'll put something there eventually all right all right ryan saw the other day that it was available and bought it nice nice yeah ryan's a big part of the marco run thing um yeah it's, it's been his ryan project. is is kind of the the main person behind um marco run um so he's been doing a great job with this yeah we we stole him from solid where he worked on the the solid Robert. router yeah um, and now he's essentially working on marco's router yeah yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Uh, but yeah, okay. So then, so npm install Marco Run and yeah. So so we can do we can do one of two things. We can um, we can start from the like because you can run npm Marco create and or npm init Marco or okay yeah, npm init Marco and. Uh, that'll like give you uh, a starter project or we can like start from scratch, which isn't going to take that much time if we want to just do that. I, I, I'm, I, I figure most people are going to do a starter project just because that's what they do. Okay. I, I think, um, it, it, sorry, is this project in beta? I wasn't sure. I saw the release, but it was the beta release then. It's the beta release. Um, okay. we are, deploying some of the first apps to production using it inside of eBay. Um, so it will be out of beta soon. Okay. Okay. So I guess my first question, we, we you mentioned a couple ways to get started with it. That's fine. So you could like just do this and build it up. But I guess my question is Marco is already a server side rendering framework. Why Marco run? Like what does it add to the, yeah. Um, so, I mean, that's, that's true. Uh, Marco, uh, yeah, is already a server rendering framework. Um, it's pretty easy to just like drop it inside of express or fastify or something like that. Um, but you do need, um, a bundler to get the client side JavaScript working. So that is something that you need to, um, to set up and, um, I don't know, maybe something I've wanted to do for a while. Um, and, uh, maybe I'll shoehorn this into Marco run if the rest of the team will let me, um, is, uh, just make it. So we, we've got a, a node require hook, um, yeah. which, um, allows you to just require a Marco file. Um, and you get JavaScript, it compiles it in the background. Um, I would like to have that so that also just bundles the client side JavaScript associated with that template and like injects it when you render it, um, which is essentially what like Marco run is doing, but inside this, this meta framework. So that would allow you to more easily just like drop Marco into an existing project. Um, I mean, like beat would be running in the background. Um, so. You know, there's there's a lot happening with that require if we do that, but that's something I wanted to do. But but anyways, like there is some setup that you need to to do to to drop Marco into an existing project, um, primarily gotcha. around the, the bundler. And Marco runs built on Vite, like all the Marco best run is built on Vite. Yeah, yeah, like all the best meta frameworks. Um, so we we also had a tool um, called Marco Serve that I worked on a few years ago. Um, that just allowed you to like serve up a, a Marco file. We're running our website on it currently. Um, and it worked pretty well. It was built on Webpack. Um, so there was like, you know, some build, you know, s slowness um, there. But I mean, it worked pretty well. But it didn't. Um, it was very basic in what it allowed you to do. Uh, and so it wasn't something that we could adopt inside of eBay because we've got a bunch of other requirements 
Um, and so it wasn't something that was getting a, a ton of love, um, you know, from our team, because it was like, well, you know, it works and good enough. And, you know, it's not something that um, like eBay is depending on. Um, so we wanted to change that. Or, go ahead. Yeah, I just very quickly, I, this is my, I stream from my Netlify computer, so I don't actually have Marco on here. I have it. I, so I was trying to remember which. Yeah, it's, the, uh, it's the one you just had highlighted, the, the one with the check mark. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. There we go. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Um, but yeah, so one of the things about Marco Run that we wanted to be sure was that it could actually be used internally at eBay. Right. Um, and so we're, we're currently working on making Marco Run the default for all new projects um, at eBay. And I think we're, we're pretty close um, to that. And we've already got a few teams that are um, picking it up and like migrating their, their apps to, to Marco run internally um, as well. So this is something that we will have like incentive from, from eBay to continue maintaining and improving, but is, you know, a, a really easy way to get started with Marco that's available to the open source community. Um, right. So that, that's what we wanted. Um, and that's that's why Marco Run exists. That's good. I remember those starter eBay templates and all the work that went into them. So does that mean eBay is on Vite now or making the move to Vite? We are in the process of moving to, to Vite, yes. Very um, cool. Because I remember, it, what was it, Lasso, uh, the original bundler, which yeah. was really dynamic and really cool. And then the move to Webpack had to give up a bunch of stuff to meet the ecosystem. But then there was like a bunch of features that didn't work properly anymore. Um, yeah, in, in a lot of ways, Veet um, kind of gets us back to a lot of the things that Lasso um, did well for us. Because Lasso had like unbundled development. Um, and... I, Again, another hashtag, Marco did a first note. I mean, it wasn't necessarily the first Not, to do it, yeah. but, but, uh, but Lasso was a bundler that, the, that was built um, and open sourced from eBay and the Marco team again, and it did on-demand uh, like bundling. So instead mm -hmm. of like bundling all ahead of time in like your dev environment like, or, and in production, actually, as you requested for um, certain assets, it would bundle them in real time. Yeah, um, and that that opened up some interesting patterns that I'm not sure were necessarily good, um, but like you could have like, I mean, there's there's pages at eBay that have trillions of permutations of like the bundles that can um, uh, be served, and so users are getting a bundle that is like individual um, to them based on. Um, even things like coming back from services, like what um, what's going to be rendered on the page um, and, and that kind of stuff. And like, yeah, you could use um, dynamic uh, imports for some of that stuff and probably maybe should, um, but you, you get it all as like one big um, bundle, like exactly tuned to, to what's, you know, going to be rendered on the page, which is interesting. Um, right. As builds have gotten more complicated, Babel's been introduced into the um, the the pipeline. Um, you know, we're still seeing those builds. You know, take more than the the couple of milliseconds that they were early on. Um, and so, you know, we we've, we've then had to take steps to like mitigate that build time. Like, you know, um, pre warm up. You know, all these common bundles that are are being built. Um, but there's still things that with, you know, all these potential permutations that are, you know, hitting things that aren't cached. Yeah, I mean, caching so, so building caching. Ahead of time has been our recommendation, you know, for the past few years, um, which really means if you take that away, um, Vite's like very much a, um, a successor to, to Lasso uh, aside from that. And we've been recommending not to do that for a while anyway. So gotcha. Yeah, because caching was still such a big part of that that solution in the past because like you you, you couldn't bundle 
every um, everything all the time on demand. Um, I guess there's a question here: Was the bundles coming from a CDN or from Origin for? Yeah, so we've got an interesting uh, setup. So we, we use Akamai for our CDN, um, and then that is backed by a service that we call the the resource server. Um, but then, basically, um, Lasso had a a build plugin that would go and upload um like those on-demand bundles to the resource server if they weren't there so it actually still would be served through the cdn and then cached um at that point but the um the origin would be generating them on demand and then feeding them into the cdn okay very cool um okay so now that's Vite at ebay which is pretty yeah. cool um marco run is built on Vite. Um, I'm just looking at this project and I mean, the very first thing I noticed is that we like, you, got, you did you guys set out to bug react developers with this design? I, and the first thing I noticed is plus layout dot Marco, which means that this is like Svelte kit. This is um, like Svelte kit. Conventions. So uh, yeah, I, I was, I was definitely torn on this, um, to begin with. Um, and I, I'm guessing you've read through uh, Rich Harris's like reasoning for for doing this. Yeah, um, and it it makes a lot of sense. Um, so Marco serve the the original version that I wrote just like would serve every Marco file that it came across in the like directory that you would serve. So like your routes directory, like every Marco file in there would become a page. Um, and then, so it was like, well, okay, so now we need a way to say, like, we're not going to make every Marco file, you know, a, um, uh, a page. And so it was like all this, like extra config that would be necessary to ensure that you weren't serving things that you didn't want to serve. And, and also that the, the bundling wasn't like unnecessarily, unnecessarily breaking things up into, um, chunks because it thought you know this thing was shared between you know this these two pages but one of them isn't even a page um so so the the plus convention i i think it makes it really easy to to look at your your file tree and like know what's going on and it makes it really easy for the the tool to you know know what you intend to actually be a page because you're putting you know plus page in the file name. Yeah, I'm just looking at the the list of APIs here, and one thing that stands out to me again, I'm just looking. Okay, so handler for APIs, middleware for middleware, um, run for all HTTP methods. This is cool. I, I haven't I haven't explored into this space yet about nesting middleware. Um, so yeah, it's, it's interesting. It, it opens up some interesting possibilities. So middleware can be handled um, on like in a per route kind of manner. Yeah, so you could throw like a middleware in your admin directory, let's say um, that you know requires authentication for every route under um, like the admin path or something like that. Where handler are just API routes. Okay, that's interesting. Yeah. Um, and um, and the handler route actually gets er, gets past the um, the template if there's a dot page dot marco or plus page dot marco um, next to it, so you can do some like stuff in JavaScript land if you want, um, and then potentially you know return uh, HTML or you know do something else. Um, Right. I think some people are using it to like, depending on the headers, return JSON or a rendered page, um, something like that. Okay, and then obviously layout around. See, this was the thing that I actually noticed right away was that there's layout components and page components, but the, which helps I guess organize the code. But there, there's no nested router here, right? You're not doing like partial page swaps or anything like that. This is just like no. Um, we we do have a vision for for doing something like that in the future. So we wanted to lay the foundation for that. Plus, we think it's a good way to to organize um, things, even if you're not getting that right now. Yeah, yeah. We aren't doing partial page swapping currently. Um, this is fully NPA. Cool. 
but yeah, so this is the convention on the files. Yeah, that was the that was the first thing. I know special files, 404, 500, so kind of error catching ha handlers. And then, oh, cool. You guys even have diagrams about the yeah. the the process of how middleware runs. This is this is a very cool approach. I, I mean, I haven't looked at newer page directory or app directory stuff in Next, but the the idea of using um, like uh, chaining the middleware also based on section and depth, not just like top to bottom. Right. It gives a lot of control. Handler, handler. So yeah, so ha goes middleware, middleware, handler, layout, layout, page. Okay. And then it, I, you kind of skipped over it, but the plus meta up there is kind of interesting um, too. And this was something that we were, were kind of forced to add because of um, eBay. But the when you, um, so like this, you can define this metadata um, in this file and it can be a JS file, it can be a JSON file, whatever. Um, and then you can have like middleware that reads this this metadata so you know i mentioned the um the idea of like having like an admin route and then under there you've got this auth middleware but maybe there's some page underneath you know, the admin route nested at some arbitrary depth that like you actually don't need authentication for um you can put something in that metadata or, or that meta file and then um read that in the middleware and be like okay but this this um you know, thing that I'm accessing right now, actually, we can skip the the authentication for or something like that. Um, that makes sense. So um, we use that internally at eBay and actually gets read by the adapter and like that information gets compiled, you know, somewhere else. But um, for for our, like tooling to pick up on internal tooling, but it, it's kind of a, a neat little thing, too. Sorry, I'm just reading. I just kept in. Yeah, flat route. Yeah, flat route. You guys have flat routes as well. That's yes. Um, so you can you can find your project all at you know one level if you you want to. And I think where this makes the most sense is when you have um, kind of like forking. Uh, routes where like maybe you've got you know things that live at two different um locations uh but are essentially uh, the same thing yeah or yeah. i mean c sharing components helps with that kind of thing but you know there you may actually want to just like have the same page serving two different routes um and the the well, the the grouping plus the flat routes kind of allows you to to do that for basically anything you can think of. I mean, it, it can get it can get pretty crazy. Um, obviously, you should keep this readable, but you know, yeah, like yeah, members, people. Um, very, very cool. You you've t yeah definitely taking the expressiveness of 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 the routing convention. I haven't. I haven't dug too far how far people have gone. Yeah, this is something we thought through a lot and like how to make it not that everything necessarily should be like we would recommend like doing all this crazy stuff, but we didn't want the the like file based routing to limit what kind of route you could represent or what kind of like we did, didn't want you to ever feel like, man, I wish I just had a, you know, a config file where I could put this because I can't represent the, this route the way that I want to. Yeah. Um, no, this is. So, so it is very expressive. Yeah, no, I, I can see that. Yeah, no, this, and you get very interesting combinations of things. Yeah, I, I mean, there's so many other fa features I could ask about because, like, like because this lets you actually explicitly say this is not just dynamic; it actually ties to these specific values. So it's almost like a right. type of a route uh, narrowing filtering. Yeah, no, this is this is very very cool stuff. Um, all right, let's get back here. So 
Um, no, that's all start. Where are we? <laughs> um, this one. Um, so yeah, the layout Marco is our entry point into our app. We have styles, we have all the, the stuff you would expect and then yeah. input render body, which, which is, is just normal Marco. Yeah. Um, for people that don't know, this is props children. Um, it's slightly different, but it's basically props children. Yeah. So then that's what ends up going in. And then I'm gathering, we have our page here, right. which gets inserted and underscore index. What does that mean? Does that mean it's, uh, so anything prefixed with an underscore does not contribute to the path. Got you. Okay. Um, so we, we did not make index special. Um, so if you put index there, you would actually have to put index in the path. So, um, right. underscore makes that kind of invisible to the path. Got it. Then you write your page and your mouth ma mouse mask. And as you notice, Marco auto detects components. So mouse mask isn't imported anywhere. We, it's just coming from over here, um, which is the component we were looking at earlier with this D story. Um, yeah, we need to fix that. Um, and default, I mean, was there a setting where I could have got TypeScript by default? Like if I put in, uh, yes. Yeah. So the default is no TypeScript. Um, if you wanted to, if you want to get TypeScript, um, you do need to choose, uh, that we should maybe prompt that in the, um, in the CLI. So right. I think that probably is an option that people would like, but may not know exist. Yeah. But okay. But very, very cool to see this. Uh, okay. So basically it's mostly the file system routing because yeah. the, the other thing I was looking at, and I, I think this came out as a, as a question on chat. Um, it was like, um, does, does Mark, does run have built in serialization for query or body? And the thing you're not going to find in Marco run, I guess, is like all these data APIs that people are playing You're hot right now, like loaders and whatnot in the same sort of way, because you, Marco is an MPA framework, so you, if you want to use a form, use a form kind of situation, right? Like, there's no like special form component, or like it just works because it's a form, right? So, if if I if I if I wanted to do data fetching or data loading in in um, Marco Run, um, the expectation is that I would create a handler. Um, at a you certain can end. you can create a handler. Um, yes, um, you can also. So Marco only supports um, like the the await tag uh, server side currently. Um, but the the recommendation would be yes, either do it in the handler, um, or you can just do a fetch call in uh, a template. Right, uh, but you should. If you do it in the handler, you do not wait for the promise to resolve before rendering. You pass that promise into the template, and then wait for it uh, right. in the template where appropriate. Right, exactly. Because th th this is the whole thing. Marco can do out of order streaming, so you don't want it's non blocking. You don't want the promise to complete. You want to give the template that renders the promise. So I guess you can post to. How does that? I'm trying to think of the flow because usually you post to an endpoint and that endpoint redirects to um, another endpoint. Um, so I, I guess most of the time what you're going to end up doing here is you're going to post, say, to a handler that's like add my to-do item or add my product. And then it's going to redirect back to the specific page where you draw the list of products or render the list of products. And then when it adds, it's doing the rendering because it's all server side, you know, as a base thing, you'll just literally top of your component, you know, fetch user, whatever, get the promise, pass that promise through your, your Marco template. And then wherever you use the await tag, um, it will then, uh, that will be the, the fixing point where it will kind of stream flush the stuff outside of it. Then when the data finishes, it'll render the stuff inside flush that in. Um, yeah, I mean, people who've used React have seen this recently. That's the pattern that uh, the Remix uh, guys have gone to where they have, uh, not it's 
not just like they, they have suspense, but they actually have an await tag as as the point of actually you know doing it. And actually, quick um, resources have a resource tag, and they work the same similar yeah. way as well. Um, and and it's worth noting that like you can render the page from your post handler as well, so you don't right. necessarily need that redirect depending on whether that you know the the URL that you posted to you know it can you can share that URL as like the the get URL for you know right. whatever it was. Make yeah m makes sense yeah I mean it's flexible that way but generally what I'm getting at is there's no like action API because you're literally just using the no. platform. Um, at, no, yeah, no bling. We talked through some of that um, kind of stuff. No bling, um, but it, some of that stuff may come in the future. Um, but but right now we're we're focused on doing MPA well. We may bleed out into um, the the spa world a little bit at some point, uh, as we've seen Astro do. do. Um, right, but. Plus is good. Yeah, yeah. No, no. no. I, I kind of hated it at first. I'll be honest. Uh, I, my my gut reaction was I do not like this plus. Yeah, yeah. I, um, I mean, I still don't like this plus. I think the thing, I think the most compelling thing is, for me is, I, there's one thing I hate more than the plus, and that's layout. I, I am the most anti layout person. So because I was anti layout, I never have. Like the, the the use case for multi files never was the primary use case because there was no actual case, like case for that. Middleware is an interesting one for me. So I, I'm just I, I'm yeah. I'm I, I think that's the first case where you know I'd be tempted to have a, multiple files, which makes stuff like the plus um, more compelling. But it's it's largely just because I'm not a big fan of layout. Yeah. Um... Yeah, we've got handler. I mean, we you, you saw we've got several um, files, and I think it's kind of nice that they're um, denoted. Yeah, I'm 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 interested to see what understand why Next uh, moved away from that. That I remember them having some sort of middleware API, but I, yeah, I'm that's good. I'm, I, that'd be interesting though the reasoning behind that, like the middleware files like that. Um, yeah, I, I don't know the answer to that. Are nor classes normal JS classes, but anonymous? Oh, you mean of oh, the syntax in Marco five? Um, y yes, right. Like th th y there's just no yeah. need to name it because like, yeah, it's it, it just is. But yes, um, and yeah, technically that's not um, valid. Uh, like as a class statement, if you don't name it. Um, but yeah, inside the the Marco template. Uh, a class with with no name just is the the class for the template. All right, so let's go back here. Okay, so st I think I got I got the flow of this so far. So then, and you got meta JSON page title. Welcome to Marco. I see. And this, so this actually shows that for this page, does it actually come in here? The welcome to Marco. Um, it the the, the layout I believe is using that. Interesting. So you can have the meta here, but it's it actually ends up making it into yeah. So we've got this global dot meta page title. Okay, interesting. So the meta is the resolved. It's exposed globally, but it's resolved along the path that yes the route matches. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's available to the layouts. It's available to the middleware. So it's a way for the the pages to communicate some information. You know, kind of back up the tree almost. Um, and like so, I said, one of the one of the big reasons that that it exists is because this is a pattern that's um, used by some of the middleware at eBay. Um, gotcha. We. we kind of needed to to fit into that to not have to like rewrite a bunch of the eBay stack as well. I no, I, and I think this works well. One one thing I was looking at was having not like different files but having meta as part of like a, a config object on route matches, mm -hmm. but I never thought about how to actually access it. I assumed um yeah, I didn't yeah, having it as a global is kind of cool. Um 
Okay. Yeah. So I'm following along the, this example now. And yeah, I mean, I think this makes a lot of sense. It's pretty easy just to build out pages and UI with this. And to run it, I'm assuming there is a bunch of commands here, like, yeah. uh, what do we got here? Build, dev, and preview, right? So right. Marco Run has support for different adapters, right? I'm gathering preview uh, is, yeah. is Node when there's nothing else there, but let's- Yeah, let's Node see. is the default adapter. Let's run Marco, uh, MPX Marco Run, what, line? And very nice ASCII art, just props on that. <laughs> oh, that's very cool. Um, hmm. So then this is the same learn Marco graphic has been used forever. And then if I go Marco, so I, it's cause I ran MPX. I, I, I looked for the scripts when I literally could just be like NPM run preview NPM. You know what I mean? Like, I guess I should build before I preview, shouldn't I? Uh, preview will do the build for you. Interesting. Okay. So now I have the actual production build here. So we can actually see what it builds. I just want to, how's Marco doing these days? Yeah, so single bundle for the first page. Inter interesting that I, I would have expected two bundles, one for the so you guys are doing one for like the the core and one for the page. Well, um you're currently in an app with only one page. Page. So it doesn't split it up, but normally, yes. Uh, right, 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 right. Code splitting if you added yeah, the same page. That makes sense, yeah. So Marco's still about 13, 14 kilobytes these days. Probably a little bit bigger action now that I think about it, because this page has no JavaScript on it. It's practically well, it, yeah. I mean, it's got a little bit, but not much. Yeah. So like, partial hydration at work. We've already mark demoed Marco's ability to do islands and projected serialization and recursive islands. So I don't need to do anything special today. But it's cool to see that this. It's never been really easier to get started with Marco. I know Marco Serve had a lot of this stuff, but this this feels like much more polished. Um, yeah. The, the you know pieces are all just right there very easy to get started um and then uh it's it's still early days this was just added this week but you see that explore your routes um like that's something ryan just recently added um it's not uh yeah i'm just gonna run it so it's live again oh, okay so I, I think you need to currently it requires hitting the, the like server first and then you can um, pull that up. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, so, I, I actually opened the link. The problem was, all right, this is not an incognito window. Um, it was just in another screen. Yeah, yeah. And it, then it shows you path, get page entry, one layout, meta, yes. Yeah, so this will give you an overview of all the routes um, and everything in your app and you can see um, those generated files. Right, um, the virtual files generated for yeah. the index and JS and the Marco. One of the interesting cool. things with this too, is that we are compiling the routes into um, like this JavaScript tree of ifs and switch statements. Um, and so if you want to look at that, uh, the, the Marco run router there at the bottom um, should have that code. This isn't syntax highlighted or or anything, um, but that first function, that match function. Yeah. Um, oh, I okay. I, I almost have to, add, do I have to, so does this, this is, this is Marco uh, router's code, but yeah, I, I, someone, you mentioned you guys had a compiled router. Does it compile into a file? Does it, like, yeah, so th this is, this is the router, this function, this match is the router. Okay. Um, then, so then if we were to add more routes, you'd kind of see that um, be a little bit more interesting. Right. So if I want to add, um, oh, right, we, we added index here so that it would have a shared layout. 
Right. I'm trying to, or actually, no, we didn't need to. This is just a show. Case no. Case. Yeah. It, so, so I could do, uh, I could make a new folder like about, and right. then I could go new file page dot plus page <laughs> dot Marco. And then I could, whatever, I could just yeah. make it like whatever. I, um, you don't even need to put anything in there if you're, we're just looking at the routes. Yeah. But presumably. Uh, am I looking at the right? Might, might need to hit the actual, um, like the, the local host 3000. Oh, right. Okay, because it acts. Um, let's actually see that our page exists. It does. So it let's does. go back to the Route Explorer and see. Okay. And then I, I think it's because in dev mode, it's lazily building. So okay. this doesn't um, like immediately update. It's like building on the requests of the page. But I want to, I want to. I understand I want to understand what this is doing because okay so we index and about get pulled in get one get two and then how are these used so so here we're not even doing any string matching we're just like are there are there two parts to the page okay that's about if there's just the, you know, if it's just slash, okay, that's the, the index page. I see. Yeah. So, so basically this function gets built up on a very like simple, like it just expands out. It's like, does this, like instead of doing a regex, it's literally right. like, like, we can keep on doing this. We can, <laughs> we can add another page that looks just like this one. Um, copy, paste, rename, about two, about Q, sure. <laughs> about Q, that's, that's, that sounds good. All right, now we have get three, and then we get path name slice, case about return this, case about Q. Yeah. So this actually expands out even with nested routes, I imagine. So it actually generates yeah. instead of regex, it generate. So this is about optimizing for speed, not for size or. Yeah. Because this is running on the server. Of course. Right. Because no client side router here. So interesting. Okay. So yeah, if you have, thousands of routes, this would be, it'd be large. large, but it would not actually like from a performance standpoint, it would be a much like a very, yeah, I mean, it's going to server startup by like a millisecond. Yeah. Cool. What I want to know is how you got the, the pretty Marco logo in the, sorry, I'm having some issues with StreamYard right now, but <laughs> in the terminal. Yeah. ASCII art, box drawing, Unicode. Yeah, this is definitely a highlight. Okay, so, um, sorry, StreamYard recently has been like freezing up on me like terribly. Um, okay, let's continue. Um, okay, so we'll so be expanding that explore your routes a little bit more to give you more information, um, bundle sizes, like that kind of stuff we want to put there so that you've got, you know, some insight into what's happening with your app. Um, but that's really early. Yep. No, it's, it's, it's cool. Um, it's nice to see this kind probably of probably add some syntax highlighting on these files. Yeah, no, it's definitely cool to see this in action. And, um, yeah, so this is, this is Marco run. I've just got a few of these open. Right. What, what any other things i guess and the first thing everyone's probably going to be wondering because we've been covering it recently is do you guys ha have any plans for um client side routing you see did you see the astro view transition api stuff yes um and i i think 
So with the, um, I think there's some things that we don't need to go full spa for, um, specifically on the, the view transitions, because you, um, we, we will eventually get uh, MPA view transitions in the browser. Right now it's behind a, a flag in uh, Chrome Canary, uh, but it's coming. Um, but persisted components, uh, what they're calling persisted islands, you know, being able to, to retain this kind of ephemeral or client side state um, across pages um, is useful in some cases, like the, the music player example um, is, you know, kind of the, the one that keeps coming up. Um, so I, I do think there's some value in it being able to, to represent, um, that and, you know, potentially jumping between like an MPA experience and a spa experience. Um, and there's some interesting stuff that we've been talking about, um, specifically related to doing this in Marco 6 um, with being able to um, essentially do fine-grained updates to the existing page uh, from the server, have a, a format for um, serialized data to come back that's you know, specific to you know, like update this text node here um, and, and that kind of uh, stuff. So, and I think we actually got into this the last time Dylan and I were on the the stream. Um, that's still kind of fantasy land uh, right now. We haven't really begun any um, work on that. We're actually trying to, you know, we, we've been working on these other things, trying to get Marco 6 out still, which is kind of um, a prerequisite for um, going down that road. Um, right. I but mean, I, I do see value in it. Yeah. Okay. Which, yeah, m makes sense. And we, we we haven't talked about Marco Six much today, and I, I, I yet. So I think it's probably time to do so. Um, can can we yeah? Can we talk about Marco Six and where things well, are at? We launch Marco Six on the stream today. Um, I wish that were the case. Marco 6 has been uh, taking a lot longer than we initially thought that it was going to. Um, sorry, guys. Uh, but it, it is moving forward. Um, it, it is certainly not dead. Um, and yeah. I, we're we're there, so excited about it. There, there's some new stuff that I, I haven't even seen yet uh, on stream or people haven't seen yet stream. Marco 6 has a playground now, right? Marco 6 does have a playground. Um, it's not linked from anywhere, but if you go to marcojs.com slash playground, which is also not linked from anywhere, slash v6, um, you'll get to the, the Marco 6 playground. Um, and slash playground slash v6. V6. It's like the cheat code. Oh, ooh, it's here. I see it. Um, and uh, we can thank... Uh, Taylor Hunt for this awesome morning message. Um, but but yeah, so this is pretty cool because you can um, you can write Marco six. There's uh, you know still some limitations around it, but you can see the compiled output and, and see everything working. Right. So so what? What? Yeah. Where's the so we got the app preview? This clearly counts. The compiled HTML which is the server export yeah. and then the compiled DOM, which is the client export. Yeah. This is, this is like all interesting in its own, right? Cause you can actually see what we talked about before where this is, this is a resumable, uh, setup, right? I actually, how, one thing that I'm, yeah, it's hard. You, it's hard to see what the final result is though, in this example, cause this yeah. template this template has to be but, exported but no one's ever going to import it th this whole thing is designed to be um tree shaken right um, so so everything in marco 6 basically gets hoisted up um to the top level and then if it's not referenced then it just gets removed right because 
there's a default export here, which is like create the template, create the renderer, you know, which is like like import component and yeah. If you're going to import the component and client side render it, then right. this is the API that you would yeah. But the funny thing about this is, if you generally aren't going to ever call this import, which means that these are the top level, and if you are, this template actually will generally if it's not part of this, this template never gets imported generally. Right. And like if this is used by a parent, it'll import it, but it imports the template and uses it in its own template, which then doesn't get used right anywhere. So that, that all gets tree shaken out. Right. And then the walks, this is like how you hydrate this, this is encoded, right. but it actually does the get, 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 uh, you know, get the th important thing, go to the next sibling, you know, so it's, it's like an encoded walk. Um, we, we were looking at the Svelte 5 compiler the other day, um, yeah. and, you know, Dominic was telling us how, um, the, uh, extending the prototype method instead of calling the properties directly was faster. Um, so it was just interesting. This is, this is going like one step even further abstracted from calling the functions. This is actually encoding something that then will, each time the template goes through and, and tells it to go to the next right. thing it will yeah the, the interesting thing about this because and and this is something that you know you were um kind of working Mar on marco daily um at the time that we were talking about this so i know you know this but um you can get the um you can get more efficient walks by actually writing code right because like maybe um the the so we we're only getting two things here right but maybe there's a third thing and it's actually faster tr to traverse from the first, you know, reference that we grabbed than the, um, the, than the second reference. Whereas this is like linear, like you're always moving. Right. Forward. You always um, have to go in and then out. And right. Um, but in, in most cases, cause we did a lot of different like, um, tests to see, okay. So if we, if we write the, you know, this code that, you know, seems reasonable. Do, do we end up with these like inefficient walks? And it was like, most of the time, like this, this kind of just like continuing on through, um, the, the template, like doesn't result in, um, a, a large percentage of walks needing to do extra stuff and we can encode it really, really small, um, by right. doing this. Yeah. What's really cool about looking at the, 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 uh, the child template is there's no, component function like i mean you could like if you picture you saw this in in um solids uh output you saw this in felt fives output where there's uh, essentially it's a lot easier than looking at the old like vdom output of felt i'm sorry it's not actual vdom but like the old like class output of yeah. felt but you like most frameworks that hydrate there's a, the component is a function call that runs once and then everything else, even if it never runs again, it runs once. You can actually see the decoupling here right on the output because there's no run once here. It's like there's basically register a side effect. And by side effect, in this case, this is an event handler. So it's like on the first button. And I, I mean, we can play with this about you. If I put another button here just to mess with things, does that, does that change the, the compile output at all? Uh, the only thing that's going to change is the walk. So it's going to have to skip over that button to get to the first one. So you see over. Yeah, 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 yeah over. So that didn't actually change the ID of the... No. So it, it only assigns IDs to things that like actually do stuff. Yeah, so if you had a click handler. Yeah, I mean, I, I could have just... Yeah, whatever. I'm gonna, I this is an interesting syntax. You, the, the, you got, Marco 6 has the object syntax in the... You know, which saves you from the equal whatever. Um, yeah. So now there's button zero and button one. Um, but I, I got you. So what what I'm getting at is that there's it, it figures out where the uh, the uh, eff effect is and it registers and says that for this component index whatever Marco zero count. So it gets a specific. The right. end here is an ID. Um, this kind of tells it like for this instance of the component uh here's like the the relative stuff and you, you basically have the scope that gets injected yeah um, and that scope is probably the closest thing that we have like that scope kind of is the component almost 
Right. Right. Because it's, like if you think about um, solid, <laughs> right? Like it, there there are no components in solid. Right. Right. Like it, you know, from a runtime perspective. But the the component exists kind of as this like local closures. Scope. Yeah, enclosures. Yeah. Yeah, and so that that's what this scope is, um, and the reason that this is pulled out as this like object that we're passing around is so that we can serialize it from the server. Right. Um, and that's that's really the big thing that enables resumability is the scope object and the fact that it's something that we can serialize down. Right. You don't have to run code to recreate those closures. Right. Exactly. So now there's a scope here. So for that that scope, the button with this ID, it's almost like the the way people think of slots with hooks, like where there's one, two, like the it finds the the the, the right like location in the scope. The first, uh, you know, this ID, uh, you know, click handler. So this this scope will get us the button element. This will get us the click, and then um, this uh, this function is actually the click handler, which again reads from the scope to get the count which is a signal and then it will, or source, you guys call them sources. It'll queue the update of that source here, basically schedule it. So scope count, set the new value to count plus one. And then if you look at the rest of the code, there is a, you actually can, can, can we add something a little bit more interesting? And I, I don't, I mean, this is such a lame way of doing it, but let's add double count. Um, <laughs> which uh, there, there's a whole topic on Twitter about how you should never make this, uh, overwrapping computed or whatever, but we're just going to, we're just going to do double count here. And now we're going to use double count here. Um, so what you're going to notice is this is still the effect that gets registered. Um, this is basically the signal being generated, right? Again, to top level, but it, it 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 defines for the I guess it, it defines for the scope count and it sets up the dependencies because you're like here this is the effect that is that what's going on here what's this count effect and then double count these are the things that run when count updates and then double count is oh wow this is cool. It's actually reading the value. Is it reading the value from the, the, the tech or no, no, is it, this is writing. This is data. Yeah. This is text data. Right. Yeah. Text so, data. So this is just saying whenever double count updates run this and then double count is called from count called from count. So, so then you, you we, like we this got wrappers around them. So you, like the value wrapper, um, you know, you see on double count and count. Yeah, um, but what's returned from that actually is a function that has the same signature as the function that you pass there. So like double yeah. count is a function that receives scope and the the value of double count. So you just call right. it scope and the value and then it, it handles that. The, there's it's some cool. extra stuff that needs to, to happen. Um, which we could go into. Uh, so but, so the, but like, is there a this looks like you unwound the reactivity system. Is there a runtime reactivity system here? There is. Um, so when you call double count, there's um, a check. Um, there's there's a dirty check. Right. Gotcha. Um, so the other thing that we're not seeing here um, right now uh, if we add an intersection, we'll see it. Um, but there's a pass when you do um, Q source. So when you call Q source, it immediately goes and starts notifying um, things. Now there's nothing to notify uh, in, in this case. Yeah. So if we multiply that somewhere, add some, yeah. All right. Okay. So, so we've got an intersection here. And then if you come down to count or yeah, let's look at count. So now there's a, this expression count count, um, which is Babel doing weird stuff, but um, that, that's count count too, but then Babel strips off the number. Um, right. Yeah. 
So when we queue the source, it's going to look and say, OK, I queued this source. Does it have any intersections that I need to like go notify that like an update's coming? Um, and this is to solve the diamond problem, which I, I think you've gone yeah. over on several streams. So we don't necessarily yeah. need to, to go into that. Um, but now when when count updates and it comes to that intersection, it knows how many updates it's expecting to receive. Right. Um, but when those intersections aren't there, and so like if, if you were to add something downstream of this, like um, of this double count, then there won't, but there's no intersections, you know, it'll kind of short circuit that marking at that point in time. So we, we know when we need that and when we, uh, you know, and, and when we don't. This, it's, yeah, what's cool about this playground is you can actually see the, all this logic in action. Like, I think the only other thing I wanted to talk about here is the setup function doesn't get called unless you're client rendering, right? Like it's- Yeah, uh, so the setup function would be called from the parents setup function. Um, and then it's also passed to that create, uh, render or create template. Because it, it, it is actually this setup function that starts the creation of the reactor graph mm -hmm. when you go downwards. So you go call count, call count. So this means that if this is the top level component, this, this template never gets imported. Um, the, the, we need the walks, but the, the setup function also never gets imported in this case. And this never gets imported. So l basically, um, you grab the walks if I'm right. And since you don't actually call counter count two, we actually don't use the walks for hydration either. We had talked about using them at one point, but we decided to annotate nodes that are, that come from the server. Um, so okay. if, if, actually, if you go to the server compilation, the, the reason for that is because stuff extent browser extensions and, and such can get in between, uh, if you insert like one element it throws all the walks off. Right. Right. Um, so, or, you know, some, some third party script that you dropped on the page. Um, so we, we felt it was safer to, uh, more resilient to have the nodes themselves be marked. So we actually just walk the, the DOM um, and find those nodes. So yeah, you see we mark resume node um, and this lets us know, okay, that that text node. Um, it's also interesting, we, we mark after. So we use comments to mark and we insert the node after the node. Um, and that actually handles the cases of like automatic insertion of um, things like, you know, if, if you don't put a T body in a table, yeah. like browser will insert one for you. Um, or, uh, yeah. We talked about this actually a bunch yeah. with, uh, Dominic. What's interesting is I, I don't actually see anything on the element here. Are these, is it app preview being client rendered only? Yes. The, okay. the app preview is client rendered. So yeah, you're, yeah, yeah. unfortunately this doesn't actually show the, the hydration, um, so right. Yeah, the, but the reason I was commenting on this is without the setup, calling the count to initialize this, this just, the, the, this count function just exists here, but who- It does get called from the click handler and the click, that. so the click handler is the only thing that's held on to and yeah. that holds on to count. That's where I was getting to. Cause and it's- so That's it. Yeah. It's right here. It, exactly. So basically nothing runs. It just defines a bunch of these things that live a bunch of them don't get imported, but because counts in here and because this is a top level global, this code is here. So this code, you know, exists. These ones exist. This one never gets in, uh, never gets referenced anywhere except this export that never gets imported. So this gets tree shaken out. And what ends up happening is instead of when you initially render, you call set up and you call count count two, when you're doing hydration or like app startup, nothing runs except for the registration of these things. And then when you click the button for the first time, you can see it, it, it grabs the count value from scope, which was serialized from the server. And then at that point it goes, Oh, what's the signal that I need to update? But the signal isn't even like anything yet. So at that point, that's when it actually like builds everything out. Right. Yeah. Builds everything out is maybe not the, 
the right way to, to think about it. Um, so when you queue this, it's going to, um, it's going to walk this list of intersections uh, here that we see at the end of value. So this expression count count. So it's, there is yeah. a, a place in the scope that it's going to add like, like increment from undefined because the server doesn't serialize this stuff to one. Um, and then that's going to be all that happens synchronously, but we, we also queue that source to, right. to um, and then, so we, we hit the micro task, the, the queue starts flushing or draining. And, um, then we're going to call this, uh, this count function with the new value of count, uh, that was queued. Yeah. And, and so that's, that's going to run this function. And yeah. then it's also going to say, okay, expression count count, like I I'm done. And because it only got marked once, then expression count count is going to run. And so then we're going to grab count and count two out of the scope. Count was just updated by our click handler. Count two was serialized from the server. That code is never yeah. executed um, in the browser. And then we call double count with the new value, double count, and then it updates the text node. Exactly, yeah. So, so, so it's pretty much just function calls kind of all the way down. There are some dirty checks. Um, right in there yeah. uh but it, yeah there's no like objects or anything that are created uh through this um we we do update some like integers in the the scope through the process but i always thought this yeah i always thought this method was very clever uh just because um the compiler does a bunch of work but then it's literally just tree shaking to make um everything work like it like there's like older Marco, you, there's kind of like a bit of a bundling, post bundling analysis to figure out like the islands and the islands. Like sometimes, you know, something ends up on the client just because it's under an island, right? Whereas this system, the it's basically built ahead and then simply the tree shaking actually drops everything off the right. Right. Yeah. Um, and we still need to determine if that's going to be um, sufficient. Right, because this is resumable, but I don't see any like dollar signs anywhere or anything, right? So like, yeah. what's up with that? So um, <laughs> you're talking quick, right? Yeah, of course I'm talking quick, yeah. Um, we are, our, our goal is for you to just write this, um, this tags API language, which um, I'm a I'm a big fan of. I, I don't know how you feel uh, about it. I, I know you appreciate aspects of it, but I don't know if you love it yourself. I mean, it, it has a lot of qualities that are really quite nice. Biggest one is that, like the 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 whole you know um, like portability of stuff, like the fact that you can go like if component and then like you know, now the state existing is conditional or you can, because the right. imports automatically work, you can literally cut and paste and drop stuff in a different file and it just continues to, to work. Like, like basically there's no boundary between the, the declaration of uh, data and data dependencies and the view code, which makes it incredibly like WYSIWYG as a development experience. Yeah. Um, so yes, from that perspective, obviously I think, telling everyone that they have to write everything as XML is an adjustment. Um, <laughs> you can get rid of all the angle brackets if you want. Right, right. We can go in a terse, what is it called? Concise mode. Yeah, concise mode, yeah. And then, you, so like, you can just go like this, right? It still works hybrid, so like you can, yeah. There, the, the people can feel, you know, we can, where's the other one? Const. I mean, technically, we do it even with the button too, right? Because I can just go. Yeah, we can. I can remove this. Like that. And, and then, then the, add, the, add the dash dash. Sometimes joke that Marco's, like, people who want to write less, like, Marco's even less than Svelte. What's interesting to me is, is uh, and we talked about this before, is a lot of the reasons that Svelte changed the ruins uh, are things that Marco has already, like, 
kept in, taken in mind because like this is lead and cons, but they're tags. They already have like a specific syntax and meaning Marco. You can also make custom let right here and you know whatever we, we haven't defined a custom let but like technically you get the same composability uh, that you get with signals but the base primitive is still just a let right. and the computed still just a const um which is interesting it means that generally speaking there's no framework out there that lets you write less code um that's probably true unless you've got like you know built-in helpers for for yeah. something yeah right like I, I guess like I saw Alpine has like an outside click or something like that, and you can represent that, you know, pretty concisely in Marco. But you're, you know, you're going to need to write an effect for that. Whereas, like, they, they allow you to just put an attribute on, you know, something. So I mean, like, when you build in things like that, but in terms of, like, yeah, I, I, I think being able to having lightweight core and being able to express all this self yeah marco can can be pretty concise yeah. so it's a tricky one because it's it's not even a question anymore of like whether you can build the language that can represent the ideas it's like a question of like how comfortable people are of say like what i love about marco is it's just like like we have JavaScript expressions, but like Marco is a language. It is not JavaScript. It's not pretending to be JavaScript. It's not like you can ever get fooled and think that you wrote some JavaScript code and it uh, acts differently. And where the rest of the ecosystem is right now is they, they, they're kind of like, I want you to just write JavaScript code and it to work the way you would imagine it to work, but not the way JavaScript actually works. And I think in that place, I like Marco from its purity of like, this is doing what it says it's doing. Whereas like, it's very, I mean, yeah, everyone's been fighting the temptation to like leave the Marco file. But I think that is one of the principles that we're going to stick to that. Like we will do some crazy stuff with your Marco file, but we're not going to touch your JavaScript. Right. Which is uh, an interesting one. Cause like, macros with stuff like that we were in bling or server components and stuff for stuff like uh use server use client not use client as much but use server kind of t t dabble a little bit on the your javascript they change where it executes but they again don't morph your javascript yeah. solid so far has taken that position that outside of the jsx we don't morph your right. j j javascript so like that's why i like it's the compromise place that's the the hardest. Yeah. So even within the Marco template, like the the expressions and stuff that you write, with the exception of um, of the of assignments, like the count plus plus there, where you're assigning to a tag variable, you know this variable that came from Marco, we we don't touch your JavaScript expressions either um, in here. Right. Right. Like we're not changing your it, it, even going as far as like we're not changing your count to a scope read we just introduce count into the the scope where that expression is running yeah it makes sense yeah yeah so like it, it, it is one of these really it is one of these like tensions on that because like as i said for people ask me this about solid a lot of time i like i know we could just keep on adding more compilers and like layers at a certain point, we're just not going to be writing JavaScript, which is okay. But then we have to acknowledge we're not writing JavaScript, you know? And I think, I think that's where the delicate ba balance is and why like, yeah. I, I, I'm, I get more torn, the more like, I actually think I like Svelte five a lot better than I like Svelte three or four, because at least with the macros and stuff, I can tell that they they're in, like they're inventing their own language primitives. They're not trying to override what letter const does or whatever. Right. Um, this is fine because it's like, it, it, it's going to appeal to the let const people, but like clearly this is not JavaScript here. Like, right. So yeah, I, I it's one of those things where um, I'm still very much on the j just JavaScript side, ironically. Yeah. The, um, it's it's very interesting from a, a language design perspective uh, as well. Like, because yeah. every other um, framework, React, Vue, Svelte, 
um, solid, you know, have these, there is like a, a very JavaScript portion of that, that um, the, the reactivity lives in, right? Um, right. E even spelt for, you know, there, there's the script tag and there's like reactivity going on um, in there. And now with spelt five, it's escaping even the, the spelt file with the runes. Um, right. But with view and solid and react, you know, you've got hooks that you can just write in other files. Um, and I I'm curious to see what that looks like um for for spelt specifically because uh of the the languages that i just mentioned um i mean i guess they're the only one that can't also define components in the javascript right okay um so can you, you know, Huh? View, can view. You can opt into JSX, so you right. you can do that. Um, I'm I'm sure you're going to be able to accomplish like you know whatever you need to in Svelte by like you create another Svelte file and import that and then expose that through your like custom hook, you know, or whatever. But um, it, it's kind of interesting that like as you start to pull this out, there may be some patterns that are like potentially more. Um, more difficult um, to, to represent. It, it's interesting because Marco kind of forces you to stay in Marco land whenever there's reactivity um, right. involved. And so there's, there's also a natural place to be able to do some of these powerful things like these, you know, so-called hooks or tags, like they can be aware of where they are in the tree. They can render stuff. They can return stuff that renders stuff um and so you, you yeah. get some benefit uh, of that um but and it, it's interesting too because like if you call use state in react like yeah you're just using that in a javascript function but that javascript function is only usable within react right um yes. or I mean, even with solid solids reactivity system is is open right like i could you know, write some stuff that, um, you know, doesn't actually use like the components or the, the components, or, or stuff, but you still need to use solid to consume whatever's coming back from that, you know, just a function. Um, same with felt, same with view. Hmm. Um, and so that ultimately has to be consumed by the framework. You know, it, it it doesn't feel that bad, or it feels good even for you know that to be written as a Marco file. It's something that has to be consumed by Marco, right? Like, yeah, it, yeah. there's there's no confusion about like, oh, can I use this React hook in a in a view app? Well, it, I mean, maybe if you convert it, you know, in some way, but it, it is very much a React function, you know, at that point. It's not just a, you know, a JavaScript function. Even right, right. Yeah, yeah, I mean, if you're using a, yeah, I, I guess that's interesting. Yeah, because if you're using a, if you're using a specific um, library, then, I mean, it's more than that. Like, actually, the pure reactivity on its own, I don't know if it has that quality, but the second that, uh, I mean, I don't know. I Actually, I do wonder if Solid and View Vapor fit into that because Svelte continues to because of the, their macros for their ruins. But when you're... It, it, the, the fact that, that Vue and Solid expose, fully expose the reactive system makes it less so because... But, but you still have to consume it from the reactive system. You can't just be like, here's a signal, right? Like, you, I mean, unless you're going to read it one time or like pull it, you, you kind of need to like create a route and like listen. Right, but like... The, the top level you don't right like like i'm i'm just saying like I'm just, hypothetically here you, the 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 simplest reactive system true. app yes. is is a function yeah. that runs once that uses you don't need to use a signal to, and to then like you make it a, right? and you make yeah. an effect right so from that perspective it's not like being yeah. fed into a framework to process it 
And in so the JSX is sort of also just creating the effect. So you could argue that with solid style right. render, it doesn't actually get fed into a framework. We, maybe we can actually claim to be a library where almost none of these other ones can actually claim to be a library. They're, they're I would frameworks. say that's fair. Yeah, I, I really like the intro that you do with um, solid, you know, starting with these like singleton um, uh, signals and uh, I almost forgot signals. How did that happen? Um, these singleton signals and, you know, just creating raw DOM nodes and updating. Right, ex ex exactly. Yeah. So I, I think that's a really nice um, introduction. Yeah, I mean, to be fair, the, the, the I'm, I'm still trying to figure out what that introduction is for Marco. Um, it, I don't, was it Bloop? That, I think it was James Long wrote an article on back in like 2014, 2015 timeframe that I felt like was a really good introduction to like the virtual DOM and React. And it's just like, I'm just gonna render this all, you know, repeatedly render this thing and just blow everything away. And like, look, it works. It does what React does, except React's using a virtual DOM, so it's not quite blowing everything away, right? Yeah. Um, um, yeah, there there was a uh, there was a question here. Uh, let me see if I can get StreamYard to play. I might have to restart it, I'll, but I'll wait. Hopefully, I, I can leave it till. Um, yeah, here we go. I think it's showing up now. Do you see the question? Actually, yeah. No, yeah. Maybe, maybe I missed this question, but why the markup style syntax? So. I mean, part of this is that Marco starts, uh, Marco's history starts as a, a templating language. And so we kind of like just enter straight into the, the HTML. Um, you can copy and paste HTML, put it in a Marco file and it's, it's going to work. Yeah, doc type, like everything. Um, and so the, the tags API, uh, which is what you're seeing here is um kind of it, it it's it's a cohesive language that brings reactivity to this like html like language um and we were just having a discussion uh, i don't know if you called it or not on like the the value or perhaps not value of you know having this in the template versus like coming from yeah um javascript but ultimately like these values have to be consumed by the, the template. Um, and like th there's composability here, right? Like you can create your own um, custom let, you can, you know, create essentially hooks, um, custom renderers, all, all kinds of stuff that are um, quite powerful and I, I, I really enjoy writing with the tags API. I almost wish, not almost, I, I wish we hadn't tied the tags API to the, the Marco 6 release so tightly. I, I wish this was out in the wild for, for people to be using if it, even if it was backed by VDOM. I think it's a, a really awesome way to, um, to write Marco and write applications. Yeah, so... Yeah, so there's a comparison being made that it's kind of like svelte the way that it hides the reactivity. But what one thing that Marco's done, and we haven't really shown, we don't have time to show on this stream, I think we showed it before, is it actually, the there, there's because of the use of the tags in the language, it's actually defined how it goes. You, you continue using it as a variable, even cross file boundaries. There's like a syntax for like returning the variable out, but essentially um, it, it's, it still continues to, be um, you, the wrapper doesn't change. Where Svelte is kind of going like, hey, you can wrap it however you want when it leaves a local scope. Marco actually defines the wrapper, which is it still looks like a variable because it because the compiler is smart enough with cross template analysis to actually know everything that's reactive across your whole application. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, so, because it, yeah, there, 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 there's definitely some interesting stuff. This, this, the fact that this kind of felt conversation um, kind of comes back is is not not surprising. I, you sent me something the other day, Michael, um, which was that you were like you were like what if, what if solid had ruins? And um, yeah, I, I thought it was kind of funny because uh, obviously there's the solid label library which actually does do this. We've had it for a couple of years, but um, 
you, you the one thing that you added because this is very similar to what we had before actually um yeah I, I think it combines several like there there were a ton of macros and solid macros like a ton yeah um and I, th this combines a couple of them into you know a, a single yeah. macro that behaves differently depending on where it exists in the AST. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like the, you're like instead like I think there's a dollar sign property in solid labels. This just does it automatically when it sees that it's an object, right? Like there's no need yeah. need to to have a, like a different property for it. But um, what I was interesting is you added a bind thing. Yeah. Uh, and I'm gathering the goal of this was for two way binding so that you could say bind text done and then. Yeah. yeah, but also on attributes. Yeah, this is this is just. Oh yeah, bind. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't know how comfortable I am with this, but this is <laughs> this is very interesting thing. We yeah, we have dollar ND structure, but um, yeah, I mean this is interesting when you get to as to the especially to where you are with Marco where the tags aren't just um a unidirectional tree like uh um like you know like the dom and we talk about unidirectional flow locality a lot of times you're just passing things down events up but the tags are actually um kind of like hooks or composable primitives so like you know sometimes they do return the signal so to speak uh uh it is interesting that you know the, the probably what inspired this is that especially marco because this like the syntax for it, it it's all the same thing right like two-way binding and the ability to like exports uh, have reactivity work between files is actually a very similar concept right yeah so yeah i think we covered two-way binding in our last stream uh in the controlled uncontrolled uh, stuff or and Dylan... it's not implemented natively in Marco six yet. Um, gotcha. so we won't be able to do it in this playground. If you delete the V six from here, um, the, the Marco five playground does have the, the tags API preview where a version of it is working if we wanted to play with that, but I know we did cover it before. Yeah. So, I mean, I guess the question is, where is this going next? Because my understanding, okay, Marco six is missing some stuff around async that's getting resolved. Um, we already can see the compiled output for like the synchronous stuff and like the main state updates. It's pretty cool to look at and play at, play with. Um, but, uh, and there's the tags API in Marco five, but my understanding is you are working on, um, a compa compatibility layer between Marco five and Marco six right now. I am. Yeah. That's where my main focus is right now. And it's. So what it is, is it's actually embedding Marco 6 inside um, Marco 5. So it actually, do you still have up the, the Marco compiler docs? Um, maybe not. I mean, I'm on the website, but. Yeah, just go to docs compiler. It's down here. Uh, it's under reference right there. Yeah. And then it, you saw that diagram. I don't know where it is exactly on the page, but there's it's a near the, somewhere. It's near the yeah. bottom. This one? Yeah, right there, yeah. So we, we have this concept of translators, which is the last stage in the compiler that takes Marco code and converts it into um, JavaScript code that you know, will ultimately run. And um, so Marco 5 has a translator um, that translates to, you know, essentially this, the, the runtime that it uses. And it, it's pretty much the same runtime that existed in, in Marco 4 um, to, you know, a couple of things have been updated uh, since its release. But um, like, like we mentioned, by and large, Marco 5 was just a, a rewrite of the compiler um, and it introduced this concept of translators. Um, and so Marco six really is just a translator to a new runtime. Um, and you know, it, it does a lot more analysis, um, than the, the Marco five translator, uh, does, but it's, you know, just, uh, it, it's essentially a new plugin to the, um, 
to the compiler. So, you know, technically we don't need to release Marco six. You could just change the the compiler config to say use this other translator, um, and you know, you, you actually can do that um, today to test out Marco six if you build it yourself because we haven't published it yet. But um, interesting. So, like, what what's motivating <laughs> motivating this? So. If I'm understanding, is you're gonna have you can have a Marco Five app and then have Marco Six components like just sitting yeah. alongside them. So, so what I'm working on is this interop translator. I'm calling it, and so it actually wraps both the Marco Five and the Marco Six translator, and so it detects different language features um, that are. Uh, basically tags API. The tags API preview implementation that we have in Marco 5 has the same check. So I, I kind of ripped the, the checks um, out of that package. And so if it's if it determines it to be a Marco 5 component, you know, it sees a class or you know some some other things that are Marco 5 only that have been deprecated, then it goes down the um, the the Marco five path. And if it sees, you know, some of this newer stuff like a let tag or, or stuff like that, then it goes down the Marco six path. And so what you actually get out truly is a, a Marco six component. It's not like, you know, the tags API running on the VDOM or, or anything like that. Um, and then uh, the, the other piece to that is um, it uses child template analysis, um, very basic to look at um, the the child components that the template's rendering. And if it sees that, oh, these child components are actually tags API components, but I'm a class component, rather than going down the normal like custom tag compilation that would like, you know, inline a call to the tag, it um, it swaps that for a dynamic tag. And then um, so it swaps it for a dynamic tag. And then it injects a, a script that patches the behavior of the dynamic tag. Um, so now the dynamic tag has this like logic to be able to say, oh, this is a component from the other runtime and it will do some some interop at runtime. Right. Because I was going to say um, VDOM re-renders over and over again. Yeah. Leaf node Marco 6 component doesn't want to re-render over and over again. Right. Yeah. So, so when um, when the VDOM re-renders, it's going to get new uh, attributes, new input, and then that that input's going to be passed to the the Marco Six component. It'll fine grainly update. Fine grainly is that a, a word? Yeah, I'm, 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 <laughs> every, every every variation exists now. Of on the um, on. but but yeah. Um, so the 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 re-rendering kind of stops at that that boundary. Um, and then similarly, it'll do fine-grained updates through the, the Marco 6 side of things. And if you hit one of these VDOM components, when it receives new data, it'll just re-render and do a diff. And so um, we, we did want at some point to have like the, the class components actually running on top of this like fine-grained update, but the we've been through this whole thing before um, yeah. you, you alluded to it you know having to, to upgrade hundreds of apps across the the company um, and I I think we're gonna be served by uh, you know having exactly the same behavior for the the existing components um, rather than trying to to get them to run on top of this or having you know letting you use the the tags API now, um, running it on top of VDOM, and then swapping out the, the implementation underneath. And there's a few slight differences that cause, you know, confusing breakages um, when, when right. people update. Um, so when you, once this is done, you'll be able to start using um, Marco 6 components in your Marco 5 apps. Um, like you mentioned, async is not quite done yet. There's there's still some open questions there. I think we know the route that we have to go down, which is going to look very similar to Solid and React. Um, but you know I had a different vision for async that I don't know is going to pan out. So I'm still kind of, we've been pushing that off, and I'm still kind of holding on hope that I can get that working the, 
um, the way that I would like to, but it's it's not looking good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, concurrency models are harder. I, I was explaining to people before, this is like the hang up. It's like when you know that you're going to be going to a place where you're going to need this, especially because streaming is so important to eBay's use case. And, and as you mentioned, uh, async or the wait tag only ever worked on the server. Now you want to have the server and the client. You get, You almost have to solve all these problems at the same time, which is really hard because they're both... Part of the problem is like a lot of these solutions feel like they're more complex than they need to. So you spend a whole bunch of time trying to figure out if you like there's some revelation that could make you find a solution that's correct and also less complex. And yeah. you, you can't really like break these things apart because they're all related. Right. But uh, but that's when like so yeah. What's we, this? Let's say this com, com, uh, interrupt layer between Marco Six. Uh, and Marco five comes out. Um, and so are we, are we getting close to the finish line for Marco six? We are getting close. Um, yes, there's, there's a couple like basic things that still need to, um, need to be handled. Uh, and the, the compatibility layer, the compatibility layer is, is very close. I'm, I'm hoping to have that, um, done here in the next uh, couple weeks. Um, and then we'll be shifting focus back to, to Marco six itself so that what, you know, you can run in Marco five actually like covers all the bases. Um, but it is kind of nice. I think that, you know, um, we'll be able to, um, experiment with this and kind of supplement with the class components where, where things aren't fully implemented. Um, yeah. But no, I, I, yeah, oh, you have your marker shirt. Too? Oh yeah, yeah, I haven't seen it yet. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Or I guess I, I probably just haven't been looking at you all that much. Yeah, just yeah. I, it's it's it, it's hard to estimate how much more time it's going to take to iron it out. It really the is, and it's part, and it's largely because the the async model. As long as there's like a question that's undecided, that's expensive, you can't like, you can't just like put a stamp on it. Like if right. you understand like the work that's left to done, you can put a stamp on it. It's probably an underestimate, but it's at least in the ballpark. The problem with this async stuff is like at a certain point, like you leave it as long as possible so you can make all the other decisions you can and push right. things forward. But you're getting to the, we're getting to the end of the line here. Yes. Um, and, and I think that's a big reason why things have, have dragged on because we've had these like we want to do this and we don't even know if it's possible. Right. Um, and, uh, we're, we're getting to the end of those, which is good. Um, but yeah. you know, you, and then you, when you're trying to even figure out if something's possible, you know, you kind of have different tracks that you go down, try something. Well, that, that didn't work, you know, the, or it, it worked, but there were trade-offs that we're not willing to make. Um, and, and that kind of, are, are you ever concerned that, uh, like just you started on this project because you wanted an HTML templating language. Yeah. Right. Are you ever concerned that like front end frameworks and like the complexity that we bring in has just gone like way off the deep end? Like you've watched the whole progression from like literally, Yes, like, <laughs> template almost to like yes. whatever this is. Am I concerned is. that we're contributing to it? Yes. Um, and, I mean, and that's one of the the things, right? Like, it there's a ton, a ton of complexity in computing, right? Like, not not even talking web development, but just like computing in general, right? There's abstraction upon abstraction upon abstraction. And a lot of those abstractions are super helpful. I mean, HTML itself is an abstraction, right? Yeah. Um, the problem is when they're leaky. Um, and so, I mean, that has been one of the the big things that we're, we're trying to solve. But I, I also have concerns because I am very aware of where, you know, things with Marco 6 currently leak. Um, but if you don't have to um 
if you don't have to think about the layer underneath, right? Like if you're not having to think about the the compiler, right? Um, if it actually works the way that you expect it to when you're, you know, debugging, you know, you can just look at the values in your template and see, you know, how they're changing. You get the the type inference in your template. Like you never have to think about what it compiles to. Um, now, what it compiles to does should influence, you know, the your your mental model, but you don't necessarily have to to understand that for um, for it all to work. Just like you don't need to understand exactly how the the browsers parsing HTML, how it's rendering it, right? Like if we can do that and and minimize the the leaks. Um, then I, I think it'll be a, a good thing. I I really do enjoy writing in the tags API. I think it's a good way to to build um, applications. Um, and if it's fast um, and it works, um, and you don't have to to think about it, and you get to to focus on building your application. Um, I, I think we'll have added something positive to the the web community. Yeah, yeah. the the, the reason The reason that I, I ask is because there's been like a backlash recently, and it, it's happened to different degrees. Obviously, you know, GraphQL. I I, I was just reading about people. Uh, I think Adam Rackus wrote yeah, something. Yeah, I saw that tweet this morning. About and maybe I'll, I'll I'll talk a bit about that more in this week in JavaScript. Um, but like. Like a, a, another backlash is something like HTMX. Um, yeah. I, uh, have you looked at HTMX at all? I ha I have to a degree. Um... Yeah, it's it's just it's one of those situations. Uh, honestly, where... if I were going to go back to simplicity, um, I, I would probably look at something more like Enhance than uh, HTMX. I, I think. Um, I, yeah, yeah. It just it, it's it's interesting because it's kind of like we're they're they're trying to reset back to like I don't know hyperscript or you know um, I don't know. Well, hyperscript is its own thing. No, not and not hyperscript that's... JSX, but like like hypermedia or whatever. Yeah, but it, it, you've seen hyperscript, right? Not hyper, not JSX hyperscript. But, but HTMX is hyperscript, like language, like I'm going to write like this made up programming language in HTML attributes. Yeah, yeah, I did actually see a bit of that. Yeah. Um, I don't know. It, it's like one of those things where you like, if you're going to design a new language, like you kind of want all the tooling around it. Like you don't want it to just be a string that nothing understands, right? Like how do I debug that, you know, I, I'm not going to be able to hover over that in my editor unless, you know, like the, the efforts put in to, to actually truly make it like a language with all the, the language tools. Right. Um, and it doesn't, I feel like it doesn't bring a whole lot new to the, the table that, um, you know, JavaScript doesn't already have or, or could have during you know with a library yes. i mean you could potentially make the same argument with with marco but but marco's got like this whole you know to totally different flow like hyperscript is just an imperative scripting language that you know has some syntax sugar for common web dev stuff which i mean isn't to say that's useless but um, i mean the, the reason we got there or we're there is simply because htmx alone expressiveness of its HTML is insufficient to handle all the use cases. Right. So, yeah, I mean, this, this is, yeah, as I said, there, there is an attempt right now at a reset, like, a, yeah. like, like a baseline. I, of... I think, I think philosophically, like I, I kind of agree. Like the, the, the philosophy of Marco from the language standpoint is like, add as little to HTML as necessary to make it you know, like truly capable as uh, a language to to build these, you know, modern applications that have, you know, the need for, you know, composable components and, and every, 
thing. And it, it, it really isn't a whole lot that's been added, you know, syntactically to, um, to HTML. But there, there is this whole compiler tool chain attached um, to it. And so, I mean, I, I understand that. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. What do you? I, I, I'm just using this opportunity to ask you about like all the all the hot topics here. Like, what do you? Do you can you? Can we take no build people seriously? Like, I, I. So, actually, um, this was a while ago, several months ago. I actually decided I wanted to to build something, and I was like, I don't feel like dealing with a build. Um, but I was like, okay, so I know solid supports like tag template literals. I'll just start building with the tag template literals and, and solid. Um, and it didn't take too long before I was like, nah, I'm, I'm going to set up beat. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so, so I don't know. Yeah, it's just it's just interesting. We we're on one hand, you like you, you kind of like we shouldn't be accustomed to this. Um, it's so hard when the both lines keep on moving, right? You could say that the baseline is way better now than it used to be. So when you can talk about no build in the past, you could be like, no, like like you needed a build, and now maybe you don't because the 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 floor is so much higher. But on the yeah, other hand, I mean, I was still able things... to break components up into multiple files, right? Like I just screw a script tag, I don't need it, write everyone one file, I've still got modularization, right? But I don't know, there were there were things. <laughs> part, part of it was, uh, it was solid specific and, you know, needing to, to wrap things in, in functions. functions that I didn't yeah. want, really want to have to think about, but I don't know. Right. So like it, it, it makes sense for why there's a desire for this reset. But I wonder if I, I can we get there without inventing a new language, essentially, is is kind of like thing like we've been forcing against the language um, this whole time. Right. Like it, it, it's like, as you mentioned earlier, is it, is it about filling the holes of abstraction? So, yeah, I. I think we can hide some of it, but I don't know if it's a going away, right? Like with, um, cause if you're gonna do no build with a bunch of different modules, right? Even if your module graph is fairly shallow, like you're gonna end up with, with network waterfalls and network waterfalls are a bad thing. Um, especially, you know, when you're, you're talking these, um, yeah. these, devices on on slow internet it's just like this like yeah Be before the quick <laughs> optimizer was working properly i had some demos where i was on a slow network and then i'd like click an interaction and don't get me wrong quick doesn't actually yeah. do this in a preload but it was like it was an example where i had a ton of bundles for something that like you wouldn't expect it and it was like click load one bundle then load three that loaded two like you just like start fanning out um well yeah yeah and so i I actually really admire Quick in the the way that they've like launched incrementally. Um, Marcos Marco team could probably learn something from that. Um, but yeah, like early on, uh, I, I think I went to the builder website after they had just converted it to to Quick and like tried to open the menu, and I had like just left my house, um, and I was uh, in the car. And so I was like disconnecting from my my Wi-Fi network and like switching over to um, the the cell network. And it was like three seconds before the menu opened, and it was like, come on now, um, right? But, but I mean, definitely they're they're not doing that anymore, right? They're they've got a build right. um, that is you know determining what needs to be sent. And and similar for, for no build, like people will say, okay, well, you don't need to bundle it, you know, you just create the um the export maps, you know, preloads and everything. It's like, well, something needs to run on the files to do that. And I've heard the argument, well, that could be moved into our CDNs. Um and and it could be. Um we actually have 
stuff like that. Our, our, our resource server that I mentioned is not just a dumb file server. Like it, it does kind of understand the, the assets that are on there and processes them. And that has been challenging uh, in, in cases where like it's running an old version of Google Closure compiler and we try to ship some new syntax that's, you know, actually supported in all the browsers that, you know, we, um, you know, need to support and the resource server doesn't support, you know, that, that syntax. And so then a new version of Closure compiler was installed, but, um, you know, it, it's like you, you kind of have this like infrastructure and I'd, I'd rather have control over that you know a, a lot of our apps now we we disable uh, some of the features from the resource server and like we'll, we'll just handle that ourselves at our build time you know we'll we'll make sure that the javascript that's being served is is correct for our users and I, i'd much rather have that control at the application level rather than outsourcing that to some infrastructure because it's going to work when it works and when it doesn't work you have very limited control to actually fix anything right yeah, so I wonder how much of this stuff just comes back to like the classic split between like websites and applications, where the people who are asking for a lot of these features are that like I, there's a comment here about like no build works well when you're using a jQuery esque library, not for full JavaScript frame applications. It, it, it's it's I mean vanilla. The point is like if you can build an application basically in vanilla JavaScript, maybe a little library here and there, and like that's works for you then this can definitely work for you i just i guess there's this question of like can any actual real application be sustained like we have these frameworks and tools for a reason like can they actually be sustained using like just javascript because obviously it'll be lighter it'll be faster it'll be better in in like all those kind of you know at least in theory in all those mechanical ways but like is like, it, i think it's one of those things where um depending on how it's used. And a lot of these no build um, proponents are also like low JavaScript proponents, you know, low dependency proponents. And so in that scenario, it can, it can work. And the, um, and the downsides, you know, it, it, there, there are objective downsides, you know, don't add up enough to, to matter enough. Right. Um, but even so, you know, it, it might be in a, an amount that doesn't matter, but a build is still going to be able to optimize things to a point where build should always be faster than no build, holding everything else constant, right? Like if I can, if I can minify and and inline, you know, everything into a single request, there are overhead to, to HTTP requests, then, um, you know, you're your one file that you're, you know, serving is still going to be served faster if it's minified, maybe not much faster, but it is going to be faster. So in, in a way, I think it's kind of a, a DX motivated thing, right? Like it, it, no build is not better, um, directly for the users. Yeah, uh, it, there there may be some some trickle down benefit, you know, if if it, it truly is like that much better for for your pro productivity as a developer, then you're able to ship you know things to your users faster, and so you you might get a win that way. But in terms of yeah, it, it's funny because it's like multiple inflection points there where it's like okay. Like we, the reason we don't build our apps completely in vanilla JavaScript, like just straight on is because having the abstraction makes it easier for people to like use these declarative patterns. Other people understand other people's intents and do that. So like, like if you, on one hand, the DX, you know, improves of not worrying about these build structures and all the setup. But then on the other hand, like at the point, another piece scales, will you hit it again? Like it's, I wonder if there's like too many moving, like rising pieces that trying to like jump from platform to platform is like, very difficult when the, the floor right. keeps on rising or whatever, you know? Uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's definitely interesting. I actually, th there's a comment a while ago that I wanted to actually throw up on the stream and see if you had an opinion on we're at Q and A with Michael, if you haven't uh, followed. So if you have any questions, for Michael, mind, sorry, would you mind if I took a quick break to use the restroom real quick? I'll be right back. 
Okay, fine. Uh, All yeah, right. Yes. I'll be super quick. Yeah. Yeah, because there, there's a comment here that about, uh, I saw this about like Svelte introducing compilation stuff as a huge win. I wish it came 20 years earlier. Um, the thing is, compilation JavaScript frameworks has existed well before Svelte. Um, Elm is, uh, is, is a is a good example of that um sorry this is the question i want Streamyard is really giving me a hard time right now um anyways elm had compilation in javascript uh and uh marco had compilation in javascript you know back in 2013 14 um so it was pretty early on then there's uh the thing uh it's not coming to me right now uh the f there's another JS framework. Uh, uh, oh, what is it? The, 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 the Imba. Yeah, Imba. Um, so yeah, Elm 2011 or 12, Marco 2013, 14, Imba 2015, uh, Svelte 2019. So I, I, there were things out there earlier doing this stuff it's just um yeah sorry let, let, let me go back to that other comment that i wanted to to ask uh michael about because it's actually kind of on key with this thing it was it, it, people want to know if the, if, you, if you have any more secrets behind the the curtain at marco and ebay like we've talked about a lot of things that that marco was doing very and the ebay, eBay team were doing early on and part of this comes from uh coming from a different place where a lot of you know meta was looking at how they could build mobile apps and kind of tie that stuff together when they built react ebay was like how can we replace our java backend with a javascript one that's like fast enough to actually render our pages and you know so a lot of things mattered like streaming it was i think in terms of javascript frameworks and open source first for streaming first for uh uh, I mean, technically, Dust was first. Yeah, you, you, is Dust a, is Dust a framework? But no, yeah, it's a templating language. Yeah. Uh, um, what's another early? Let's say not even necessarily first, because other people um, using compiler like a single file components uh, format. Uh, there's Riot also back then, uh, but I I don't know how many. Yeah, how I don't know. Pretty early on in that thing. Riot may have been earlier than us. Yeah, right. It was around the same time period. Single file components, compiled so compiled framework, um, partial hydration and islands. Um, uh, obviously, uh, like there's a lot of innovation in the Lasso Bundler. Um, but yeah, the question is: Is there something we haven't seen? Um, you know, is there any more secrets behind the thing? You know, behind the door. So we're, we're saying something outside of Marco that really we should know about and like everyone yeah. should be doing. I don't know. Um, yeah, I mean, it's a tough question. I was just curious if you had anything to add to that. You can went to just me. Yeah, I don't, this is kind of like outside of Marco. So are, are you still here, Ryan? Sorry, my stream yard finally died on me. Okay. I don't know if I was live during uh, that or not, but I was just kind of like stumbling around. I don't know. Um, Yeah. I think there's um, streaming. All right, our trolls back. Sorry, I'm just looking at the comment. There's some comment about RSCs being fast. It was a funny one. Anyways, um, um, yeah. Uh, yeah, I don't know. That's a tough question. Do we have any other? Uh, let's move on. Let's see. Yeah, we've had compiled templates for for ages. Um, but yeah, I, I, I'm just catching up on chat because it seems like 
people are talking about st some old tech. Yeah, coffee script. Yeah, okay. Uh, let's rebrand no build to compile. Yeah, sorry. I was missing comments, I'm realizing now, just because of how bad StreamYard was choking on me. All right, it's all good. Now, now, now I can actually see stuff. All right, um, <laughs> I meant something Marco we haven't seen outside of it. Okay, yeah, okay. So this is yeah. So yeah, this is the other question. Is there any more secrets behind the behind the Marco wall? Some new text that 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 you or is the stuff? The funny thing is, a lot of the Marco stuff was always out in the open. People just didn't realize it was there. We've done a much yeah, better I, job I, I talking about it. We're hiding. Um anything yeah yeah okay so we're good we, we, we haven't talked about serialization at all i think that's something that's interesting although quick's doing some very similar stuff um yeah i mean we briefly arena. talked about i was like how did marco not have the dollar sign so oh I, yeah and he, like I guess it's a fair question. I just want your thoughts on like resumability type stuff in general, because um, like it's tricky. To, how, how do we figure out if it's worth it? Because the thing is we're trading one serialization cost for uh, that happens on the server that slows down server right. rendering for execution costs in the client. Like we don't need, we can shrink the amount of JavaScript um, without like, you know, fairly effectively regardless yeah. of, of because uh, Dominic last week was talking about how they could eliminate parts of their components, but they would still be doing a fairly normal hydrate right. um, step with that, right? Like rerunning stuff. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, you, you would be able to come up with um, with cases where I think you'd be able to come up with cases where resumability is slower than just hydrating. Um, now, if you defer that work, then, you know, maybe, um, maybe it doesn't matter, but if you defer hydration, you know, which, you know, selective hydration, um, deferred hydration, you can do. I mean, it, not exactly, but like I almost felt like early quick was almost doing deferred hydration. Hydration, yeah, really? yeah. I, well, well, you I, in an article I said that they weren't truly resumable, and um, Misco got offended. But the, the truth of the matter is they weren't because they were a VDOM library, and there still are. But what the final piece, and they've really acknowledged this with the, it was when they got signals in, that's when it actually became like completely resumable. But ironically, to get that benefit, you have to write quick the way you write solid. If you write quick the way you write React, then you're back to, like, yeah. you know what I mean? I do. do. Do does the audience know what I mean? Like you're back to like rerunning components on. Yeah, but yeah, so. Yeah, it's interesting because you don't rerun you, you don't rerun everything immediately, right? But yeah. you still needed to to rerun the component when the, the data changed. So, like, is that really all that different than like waiting to hydrate until the data changes? Right. Obviously, now with signals, you don't have to rerun the component. The other things that are non-related don't have to wake up, and now they the, the achieve that. Yeah. But like the er earliest versions of of quick, you could say we're, we're like that. So yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's a tricky problem and it, I don't know. So, but yeah, so, I mean, we've got this whole matrix of like, you know, potential optimizations where you have like deferring work, uh, eliminating code, which eliminating code also eliminates what's actually executing, but then, you know, also like trying to make it so code doesn't need to execute to become interactive. Right. And like, these are all kind of different approaches to the, the cost of, you know, initializing a, a server rendered app. Um, and it's, it's interesting. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, this there's, is this there's is, trade-offs involved with with every uh, approach. We've taken an approach with Marco um, where we're trying to eliminate as much code as possible, trying to make it so that as little code as possible is needed to be executed, but we're going to do everything eagerly. Um, right. And I mean, that does have some trade-offs, right? Because it's, it's not a instant startup necessarily. Right. Right. Um, yeah, and, and, but, but once it is booted up, it's, it's done. Right. Like, you know, we talked about, you know, the, the hacker news example with the, like the, what it was 1.6 KB or whatever. Right. Like that's, that's all yeah. that ever gets loaded. Right. Like everything's there. Yeah. One of the things here is actually, this is for our resumable solutions we're talking about. This isn't actually true. We don't rerun the compute, the, we only, we don't like, yeah, okay, we, we rerun the computed computations, but they're isolated from like, how should I put it during hydration time period, we don't, I guess it depends on what part of the conversation you're talking about. Like, like the with the with these resumable frameworks, we run the computation on the server, which means we track the dependencies. So we don't have to run them on the client. So we actually know the data dependencies at startup. So then, essentially, it's only if something changes at that point, that we don't actually we we change the we yeah if something depends on something then yes it's going to continue down the path but we don't actually end up in a place where like adjacent things that have nothing to do with it will rerun right. so so this is where like the differentiation comes in because like we know the dependencies before the app update starts off where like what was happening early quick before that signals is it was literally like a like a like react like re-render the component this data over here this data here it's almost more like you right like yeah. they, they had they did have a reactive system that was feeding into a vdom yeah yeah um and they still have that as a fallback but yeah right. exactly it, but it's like one of those situations where like like the whole thing kind of gets entangled at that point and like all you need to render all the jsx and you need to be aware of all the the, the primitives or computations that are happening instead of just like direct lining it right um, yeah, in, in Marco, rather than serialize, we do have one case, um, where we need to serialize, uh, dependencies down, but in, in the vast majority of cases, the, um, the code, and we, we saw that compiled code, right? Like count calls double count. Right. So there, there actually aren't the, the code kind of implicitly has those dependencies because count saying when I change, I'm going to pass this value to double count and therefore, you know, it's changing, but yeah, you need those, those dependencies created in some way that doesn't have to do with, you know, running them. Right. Yeah. It is. Yeah, it is. It is interesting. Cause yeah, when I was working on that other resumable thing, getting without the dollar signs, trying to avoid some level of the hoisting, it is actually, I, I look at it, it is kind of the Marco solution, largely what I was playing around with, where like, you you don't have to worry, like you can you can do like a, a minor replay of, not replay, like you're not hydrating it, you can just create it with the right value on the fly as you go. And then suddenly, all the need for the serialization boundaries, like you don't need the dependencies all the way down because you just need to know that when this thing change changes, like as long as it can wake up along those lines, like it can do it. It's only the intersection uh, where you have the problem. Right. So, yeah. Yeah. The, the intersections are interesting and, and that kind of gets into the serialization as well, because at an intersection, you have to serialize if you, if you want to truly resume you have to serialize you know both these values if they're both reactive right uh, because if one changes you need to be able to work with the value that came you know from right. the server on the other for right. the other one and, and vice versa which is cool because this optimization that we're talking about marco means that you actually reduce the serialization along the reactive graph which is even better arguably because it means less of the values actually need to be serializable and which is kind of Cool. I, I just don't know if it's going to be um, 
I, without knowing about where the serialization boundaries are, like what happens if someone just writes code a certain way and it's a value can't be serialized? Like, what, well, so yeah, yeah, um, that that is something that we have been um, looking at. Um, we we have an approach that we're we're going with, um, but it's not perfect. Um, uh, but yeah, the so. You asked about, you know, the dollar signs and everything, right? And right. I think it's it's pretty fair to say that, like, okay, if you're going to access this value, you know, inside an effect or inside an event handler, like, it has to be serializable, right? Yeah. Because we're saying that's going to, you know, those things are going to run on the client that, and, you know, the stuff may not have run. But if you've just got two values that, like, happen to intersect because you use them in the same expression, like... Enforcing that to be serializable doesn't feel as great because, like, you know, you I, I, that's not something you want to think about. Yeah. Um, and so we've been it. We we have a way to to serialize the unserializable. Um. That sounds great. And uh, I mean, it, it's it's pretty simple, right? You just like, you replay it. Right. You replay. Yes. It was, that was like the, the that was the, it basically when I did that, that, that document about resumability a couple months ago, I was at the extreme. Like, what if you did something that acted like resumability, but re replayed everything? This is like, what if you could, m you know, mem memorize most things you need to, but replay the, like, how would you know? Yeah. Um, so, so what we're doing is we're doing some compiler analysis, which isn't perfect. Um, but we, um, and we're making a few assumptions about that. You're not like mutating global variables. So there's certain like global functions that we're marking as like safe, um, functions essentially. Um, so like if, I don't know what's uh, an example, uh, but like, math dot round, let's say math dot round, right? Yeah. Like that's going to put out something that's serializable. Yeah. Right. Um, anytime that you have a binary expression, right? Every binary expression in JavaScript is going to resolve to something that's uh, serializable. Okay. Um, and so we're, we're able to, to know some of these things. Okay. These are definitely serializable. Um, but we, we also can, and we don't do a whole lot of analysis outside of your JavaScript, um, or not JavaScript, your Marco file into your JavaScript files. Right. So when you import something and like call a function, like we have no idea what that is. Right. Um, and so we have to treat that as like, well, Maybe this isn't serializable. Um, now, it, so so then it depends on where that's used, right? Like, is this used in an intersection? If it's if it's not used upstream of an intersection, then like it doesn't matter because it's never going to try to be serialized. But maybe it is used upstream of an intersection, or maybe it's passed to like a dynamic tag where we're like, who knows? You know, this, this could end up needing to get serialized inside that dynamic tag that we're, we're passing it to. Um, so what we can do is we can wrap that value, um, basically put it into a lookup to say, like, this is how you can replay it. And so when it hits the serializer, if it can serialize it, you know, as you know, using the, the normal means, then it does that and it doesn't go down that path. But if it can't, then it will um, basically inline code to to replay that value at the the time that it's being deserialized. Sounds no, that's smart. That that that's something that uh, you can so it's, leverage, it's like a, a compiler runtime kind of handoff um, mechanism. Yeah, and um, it's something you can do with the knowledge you have from the Marco cross. Yeah, it, I mean, it's not it's not perfect. There's there's trade offs um, with it, but it means that you don't need to think about what can be serialized and what can't. Um, 
be serialized. And, and, and most of the trade-offs are around performance in a way that I think is not going to matter um, in, in real world situations. So um, I'm not too unhappy about it, but we, we had considered going down the path of like quick, quick has that um, the, the dollar sign function. Yeah. Um, we pass something to it and it causes that to be split out into a bundle. It gives you a, a queue URL. And so it's essentially replaying too, because it's like, you know, here, load this code. Um, right. And so it, it's a, a very similar approach to that. Um, but we've, we're just doing it automatically. And I, I the, the big thing really was those intersections. Um, because it, if it was just this is used in a, an event handler or in an effect, like, I think that would have been perfectly reasonable to reason about, like, you know, we need things to be serializable across this boundary. But um, yeah, if, if if the value that you're passing to a child component intersects with something and like now that needs to be serializable and like maybe the child component is a third party component and it changes like its internal implementation to introduce an intersection, like now that's a breaking change, like that's terrible. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, th this is this is this is a hard problem problem because you're you're trying to solve this at such a granular level, and I don't even know if we've like on the server component side of things have solved this at a coarser grain level. Uh, the the thing about server components though is like that boundary is very clear. You once it becomes fine grained, it's much and like okay, people are still struggling with it. I understand yeah. that. I, I totally get that. But it is a much clearer boundary than like we serialize the stuff that we need to, and we have uh, heuristics to to figure out exactly what needs to be serialized. Like, you know, I, I don't know. It's just, yeah, yeah, no, it, it's... <laughs> yeah. I, I, I'm going to talk about this a little bit uh, this week in JavaScript because. I've been I've been struggling. Ryan Florence had a tweet, and I, it's going to be a continuation of of that. But yeah, it, I it seems mu like all we talk about these days is serialization. Um, like it's it's definitely. I didn't get to catch your full stream on it. I, I know you had a stream that like the the thumbnail was just like serialization. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I was yeah. I want to catch up on that. I, I think it. It was tangentially related to, to what I'm talking about, right? Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I've I'm, I'm, I've been mostly focused as you. Uh, uh, that one was more about, uh, and I got to thank Dylan for some help here. He's been giving Alexis some tips. Solid 1.8 release. We actually built uh, our first like we, instead of just having serializer as like a thing that we feed to it became the the core mechanism behind our streaming mechanism a thing so the serializer actually is the thing running the stream now and he, we built the deduping cross flush serializer okay. yeah yeah so it's it, it might not be as optimal as some of the stuff we're thinking about um but yeah like, that's an interesting piece too like you already flushed this thing out to the client but oh i referenced it again like yeah yeah. So we built a very d dumb version where we're just allocating an array of references in the client while in the serialization code, but it does the trick. And uh, uh, yeah, it, it, uh, Dylan was a big influence help. Uh, Alexis kept on, uh, you know, tapping his shoulder a few times to kind of get some ideas on stuff. He's pretty happy we landed um, because the, the core base performance of the serializer didn't degrade very much. It's still. Um, falling, you know, slightly slower than uh, warp 10 or whatever. Uh, yeah. But, but, you know, still in a pretty decent place. Yeah, uh, I'm a little bit sad because Dylan started on a library that we were calling Valav. Yeah, which is like, you know, value forward and backwards. Um, yeah. <laughs> but um, we, we ended up needing to make some optimizations that were Marco six specific. And so we pulled it in, but that would have been, I think a, a good library that, you know, like warp 10 could be, you know, shared right. um, uh, across. To be yeah. fair, uh, um, Alexis's work for, for Cereval, the, the underlying yeah. serializer for solid Cereval, is not yeah. solved, but it's not solid specific. And he just added a plugin API this week to support. Yeah, I saw that. So, Maybe that can carry the torch of that idea somewhat. So, 
Yeah, um, th that was one of the things that we were uh, we considered something like the the plugins. Um, I know Meteor had a plugin uh, API for their serializer that was um, you know interesting. EJSON, I think, is what they they were calling their thing. Um, but with with all of this, like again, coming back to like the boundaries not always being like super intuitive. Like the, like yeah, you can make it so the the serializer knows how to serialize this like new value, you know, this this class or, or whatever. Um, but like you shouldn't have to. Ideally, you shouldn't have to think about whether or not, you know, this value is being serialized. I, I think is the ideal. Again, there's trade offs involved with like going down that route and we're we're mitigating some of them by adding compiler analysis into the the mix but it's not fully mitigated yeah i i can't yeah I, yeah i'm going to talk about this topic a bit more i, I i've gone full circle here because i started from a position and i was very strong about it last week in my stream where i was like like people need to know that client server divide. They need to understand what gets serialized because then they can feel comfortable. I think it's still important to, to understand that it is there. But the problem is, as you mentioned, the downstream change, breaking, adding intersect, you act, this is actually an impossible task for a, like from an API level for a human to actually be able to, to see it unless you literally like if the problem is it's one of those situations if you tell everything can be serialized well then everything like sure then everything has to be serializable but like you're not like like you're not winning anything there either like it's 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 essentially um th there's i don't think there's like a great solu solution from an api level like obviously compiler can do smart stuff but like you can just never completely trust that's why you know say guarding secrets from the yeah source makes sense and obviously we're doing that additionally anyways, because you can't be sure that everything works properly, but it like, or as you expect, but, um, you know, because people do weird stuff, but more so than that, it's that like, there, there is just, there, there can't be, I think fundamentally that, uh, like you just can't know, like the, the locality of thinking is going to get compromised because yeah. someone downstream can change that decision for you. As soon as you pass control, it's not like, um, that's one of the things. And I think react has added this like taint API, right. Um, yeah. that like, if this object ever tries to be serialized, like don't let that happen. Right. Um, and, uh, uh, and yeah. I think something like that's going to be necessary, um, for, for us, because it's replaying values too. It's like code that you didn't intend to go to the browser could go to the browser. You know, if if some unserializable value generated by that code intersects with state, then it, you know, might need to, to be played in order to faithfully represent your app. And then you've That's got what, the browser that you don't want there. That's why we use compiler macros. We have secret dollar sign in bling. Um, right, which is like, well, I, I looked at that actually, like the secret and the, the <laughs> server. Um, I'm wondering, and I actually Ryan Turnkist. Uh, I didn't watch exactly every part of the the stream last week with Dominic, but he he had mentioned that, um, and, and and this is something we were thinking too, like using import assertions to say like this this import should like never end up in the browser. Right. And so if it if it tried to replay something that required code from that import, we would just be like, OK, no, you know, that's that's going to break. Um, right. Yeah. That, that's, is that something I'm still not totally happy with? I'm not sure if there's going to be like a, a better um, solution or not. Um, yeah. So we're still kind of thinking about a little bit, but I think we have a plan that we're moving forward with if, if nothing better comes up. Yeah, I, what I was actually just playing with just now was uh, Jay Larky shared the uh, the um, conversation that we missed last week talking about this is the taint yeah. unique yeah. reference API, but this is mostly, a, I guess, a runtime reference. But yes, I think, see, I said, like, 
it solves the secret this issue. Is, but I this is very limited, though, because it, it's tied to a specific object. And, and this is one of the challenges, too, right? Like, because if you clone that object or you, like, grab something off of it, it's no longer tainted, right? It, it's just tainting that object reference. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, well, it's right there in the name, Taint Object Reference. Um. <laughs> yeah, I'll throw this in, in, in here. Yeah, this is an interesting one because actually, I, 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 this tells you how quickly I changed my opinion because here I was like, yeah, this solves, you know, this works for the secret, but I, like, I think there's more about serialization boundaries. On further thought, I'm, I'm, I'm more okay with these types type or category of solutions being the ones that we use because I, I don't think we can actually guarantee um yeah so secret does it just not allow that value to like like if i put a string in in secret it's not going to allow that value to be serialized is that the yeah I, I i i think it goes further than that i think it like on the uh, yeah, I mean, I think maybe what, what about values derived from that value? Yeah, do you know what? I I I, I don't know if secret does exactly what we, like the it, it, it's not gonna yeah it's not because I we didn't have closure extraction and stuff. Basically, secret I think it did something really simple where it actually just straight out like it was more guarding the other side where it it literally just undefined things like it just like. Like it's still there on the server, but yeah, uh, I don't think it actually, now that I think about it, I don't think secret does what it I was saying. It doesn't like throw an error or anything. You just get undefined for the value. Like, yeah, I, th I believe so. I think, I think we need secret plus taint to actually cover the whole thing. You need a compile side solution to, 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 to handle like it accidentally getting into, like, I think it was, we were combating the friction of it getting into client builds. And in the client, it's gone. It doesn't there. Right. But it doesn't actually pre prevent uh, it being sent across serialization boundary now that I'm thinking about okay. it. You, yeah, you, yeah, need yeah, both, yeah. you need both okay, sides. That, yeah. For, yeah. And what I was talking about with like the, the imports is actually more about the, the code getting into the bundle and less about like the yeah, yeah. So you, you kind of got like do both sides uh, of, of it. But th um, there's also the challenge of like, should this be like, if, if I taint this object, is it just the object that I'm tainting or is it like, yeah, e everything that's derived from that object, right? Like I say the user can't be set, but then I grab the password off and like that gets serialized, right? Like the, the react taint reference isn't going to handle that. And it, in fact, it can't even taint a string, right? It can only taint an object reference. Um, and, and think about it from an implementation standpoint, if you're going to taint the string, that means every string you serialize, you need now need to go, like go compare against a list of tainted strings, right? Like tainting objects is, is relatively cheap from a performance standpoint. Yeah. Primitives is like, uh, a whole different, like. The funny thing, the thing is the string is probably the most common thing you want to hide. Um, right. So. so it's it's tricky, whereas with um, I, I yeah with, with the approach that we're taking with Marco, I, I think we could relatively easily taint a string, but it's then like a, a question: Are we just tainting that string? Like if I pass that string somewhere, like maybe I pass it to I mean. I'm going to a scenario now where it's like bad, but I, I pass that secret to a fetch call. Like you don't want that fetch call to be tainted. Like pro presumably the data that came back from that fetch call, you want to be something that can be yep. serialized. But there's other cases where, um, you know, maybe you derive something from it and it still contains data that like shouldn't go to the browser, you know? So it, it's like a question of how specific with those values yeah. are you and 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 again if you're doing compiler tainting then you know you, you need to understand the the flow so you know like we could taint this string such that if you try to serialize like this string like that's going to be a problem but if you pass it to an identity function that like just passes back the string well now like you know we've lost the taint on it so yeah yeah so 
tr tricky stuff still. Um, I, I don't know. I don't know exactly what we're going to do there, but it's important. And that's one of the things that we we still need to figure out. So. Yeah. Anyway, Michael, I think I'm going to let you go here so I can yeah. finish up our, our stream on... I got a couple other topics and the, this week in JavaScript, tonight, aren't you? No, I I don't know <laughs> if I have that much for this week in JavaScript, so it's good. But okay. yeah, we we definitely kept the conversation going for for quite a while. So I, it was great having you on. This is what I wanted. I wanted to just pick your brain about like random subjects, not even random stuff we're working on, um, to add a little bit of additional insight into these problems and problem spaces because I think it's valuable for people to get some perspective that way. Um, anything you want to shout out before I let you go? Anything additional? We talked all about Marco stuff, but I don't know. Um, something I'd like to see uh, really delved into if you're taking suggestions for future streams uh, is uh, the new visual copilot from, from Builder.io. Okay. Um, yeah, it, it's probably a, a very different thing than, uh, you know, you delved into, but um i i'm i'm very interested in like what's happening on the the ai front um and and how that intersects with um web dev um skeptical of a lot of the solutions that exist uh right now but i also do see a lot of potential uh there um so be cool to to hear more about that if, if one of the builder guys are, are willing to come on yeah yeah, that's that's a possibility. Um, uh, yeah, I haven't seen that yet, so I think that's pretty cool. Um, anyway, yeah, thank you for joining us today, Michael. Um, I, uh, you have a good one, and until next time, I hope to hear good news about Marco Six. Yeah, <laughs> I mean right. soon. <laughs> yeah. See ya. See ya. Uh, Yeah. All right. So a couple things I want to cover, including this week in JavaScript, but it was, uh, we actually got into the serialization conversation a little bit further than I, th than I, uh, thought, thought we would be, uh, initially. Um, but yeah. Uh, so a question came on here. What was the use of data derived from taints making no sense medical records? Yeah. I'm, I'm I'm not sure. This is one of those things where it's 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 tricky because like obviously there's like string type stuff like direct secrets and you can understand like why you wouldn't do that. But when it comes to s sensitive data, um, yeah, I, I I mean even applying the taints might be a little bit tricky. Even in that case when you're like if you're pulling it from data like you know, like you're dealing with multiple users with partially tainted data. I think this is, this is, this is still like a, a challenge, um, in general to think about. I, we'll, we'll talk about that in a bit more in a minute. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not sure. I mean, this is the, it's all you know theoretical and so someone does something okay what did i want to talk about i'm trying to think what i want to do in time i do have some stuff for this week in javascript it's not the biggest um i do want to continue my t my t talk about serialization locality of thinking it very ties into that conversation um but i i will actually want to say that for this week in javascript because um there's a relevant thing to that did we settle? <laughs> no. Um, I mean, we, there's a few places where we got corrected that Marco wasn't absolutely first, but. Anyway, um, yeah, something I wanted to talk about was, um, so I've been working on Solid Start Beta 2, and um, people are obviously, you know, I, I gave that beat talk. It's now out there in the wild as a separate talk you can go check out and you know it's been a couple of weeks and people are like okay so what when when is beta 2 coming out um what's going on you know how can i help and the truth of the matter is while the 
you know, in, there's this rebase um, and I want to solve client component stuff. We've kind of solved that and we've even built up a middleware system. I don't know if it's going to be like we're completely happy with it, but like we, we have a lot of the pieces in place. But one of the big parts of beta two is actually pushing the code that would belong in third party libraries back into third party libraries. And that means a lot of the data APIs around routing actually belong back in the router. And because I'm also trying to accommodate a future where we have stuff like server components, I th I've been playing around with these data APIs and we've been talking about them here and there on stream. But my, my problem is we don't wait for solid 2.0 for this. Solid start beta is more immediate than, um, uh, than 2.0. Uh, Milo's back at uh, university, and he's also been working a lot on the, the you know, around the signals uh, TC39 proposal. So we haven't really pushed the state of the art there very much. I haven't been able to focus on it because I've been working on like solid 1.8, which is a lot of the fundamental pieces I need for both future solid start work and current solid start work for the beta. So I'm trying to think, been working on trying to come up with route data fetching API. This sort of continuation of that stream that I did a few weeks ago um, that will work in solid 1.0 timeframe. The, the signals proposal isn't public yet. It, hopefully it will be soon. We're working on implementation, but it's still private repo. Um, Dominic, uh, who we had on last week, was doing a lot. Has been doing a lot of the actual implementation work. Um, but yeah, it, it'll. We, we talked a little bit with Dom about it last week. Um, we'll, we'll talk more about it in the future. But let's. Um, I I I I've kind of like sketched up something that's kind of the beginning of an idea here for how to approach. Um, router API data loading. You guys have probably seen some of this before, but I've been working a lot on actions. I already talked a bit about this cache function into create async for solid 2.0, but it occurred to me obviously that, and this key here that I'm talking about for could be optional. You could just use the argument by default and the function reference for the cache identity. And we could add other fields to this. But the idea is you could just feed that cache reference into a create resource today. And essentially, this is how like solid query works under the hood already. Like um, most libraries that use um, solid today basically add their cache layer around the fetcher, add you know some other calls around, and they get everything working. And then if we have this cache layer, we can you know have a refresh cache all or key, and you know it's fairly straightforward. The problem with resources today though, is why I'm not sure that I could get to this API. Um, because there's, you want this cache behavior, but you also want to have like the deep diffing store stuff. And the fact that resources have, um, mutation APIs like mutate and refetch and that, um, hydration too, I think there's like an on hydrate thing. Um, I mean, I guess we could use the new serialization APIs in 1.8 to get around the hydration issue, but um, essentially, I, I'm going to look and see if this is feasible in the 1.0 time frame. Um, but this, like, alternatively, I could just wrap this behavior that I'm talking about inside create loader and just come up with basically something that looks like uh, create uh, resource but without the mutation APIs and it builds the cache in. And this is basically what create route data is um, in solid start. Um, but essentially just um, it, it's these pieces put together. So this is kind of where I've, I've been looking at because I'm, I'm adding this to the router because the router needs to be aware of the cache so it can do the invalidation on mutation and, and navigation. So I, I believe this is where it belongs. It's not in the core solid library, but rather something specific for the router. Of course, you can choose not to use the router's cache mechanism, but then you could use, um, you know, solid query or whatever. I think for 1.0 time period, I'm probably not going to be looking at preload, but you know, continue to use um, route data, which means that this might not 
be as beneficial. Um, but this is this is just kind of like a uh, proposal because ultimately what I'd like to do is implement this and then create resources that can get replaced with the new async primitive when it's ready. Because th that way, caching here is mostly about um, deduping ultimately. I'm trying to get to a place where I can s standardize on, uh, let's get to the, get to the final proposal because, uh, or let, let, let's get a little bit further in here because um, I, I, ideally what I'm thinking is we get to a point where we get rid of the route data, uh, like data loader on the router and go to a place where there might be a preload stage where you can just call these cache functions with the route data directly and then you know use our async stuff in the components. Um, a big part about this is stuff like cache are designed to be at the def definition site of the async operation as wrappers, not in your component code. Um, so kind of separating this out so that in your component code, you know, you can, you can just use these functions as is. Um, the reason we still have these wrappers generally though, even like if it's a create memo or something is that the challenge for a lot of this stuff is that when you read reactive props, we do need a wrapper at the call site, not at the define site. Like ID needs to be tracked. It's not being tracked here. It's being tracked here. So, um, it's not quite as clean in a reactive environment, um, but uh, it still like serves the purpose, so to speak. So as I said, this is very current solid. It's basically create route um, data. Um, so I'm not particularly like this, this fits in and gives us a clear path here. Um, for, you know, the initial release. Um, I am going to investigate this though. But what I've actually been working a lot on is actions. Um, because the cache is um, generally in memory. It's not for a cross request things, at least. I mean, I could see a way of like s configuring the cache at the router level, probably. Um, so that it, when it is used inside the component, then it can read from async local context and then it like find the right cache location. This is, th this cache is as much, um, a consideration for deduping on the client as it is on the server. One thing you have to understand here is I'm trying to design an isomorphic system that works without server components or with server components. It's c kind of. It's weird to me that like we tr come up with all these di different rules. So yes, by default, this is pr uh, the lifetime of the of the request on the server, and the lifetime of the it's t could be tied into the uh, deduping of the app on the client. I, details on the cache life on the client is a little bit working through, but just kind of mostly seeing if mechanically this API is possible to achieve. As I said, for now we could just use create loader and it maybe, you know, makes more sense. But the, I, the reason I'm considering this is I'm, I'm looking at how this could interact in the future with stuff like server components. And one of the things that I was thinking about again is what if we could define an action basically anywhere, right? And then this action be the thing that you pass to the component or the button in this case, form action, my action. And you could use a native element, not a, not a component like a capital F form. You could do lowercase form and this could all work. And, um, yeah, I, I think, I think there's potential here. Um, oh, Hey, just got a raid. Um, what do we got? Pur purple. Did I get the right purple elf? Um, thank you for the raid. Um, I'm just talking about potential future, uh, data fetching APIs for solid router, which would then show up in solid start.
So um, just kind of, I, I'm getting into the, this action API. The, the benefit of having an action API, and I have a demo of this showing it working in a minute, is that y your base components are actually native components instead of like, or native elements of components. So like the, the, they can be used in server components or in client components the same, like it's not a consideration. So like I was playing around today and I realized that I could make an object with a two string and like the attribute would actually get serialized to the, to the, so like in a Node.js situation, it could still work. Um, if this function here was a server function, because server functions have a URL. So if we could forward the URL from a server function through an action, then the proper URL would get put in the form, which means it would still, the action would still work even with no JavaScript enabled. But what's also interesting about this API is if you do have the client side router, but this is not an area that gets hydrated, this also still works because um, even with non-server functions, I know this is kind of a weird situation because if we can come up with a hash, a unique ID lookup on the string of the action, we can use event delegation at the top level of the document, the same way we did with anchor tags to actually find the right action and then run it client side. So something that we can do with this is actually, I, I realized I could take the function that you pass into it and take the string of it and hash it and use that as the identifier on the component and use that as the lookup. So we'd be able, we'd be able to uh, essentially um, have an API where we have an actual object that has properties and things on it as an action and then have it work directly as an attribute in both server component, Node.js and full client side um, things. And w w what this lets us do is, yeah, as I said, define an action anywhere, again, like cache at the, at the de definition side, and then in your components, use it directly in forms or form buttons, or with use action, you get a submit function that you can just call it directly um, with with the arguments. Actually, I don't know if this is spread. I think the, the, this might be limited to single argument um, the, with the API we're looking at. And what an action is, as I said, is it's just this thing that feeds into use action, feeds into the forms, or feeds into use submission and use submissions, which are data to tell us about the uh, temporal state of the action. And again, it's key to action. So you can you if you define the action in a file, and then in component A, submit the action, component B can do the optimistic updates um, without having to like pass props around or whatever. You can have disconnected pieces of the UI handle the optimistic updates. And it, because we're using this object, everything works properly with TypeScript. So like every, like all the actions are, and everything are properly typed. Um, so um, yeah, it, it's kind of an, how do I select URL? Well, what I'm getting at is the URL, if, if it's a client only action, it's just going to run whatever's in here. It could be a post, it could be whatever, right? So like there is no URL, like the, the, we're just going to intercept the, the, the event, take the identity, which is basically our pseudo URL, do the lookup and then, um, just perform whatever is in your action function. There's nothing in this one, but it could be just like post to some API or whatever. If it's a server function, server functions, uh, we innately put URLs on the server function. So as long as the action knows to look for functions that have dot URL, like and uses that, it can take that URL and that URL will be the thing that gets encoded into here. So we actually, um, the method could be set on the form. Um, what if I, well, this is this is an interesting question on the delegation. We were already, I guess, in this zone when we had anchor tags because we moved to capital A, but we used to have, for a while there, we had lowercase a that delegated all the anchors. And I am am suggesting a move back to lowercase form and lowercase a. One of the biggest pains of these things is having to import links and forms all over the place. Um, and there is, yeah, I, I think the base URL could be used as a way of, of, uh, of 
separating them. But if you have two different routers within the same zone, it's a problem. I just haven't come across a use case why you'd want to do that. Um, because you can nest route definitions. Why do you need separate routers? You just need separate routes. But if there's a use case, I'm interested. But yeah, a lot of this hinges on basically the expectation of like being able to delegate. Like we talked about uh, when we added it to solid, the anchor delegation, which is, as I said, still there today um, under the hood is like setting an element for the router, which it delegates up to instead of the document. But then you have, um, you know, portals and other interesting things to consider with. But so like, Technically, I think it's solvable if we can find a way to assign an element for, for the router, perhaps. But I'm hoping that this that scenario just isn't a thing that we have to worry about. Um, what, but yeah, what I'm getting to here, what I'm trying to show here is that there's a symmetry, right? Because you could have like a get to do's, which is caches, you know, fetch to do's. And then you have add to do's, which is an action that has this like post to do, you know, you know, action. And then essentially, um, like this happens at definition side and then you can go on and then use it in your app. Like here's an example where I, I'm using s server components. So like I'm just using React use server syntax here. If you go cache async use server, fetch from the database, action use server, you know, do some mutation. I, I would expect you, you could just could define this in one file and then in todos.jsx, you could import those methods and use them in your component, like maybe as, uh, in a form or as part of a resource. And what I'm trying to say what's cool here is todos JSX here doesn't necessarily have to be a server component, a client component. Like it could work in an app that was just all CSR only doesn't even do SSR. It could work in an SSR app. It could app, work in an app that does server component type situation with, with uh, partial hydration. The API on this side can stay the same. And then because we define, you know, these as, you know, server um, fetchers and, ac and actions, it works in all the models. This is basically the, the sort of thinking behind this. Um, like it doesn't actually matter what kind of component consumes it. I'm missing. Oh, you're right. I am missing an equal sign in my, in my, maybe that's why I didn't syntax highlight like properly. I always wonder because there's JSX here, but there's no, if I put TS to the, it seems weird. It highlights differently in this. I'm just going to go back to JSX. It seems to highlight in a happier form, but not perfect. Anyways, um, this is, this is just the, the rough idea. Um, as I said, I feel the the action API is more, um, doable than, than the fetch or loader side today. I made a, a code sandbox where I was playing around with this example. Uh, it's a, it's a to do's app with suspense and transitions and data loading. It doesn't do the form thing. I'm just using submit directly uh, using use action here. In fact, for this simple implementation that I just put together here, use action, um, is actually just returns it straight through. The reason for that is that, um, the reason we need use is we need to get the router context. So if you build something top level, like here where you just define actions, then it's, um, it's difficult to like get the router context. So I, I, this is why I need this use. I was really debating on if I could like just remove this whole line and just use the action directly, like call as a function, but because it needs to handle navigation, there does need to be a use in the middle. But yeah, fake API is just like some create delay timer, fake fetch with the, our database is an array essentially here that I'm just playing with that I update. Data is a very simple, uh, let me shrink this down. It's just a very uh, simplistic 
uh, loader thing, which is basically just wraps create resource. And then I, I took an action with a global submission. Again, this would be tied to the router, but just kind of showing that how um, these APIs could work. And then in the application, what I've done here is I, yeah, I basically imported some stuff from the fake API. These pieces could go together, imported some of the, these like use action, use submissions thing. And then I wrapped um, the, the stuff from the database in action. And then what, which is this could all be defined in a separate file. But the idea is that the process is we create a loader for our to do's and then we have our submit um, to do, which is add to do. I just call it submit to do. And then we use submission, use that same thing to get the list of to do's that are in flight. And then while they're in flight, we're going to show a dot, dot, dot here on this example. Um, and then we call our submit to do when we add the new to do here. And then again, yeah, I don't know why they're being weird to me here. Like they can tell that this is a partial, like the types are working. I've had code sandbox giving me really weird syntax highlighting, but anyways, we have, a, for each row, I put in a update and remove action. And then I, again, use, instead of using the plural, I'm using use singular submission. And again, I'm passing the action and then I'm using a filter saying, I only want the submission that matches this particular ID. Um, for both of these, like you get the arguments that you pass to the submit function back through to, to use as a filter here. And then basically show when I'm not removing it. So while it's pending, we actually optimistically remove a row in this to-do list. And then again, we disable stuff while it's updating using updating to do pending. And then for each of the pending to-dos that are going to get added, we, we show a row and then I've added that when there's an error, we actually can use a retry method. So we can actually uh, call retry, which is something we build into our actions. Each action has the option of having a retry. And then uh, that's basically the code um, for the example. And then in practice, it means that we can, you know, add something here and you can see like, while it's in flight, this one, I, I put in the API that one out of three times it errors just to kind of show you what's going on. Um, we optimistically remove immediately. Um, but let's go let's do that again. See it kind of load in, it errored again. I can retry until it succeeds. I can add different stuff, multi in flight. Um, That was interesting. I wonder if I type the same word and it's using the string as the key. Um, I should double check that. But the basic gist of this is, uh, failed again, is that we can handle these form error states and we can, you know, like it's very much like the, the remix style solution look. But as I said, by having the actions globally like this, you have the ability to, um, basically import them in any file and use them anywhere and also see the current status to show optimistic UIs anywhere. Um, anyways, it's just something that I've been working on um, because if we nail this piece and get a good data fetching thing back in the router, that's pretty much that and the, the proper uh, server component, um, not server component, sorry, the proper uh, server function representation, like getting the inline stuff working again. Right now we can only do it module level um, in Vinci. Once we get it like working per, we have everything we need for solid beta too. Um, th these are the last things kind of hanging me up right now. Um, I don't know if anyone has any thoughts on this. I, I, I think this is very powerful, but I feel like people who haven't used Remix might not appreciate how powerful th like this ability pattern of um is like this so it's hard to say i mean obviously i'm showing a non-form example so this this work would all have to be done with client components but you could picture a world where you know you could put this action directly into the form and it work you know as I said in node.js situations or partially hydrated situations all right Nothing. Everyone's silent. 
All good. All good. Yeah, I, I, yeah. I mean, the thing is, there's a question about what URLs are safe. You, you, basically, the only way this breaks is if someone is in a situation where they try to post to a form that doesn't, like, basically, that doesn't when there's no client side JavaScript and it's not a server function, like. That's the only time the actual URL ever gets used, right? Like it's it's only if the client doesn't intercept it and the function was never intended as a server function. Because if it's a server function, it'll always be the real URL and it'll be server rendered with the real URL. But if, if it's got a fake URL, like a placeholder because it's only a client side action, then if there's no JavaScript, it'll break. It's that's basically the, the, the gotcha. Yeah, I mean, this is all about getting to, there's no context in server components on the server. Uh, like there's just, so essentially you need a solution to avoid prop drilling. And the thing that a lot of solutions have come down to is the fact, or not a lot of, but like React came to is that you just have to fetch uniquely in each case place. So you actually need a cache mechanism to ensure that when, you know, you have nested routes and, you know, these different sections that you don't double fetch. Um, I explained this in my data fetching um, stream a few weeks back. Um, yeah, I mean, the biggest problem is they're blocking. If you, if you look at this API, um, that I that I'm proposing here, especially on the on the this side, there's no uh, where is it now here. There's no async components. I'm really, really. I mean, trying to get away from it. I I, I did propose at one point like instead of having a create async here, which is kind of what I'm keeping in this this version, that we could just literally use the cache API to get back fetch user and just call it top level in your component. And honestly, that could work. Um, I, I know how we could write that, but the problem is if the props to fetch user were reactive, you'd have to wrap it anyways. And at that point, um, it's kind of clunkier and it's, it almost guides people to the wrong pattern where this is kind of like saying like, look, you still need to wrap it in an async, you know, primitive. So, yeah, but good. I, I'm Yeah, largely. An async component makes no sense. I've never liked async. Because um, create loader, or create resource, we already have that. But yes, this is largely so that the model on both sides is the same. And if you look at it, the, the, the sneaky, cheeky bit of it is, I understand React is not putting use server in their stuff that they use in server functions. But I'm, I'm kind of in a place where I think if you actually let server functions get defined inside client bundles, essentially, like, don't worry, because they're here, they won't actually end up in the bundle. But if you can take a CSR app, essentially, and just have a server function in it, like this, then like, the same patterns apply, as long as you mark the places that you address, you like hit the database, or whatever, with you server, and you're like, yeah, like, this is on the server, it doesn't matter which side you call it from. Yeah, I mean, I'm not sure. I, I, I honestly hadn't looked at the next solution. I was like sitting there on Discord today and I like, I was on the next channel, which is not Next.js, but like the next ideas channel for Solid. And I was just like thinking out loud and I was like, wait, JavaScript is such a weird language. This works, what I'm, what I'm showing on screen right here. This, this actually works in JavaScript. Um, let me see if I can blow it up a little bit. I can create a form. I can call, call make a function, say console log high. I can go action to string on it to say like 
put a URL on it, like as a thing, like define a function on it. And then I can set that action as action using set attribute. And if I ask the attribute what the action is, it will tell me hello. Um, this is only half the problem, obviously, but I, then I realized that like, I could just, I, I could just hash up the function passed to action, like as a string. And again, you don't have to worry about server functions because they'll never use that string because they, they'll have their own URL um, that I could come up with a unique enough identifier that was that worked on both sides isomorphically because it would be the same code. And, um, ooh, ooh, would it be the same code if people put is server inside of it? Like if tree shaking caused code to disappear out of it, Probably not, but that seems like an edge case. But, um, oh, that's interesting. But yeah, I was trying to find a way to get a unique identity without using our ID gen for the resources, like something that I could do globally. And then I could use that hash to do the lookup. Yeah, anyway. Yes, yes, this is the main thing. We want to avoid double dipping. And this is very easy. When you don't have context to pass stuff through, like it doesn't take much to look at, a, maybe not this, let me open a new Twitter page, to like look at like a page like, um, where's my profile? Look here and like pretend that this is a different route section. Like pretend that you could just render this route section without rendering this like when you switch between these, I am not sure I, these guys might actually render the whole thing, but if you, if you could avoid rendering this thing, like you need the user information for this, but you also need it down here. So when you're just rendering that little piece down here, like you could write it in such a way that both of these fetch for the same thing and that will cause the dedupe. I, I can see how this can get out of hand, but because we're talking about direct function references, the dedupe, should should work like it's not like people are doing a slightly different api call or whatever um yeah yeah like a bling thing yeah no no you need to hoist or preload um waterfall problem doesn't actions don't don't have the water problem waterfall problem it's only on it's on the get side generally speaking it's like when you're pulling out the data in the view you have the waterfall problem and the the cache api can't completely prevent it um it, but the beauty of it is because it's available globally like this is top level you could go to a top level place like a preload function in your router you know, at each route section and just call the function with the route parameters directly. You could just go back in here and be like, okay, um, I'm just gonna call fetch user in my preload function with the route ID. And then yeah, I'll end up making a resource with it down here as well. But you, you can solve the waterfall problem by having it at least fetch once higher in the tree. Yeah. I, I didn't realize that attributes called to string on a fail, which is sweet. I mean, I should have realized it's if you ever used react and seen like object object, especially with web components, like that's, what's doing it. Cause file path plus var name for hashes instead. Yeah. I mean, if I can get it at runtime, I'm, I'm, I'm okay, but it has to be the same for the server and client build. And I don't know if I can, guarantee that because it's like it's it's a runtime thing not a compiler trick i'm trying to do here isr um uh, i'm not sure i don't know i i i'm really optimistic about the, these new cache header approaches that you see on Vercel and Netlify. I, this is mostly I'm thinking lifetime of the request kind of scenarios. I I'm it's mechanical there. I'm not thinking about invalidation though, to be fair, 
so, so I, I got into that conversation about invalidation with someone uh, on the, from Netlify yesterday because we were talking about what if we could use proxies to know exactly what the data dependencies are. On the, we have a, a service on Netlify called Netlify Connect, which is like a big GraphQL like amalgamation thing. So we're like, what if we knew, like on the GraphQL side for Connect, we know exactly whenever any data updates. Like we just know like what piece, what part of the graph updates. And they're like, but we don't know, what, they don't know what pages to re-render. But what if they could use a proxy at re render time, kind of like how Sol stores work, that you know all the data dependencies for any given page so that when Connect gets realizes that part of the database updates, it could, it could basically figure out the pages that use that data and invalidate to specifically those pages automatically. So yeah, this is still a zone, definitely. I mean, you could use a compiler for this. I'm just, I was literally nothing I've described here is a compiler trick. Like I was trying to see if I could do this runtime. There's no, there's, these literally have like use server or server dollar sign is a compiler trick, but this, I want this mechanism to go in the router, which has no, does not compile or touch JavaScript. So for, for anything to be viable here, I, I don't want it to depend on um, compiler specific behavior if possible. Signals and HTTP headers. Yeah, maybe that's where we're heading. Signals, signals everywhere. Right, like solid plus HTMX. I mean, people will do it, I suppose. Uh, but yeah, yeah, my hope here is that the base core mechanism can work um, without needing to do any compilation type stuff. But yeah, it's interesting if bundling can change the contents of a function between server and and not. Like it's only the definition that I need to match. But I guess the thing is, can we end up with like different names? I mean, I could trim off. I wonder if we can just take the, what's in the, 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 the curly braces inward. I don't know. It's interesting. If, if there's a way to do this, like the, we, I basically need an approach that doesn't, that's unaware of the bundler or the, I guess, sorry, that's the wrong thing. I should have highlighted this. I need something that's un, unaware of the bundler and unaware of the, uh, com, uh, and doesn't use compilation. I don't know if that's accomplishable, but it was an idea I had. Um, yeah, I mean, I, 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 I see lots of problems with that now that I think about it. Minification. Minification breaks this idea too. Okay. I need to go back to the drawing board on this because, um, yeah, minification breaks it. Like if you don't minify on the server, you'd minify differently. They might choose different variables for the minification, like different, like, because which ones are, you'll find Terser optimizes for gzip. So it looks at what, what other variables are used. Yeah. Okay. No, no dice. Yeah. That's that's what I'm, that's that's the biggest thing because they'll, they'll they'll literally use different variable names. Okay, well if this doesn't work, then uh, for the action side, then I need a, I need a different I need a different idea. Okay, well this is why this is why we talk it out. You guys have been very helpful. The, the cache on the server only exists the lifetime of the request. So no, this, I don't expect this. To, it's not like a long-term cache. It's literally just going to like do a lookup off the request object, essentially is a way to think about it. Um, okay. Yeah. So maybe scratch that, but I, I, I at least want, this is why, this is why I have these conversations so I can, uh, can I see flaws with my thinking? I mean, obviously the, the other way to solve this is capital F form, but there's something really nice 
about being able to use native form and because it'll fit right into like form action on buttons as well. Like this is very attractive if there's a way to solve this. I just don't know how to get a stable ID on both sides for the same function reference without um, using some kind of compiler piece because yeah, we can't tr trust the, because of bundling, we can't trust the file name or like the, yeah. Yeah, maybe it's not doable. Yeah, but I, I, this, I, the, these are not the kind of special cases that I want to do. That then then this doesn't belong in the router. This belongs in solid core, and I don't know if I'm ready for that. Like that's an option, but I'm like, yeah, I don't. I I really try to use the compiler as little as possible. Um, yeah, well, the, the what I was saying with the Twitter thing is, it's okay. I'm not saying that you don't refetch it again. Sorry, to go back to your example. I'm just saying is the problem isn't the subsequent navigations here when I go from here to here. I don't care that I fetch user again. I care that on the initial load, I fetch it here and then I fetch it here. The fact that I fetch it twice there, I want to dedupe that. And what I can do is I say fetch, you know, I can say that the key is, you know, the ID. So fetch user ID here runs once here, sees that it already exists, uses that result. But it, it fetches it here and it fetches it here. When I switch to this tab, it's only rendering this part, sees the fetch of the ID, nothing in the cache, and then it renders it, but it still only fetches it once during the lifecycle of the request. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, People love fetching in the components. I know this is why React went that way. I think it's prone to waterfalls, but I'm trying to test the idea that it's only my responsibility as far as giving people a way to avoid waterfalls. If you don't give them a place to do it, then that's on you. But if you give them a place, hopefully that's enough. It, it, it also is attractive because right now, if you have a route data function, there's a bunch of reactivity stuff you build. So you can't preload the next route because you're building a bunch of reactivity stuff, you know? Whereas in this world, preload would literally just run and could be thrown away. And there's no reactivity associated with the preloading of the cache. So it just, solid router doesn't have uh, preload, you know, where you go over routes today. This would also give us that feature in a, in a nice way, I think. Uh, it's still possible. The, these non-blocking approaches do help a lot for waterfalls because it, the decision happens lower, but it's still possible for someone to do something like in their UI, have something where, let's say you have a user and you have their list of friends, right? It's to load both of those, you just need the user ID. You don't actually need to have the user loaded, you just need to go, get me the user with this ID, get me um, friends of user with this ID. And let's pretend those are two different separate service requests. If it's still possible for someone in their template to go like show if user and then show the list of friends. And in that zone, even if you're mostly non-blocking, um, like so, so, but you don't fetch the friends until you get down to the friends component, you still have an unnecessary waterfall there, right? Because you wrote the code that said, um, it depends on, you know, don't show this thing unless the user's loaded. So like the non-blocking works well for siblings. It works well for even descendants that aren't directly underneath the conditional, but we're still letting the view make the decision for us because like layout wise, you just chose not to show the friends panel until like if, the, if there's no users there. I'm hoping you're right 
uh, Dave, in that because um, of the fine-grained suspense throwing mechanism uh, with along the graph, it will just com- like people won't make those show components. They'll just like instead of guarding, they'll just be like, they'll just you know have the user's information and then they'll have the the friend's information and it'll get to that for loop um, without actually having it. But it, it, the developer would have to not do the show. So don't get me wrong. Yes, you're, you're correct. With this async model, I think the number of unavoidable or uh, avoidable waterfalls would reduce much better than if someone was using like async components. Like I think it, it drastically improves the situation, which is maybe why I'm, I feel more comfortable to be like, okay, there's this preload thing, but maybe you don't need it. Um, and in that world, um, yeah, we're going to tell people to fetch within their components, which is insane, but I think that's where we're going. Right. Yeah. That, it's unavoidable from a UI standpoint, but it's completely avoidable from a data standpoint is what I was trying to get at. So like, I think I, I, I'm excited to see what our new, new patterns, um, unlock here. No, I, there, there is an SSR, but in server component models, there, there isn't. And I, you could try and add this, although I think React just officially canned it. It's just, it's, it's tricky. You can't have client context being read by server components and you can't have server context being read by client components. They can't cross. So it's a lot cleaner to keep a separate implementation. But the big problem is when I was talking about just having this part render on its own is like the possibility of some dis- parent not seeding the thing for you because it never runs. So like that also can break server context um, when you get into these kind of architectures. So I think we're going into a world where uh, the server, like each nested section is almost treated like its own page is the, is, is kind of where I'm getting at. Um, in which case, um, I mean, I could picture people making the mechanism, but it's also maybe just better to think beyond the context API for this server component centric world. I started down and async components are only supposed to be used directly by the router for the most part, but the router can fetch many levels in parallel hard display. Well, the router can do the separation I'm talking about where they can route, they can, they can render this section and this section independently. But the, the, the thing with async, and I mean, I think you can see this if I just like play around for a second is like, screw this. Okay. If you have function, if we have async function, a, okay. And we await uh, B, okay. What the caller of A sees, um, like if someone just calls A out here, first of all, if they don't await it or do something there, it's just going to continue on anyways. Like it's like, you're not going to like next line, next line, next line. It goes and then finally this goes and completes. But what I'm getting at is the consumer of A here, like um, V equals, like let's say they await it. Like they don't get to do anything until like B, and let's say B looks a lot like C, like let's see B, sorry, looks a lot like A. like they don't get to do anything until like C is done here. Like I think what the the router can do is go, okay, screw this. We're going to do a, then do some stuff. And in things that are, are like unrelated, let's say route sections, you know, we're going to a, we're going to have like an a two and we're going to have an a three, like great. It's parallelized, but there's nothing you can do. I think about 
the this chain, like the di- like the the down the tree chain, like siblings. Like siblings could escape it because the topmost async component is this. Like you could actually have not even separate route sections, but you could be in a component that's not async and then have three async components in it. And then like these could be parallelized. But once you're in it, you know, like you're in it. Um, whereas an, an, it's, it's kind of like like fine grain reactivity and signals in an alternate model where you're not awaiting and blocking like this, like you can go much further. You, the code doesn't stop here, right? Cause if you have a wait, let's, let's await D here or something like it doesn't, it doesn't stop here. You like, it's quite possible that, uh, like, I say I wanted to do a wait DNA. It, it, it's more like we do this. Uh, how should I put it? It's more like we do this. Um, like within the component itself, it's not the boundary. Like you could render, like we're just able to break it down more granularly by not waiting at the whole function level. I, I'm basically suggesting never awaiting <laughs> almost is the way to do it, but instead throwing along this trail of functions, like B, if, if C isn't ready, Yeah, I, I mean, it's hard for me to show this directly. But it, it's like, if C isn't ready, when this part of B accesses it, like, yeah, I don't know. It, we can follow the specific threads and not have the whole thing stop, then go, then stop, like like this. It, it's I don't know, it's interesting to me. Like the, the async await is blocking by definition. Yeah, I just don't know how he's ever going to prevent that, especially when you in import your server function from a third party library that you use further down in your UI. So like you fetch your data at the top level server function for your page, and then you have a clerk widget on it further down that has something, I'm sorry not to pick on them, but you know what I mean? Like, and then it has its own data fetching. Like people are a hundred percent gonna, if you tell them they can fetch in the components, they're a hundred percent gonna nest this. Like. Definitely, like this. This isn't just going to be like, oh, it happens sometimes. It's going to be like all the time if you let the floodgates open. Right. So, like, use the like the projection thing because the the children can can that are projected in like can render independently of the thing that shows those children. I mean, these are all smart optimization tricks, but there's no way you, you just, hey people, don't worry about this kind of stuff. You can collocate your fetching. You just make a f component async. It, like, is anyone not gonna nest async components? Like I, 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 it's going to be basically literally everyone. I, anything bigger than a toy demo. I, yeah, I don't know. Well, you don't want to wait at all either because 
Streaming. You want the parts of the UI that depend on the data to be able to flush sooner. So if you, the thing is the promise all isn't terrible because then you, at least you have it all in one place and you hoisted it up, right? But then you, you don't get that, you can fetch anywhere you want in your components thing that people are digging for right now. But, but the b big thing is you don't, uh, streaming. Um, and it can happen at a component level, which is probably fine, but like, you don't want the top of a hoisting to be completely blocking either. You you want it to basically pass the promises through and then where you use them or require the value, that's where you get it and that's what triggers the suspense. But React's got a component model, so that, that's as granular as they get, so that's as granular as they care about. Um, but I still have a hard time with like async await on the components. Yeah, yeah, that's that's perfectly fair. Yeah, ideally we would want to create the whole tree of, uh, up front. And that's why I'm saying like a preload function is, would be cool. But I mean, on the other hand, with these non-blocking patterns, I think you have a better chance of success. Like you can even picture what the UI would be. Like situations where you have that kind of nesting, if people aren't doing guards, but they, they like, they often, the reason people do guards often is because of the, the no data problem. So it's more like, I don't know if it's avoidable, but this is something that I'm kind of thinking about. Like, it's like the situation where you have a list, right? So essentially, you know, I'm, I'm just using solids syntax here, but like for each users, right? Solid right now, if this is like, undefined, it, it handles it just like empty array, right? We're, we're smart enough. But the truth of the matter is that nicety doesn't matter 90% of the time because this is this or whatever. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm just like pseudo coding this, but you know what I'm saying, it's item, whatever, user, whatever. Um, but what I'm getting at is, is that Usually what happens is there's also this, which is like, um, why am I, uh, UL, you know, and usually maybe like, uh, H3, like, and then there's this. There's, it's all in a show component so that show when users dot length, right? And I'm, I'm saying like, this is the kind of checks that I think will probably bite us eventually. Cause these are, it's about the UI. It's about like, not showing extra elements here. Whereas like, I mean, this example is not like hundred percent great, but you, you get what I'm saying. Like you, you make decisions based on layouts, not based on data flow. Right. Yeah. I understand people use react query this way. Um, so the, but the biggest difference with react query is, um, it's not blocking. It's not async components. That, that, that's, that's the thing. So yes, I think if you combine the non blockingness with, um, you know, this cache thing, you probably get the, the 90% case. And for the things that aren't le leverage that preload function. Yeah, I mean, my I, I still have this idea, but it, yeah, my, my idea for async components was kind of crazy. I was actually going to compile them back out 
to not async components. I, I, I think what put me on hold there a bit was because I couldn't think, like it would make the compiler trickier and TypeScript might not play nicely with us. But yes, there, if, if people really wanted that DX, I think it's achievable. It's just, um, you know, so that instead of writing create resource, create async, they could just write await. But I'm just syntax sugar thing. Mechanically, it's working the way that I'm explaining. Yes, that that's that's sort of where I was, where I was getting at, uh, but it, it, it's the semantics that are weird, right? Um, because I, it's it, my component. I talked about this before, but like, wait, a const res two equals await b. Like, you kind of expecting them to be se sequential here, or maybe you promise all of these. Which is fine, but I, I'm like, I, you'd be, you probably be surprised if console log high ran right away, and that's what I'm suggesting. I'm saying I would suggest like compiling away the await and then this actually running. So I think visually, semantically, it doesn't align. We could definitely do this because what's beautiful about async await is it's completely analyzable at the local scope. You don't have to worry about what's over here, which means that you, we could do this kind of uh, compilation confidently. But yeah, yeah, I, this is, this is why I was like, let's not async components probably. Yeah. But mechanically, I know how I want stuff to work. It's a syntax game always. Right. Um, anyway, we, uh, I, I think, I think, I think I'm done on, on this topic for now. Um, let's, let's, let's do this week in JavaScript really quick. <laughs> Famous last words, right? Let's 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 get this show rolling. Okay, give me a sec. But yeah, this is the kind of stuff that I'm working through, playing around with right now. I'm just getting the getting this all where I need to get. Okay. 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 Yeah, no, no glasses this week. That was a special occasion. I actually don't, I'm like looking for the glasses now and I don't see them. Either they got put away. Um, my wife helped tidy up the office while I was away. I was uh, at an appointment and I was running late and I was supposed to be in the Angular um, documentary to talk about signals. And I don't see them here. Or more likely, my kids found them. I have two kids. And I have two pairs, and they probably just ran off with them. Yeah, yeah, I, I have plastic meme glasses that I bought off uh, Amazon for a couple bucks. Yeah, there's there's a <laughs> there's an Angular uh, document uh, documentary coming out um, the, um, by the same guys who made the TypeScript documentary. So that should be pretty exciting. Yeah. I guess that was a leak. Oops. Be excited for it. <laughs> I'm sure they'll do a big official announcement. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. So let's, let's, let's get this going. It's not a leak. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> You heard it here first. No, <laughs> not doing that. Okay, um, let's do here. Um, all right, let's talk about this week in JavaScript. Um, I probably missed a bunch of stuff. Um, there's a few few topics that I found interesting enough to talk about. Um, but uh, yeah, let's just get started here. Let me get my screen going. All right. First thing, bigger release announcement, Tamstack Query 5. Very excited about this. I, it's funny, I had people just this last week in the Discord be like, SSR with solid start doesn't work with Tamstack Query. Why can't it like work? And I'm like, I swear, 
uh, I don't know the pronunciation, Orion had already created a demo of this. Well, it's because it was on a beta branch. It is finally out there. They didn't like highlight it here um, exactly. Um, but yes, na uh, to my understanding, the new version of Handstack Query V5 works with all the solid start stuff. Like it's completely swappable for create route data to do a lot of the really cool things. Um, obviously the mutation API is different. You don't have the forms, but you can use Tanstack mutations and it should all just work. So, and you can put server functions in them and you know, you're off to the races. So I, I'm super stoked about that. Other things that make me stoked about this is th these new agnostic dev tools. Guess what framework they're written in? Um, that's right. Uh, solids is actually the Tanstack dev tools are written in solid. And even though, you, so if you're using, View or Svelte or any of the other Tanstack uh, uh, libraries and you install the dev tools, you will be having solid running in your browser. So um, very cool stuff. I mean, obviously a lot of different options that are performant, but uh, again, it was one of those things where we they noticed a significant improvement over React when they switched to solids uh, and it was a lot smaller. So um, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So very exciting um, see this stuff. Obviously, Tanner and crew make do great things. So I, I, I am definitely excited about it. Yeah. Yeah, do check it out. I'm, I'm a big fan. Okay. Yeah, and fine grain persistence. I don't know the details on this, but I know for solid, this means that they incorporated the stores um, which means that we can do the data diffs uh, at the store level on the queries. So like, this is just, you know, like I need, I wanted to build some inbuilt stuff so that like I could build solid start and it was like part of the router that was optional to use, but still powerful. I could also just say like, don't use anything we just talked about um, <laughs> and use Tanstack, um, at least right now until we can get the really cool stuff in 2.0. But yeah, I, I'm very impressed with what's done. Ooh, is there anything for me to give me links? Um, I don't think I'll have time to cover it. Unfortunately, I'm running a little late, but do get me links. I'm, I'm interested. I, I did watch a compiler talk a week ago, which is actually largely what led to my article about locality of thinking. Um, uh, have you ever, have you ever, uh, put up a tweet and then you immediately regretted it after the fact? Um, I, I want to talk about this one because I don't think anyone understood what the hell I was saying with this tweet. And I think honestly, this is just, this was just a dumb tweet and I know a bunch of people liked it, but I was like, Oh man, I wish I could delete this thing. Um, yeah. The react India one was the one that I saw. Yeah. I, I, it was what really felt compelling about that one. was as I listened to it and they're talking about all the design decisions they made for the, uh, forget compiler and why react was suitable for it. I realized those were the exact properties of react that I, that I basically copied or stole or whatever for solid. Like we already had the ability to do these granular updates without the, the compiler, but to make the pull it off so that the DX was in such a way that you could think about it and like reason about it required, um, actually required a compiler on our part, not of the JavaScript, but of the props. Basically, once we could retain the locality of thinking, you, you basically get the benefits of the React, um, the, the result of the React model without having to rely on React's like actual mechanical model. You like this tweet. I was just being spicy. I, I forget, maybe Rackus or someone. Again, people just posting yeah, you know what it was? It was probably it was probably Adam Rackus. Right? He he also spawned another tweet that um that 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 I'll be talking about, but it was something about like uh, you know, the only every no other other frameworks can't compete with React because of they don't offer value or something, you know. Uh, oh, compared to the side of the ecosystem. And I was like, eh, I mean, okay, the ecosystem, 
Yes. No one can compete that. So ultimately, if you're if you're if you're weighing the check marks, I I, I think you're right. But it's like this whole enough value thing. You know, like oh, I you know, this this started like a while ago. People are like oh, I'll ch- choose the next framework when it's ten x better. I I'm convinced that the people who say that wouldn't wouldn't know what ten x better looked like if it hit them in the face. Like, um, <laughs> like obviously we're incentivized to keep, stay with the, you know, what we're familiar with and the current norms and whatnot. So like, it's no big surprise, but it's, it's like, it's, it's one of those things where like, I, the signals thing is a perfect example. Why does every framework have signals now? And every framework is moving towards fine grained updates. You could even argue that React Forget is an extension of this same trend at a certain level, and and like like because th- think like think about it when React came out and everyone was like just JavaScript, you know, and like no fancy DSLs. Like we've gone full circle here, and th- if you're on a certain point of the curve so to speak and the adoption curve you know front of the pack back of the pack like you, the flow of information will flow at just the right speed so that like something can do a complete 180 and you can believe that you've been on the same path the whole time right it's the violent jerk 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 reactions that cause like the the you know the the friction right so if React goes from React to, if it takes 10, no, 12 years for React to go from original 2013 Pete Hunt talk style React to like basically the thing that it, it was absolutely against, th- you know, 12 years later, if you stretch it over that period of time where the people who were, who were there at the beginning aren't there anymore, you can basically create a narrative that React was always on this trajectory. So like, I'm not, I'm not convinced, you know, people will even notice this stuff. Right. And I, uh, so my, this, this, this wasn't an anti DHH thing. All my replies were people talking about DHH and no build and all this stuff. And I, honestly, I don't, I think DHH in his position is fine over in his zone of the world, but like basically the impact of his perspective on where front end now is from mindshare point is just not even worth. Whereas react is now the big player. I was just telling the, not even the react team, but I was just like sort of playing at the idea that like the, the people who are very quick to kind of, you know, basically go, Oh yeah. You know, 10 X, you know, the, you know, in, in a few years, they're going to wish, that their perspective was as successful as, you know, DHH, <laughs> like, like that they won't be just spouting stuff that makes no, completely no sense. Now I'm not, this isn't a crack at racket specifically. I just, I keep, you know, I keep on seeing the same thing. It's like, it's like, it, at first it's like, okay, we, we want to calm people down. So they're not like jumping on the newest thing. But then after a while you're like, okay, like still doing it, still doing it. It, like the voice of reason is already there. Like, do we need to keep like, I I guess from my perspective, I don't, I don't see like what it adding anything new to the situation. Like everyone knows that fact um, without the reminder. So anyway, um, yeah, this is, this is as spicy as I get, which isn't very spicy, but apparently everything that I'm like, I just got, swarmed with like DHH hot wire HTMX stuff. I guess this is why people make uh do, you know, spicy stuff on Twitter so they can like just get in these crazy zones. This is not me. So yeah, I regret this tweet. Let me see if, if this is the right one. There's a few of them. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. This, yeah, this is definitely the right one. The thing is, the React is fast enough is not controversial. React is fast enough for a lot of things. I, I don't, I mean, would I trust my e-commerce site on it? I can think of better solutions, but even then, eh, right? I, if I could afford not to use React for that situation, I'd probably avoid it. But I think other than that, most people can do it. I, I, the reason bespoke frameworks, the more sophisticated app models haven't caught on is because they don't add value in practice, especially with React's ecosystem and Laveable. Yes, the, this is the real thing. I, it's just interesting to me because like, even if, if these sophisticated update mechanisms didn't matter, not just performance, but from a, like a DX standpoint of actually developing software, then like React wouldn't be bothering with forget. No, the whole ecosystem went to move to signals. So like, I'm not saying everyone should just like jump ship on these things. I'm just saying like, like, as I said, it's not Adam specifically. It was just like, there, there was a few of these kind of comments kind of floating around. So I was just like, eh, you know, t time to be spicy, but it was, it was dumb. I regret it. Forget is it just JavaScript as spell for us, yeah. Actually, or maybe, yeah, actually it's very similar. Or Svelte 3, yeah. Well, the, it's, it depends. What do you consider more complicated? I, I think a basic VDOM is simpler to reason about to a certain degree. But I, I mean, concurrent fiber-based VDOM probably isn't. The thing is, and I talked about this in my locality of thinking article, if you, one of the challenges of the React model is if you're ever asked to mod optimize, you're, you're, it's a much steeper thing. Like all the values that you care about suddenly are working against you. Yeah, I mean, uh, someone showed something. I, I think you could build a, a basic VDOM. Um, I think you could do it in less than 100 lines of code. So you just have to know what you're doing. You write, you write a hyperscript function, essentially. Value for business of product features deliver faster or with less bugs. So I think DX adds value, of course, right? So what I was trying to say is that DX and performance aren't unlinked. People always push the, the, the narrative, um, the, the other way where they, they're like, you know, give up DX for better performance, you know, kind of thing. But like these things aren't unlinked when you end up having to deal with the performance issues, then it becomes very much a developer experience problem. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> definitely. I've, I've def it's funny. It's not just me. Now, if you go to talk, I think Evan, you did one where he was like building signals uh, and Misco. Every, framework authors now go around showing people how to build signals because I think once you get it, you're just like, wow, this is so much easier. Like there's no rendering. It's just like thing updates. Yeah, Swix did a great talk on that. Yeah, that's true too, uh, for like React level. But like, I think a simple VDOM is, is um, like even like super very, even e like it isn't that hard. Um, I know I, I, I'm saying it, but yeah, it's. Um, is this the old Svelte uh, or Swix talk? Yeah, yeah. Let's. Share that around. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. Um, 
What is the real problems are after they're optimal and re-abnormal? Things like long tables, are you calling saying? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's interesting because I, my, the, the e-commerce would be fine for the React model if it weren't for, um, Rea like e-commerce is actually fine for React's model. It's that the implementation doesn't live up to like some other more performant things. Like I don't think e-commerce isn't doing a lot of updates. So the the issue, the reason I don't select e uh, React for e-commerce is around bundle size classically and uh, hydration cost and just stuff, server rendering speed and like stuff that could actually all be solved, um, you know, with a, a like Marco is a virtual DOM. We had, we had, um, uh, Michael on today, Marco six isn't, but Marco five and four is a virtual DOM. Great in e-commerce. They don't use a virtual DOM on the server, but like, it's not hard to picture like com compiling strings. I think I can't, I don't know if it's official with Preact, but they definitely have a, like a, a mode where you can do this kind of thing. So like, like, E-commerce is actually fine. The only reason that I, I pick out React is because specifically I don't think it's historically been good for the way that it's been built. That being said, like uh, technology-wise, I could picture an e-commerce that worked with something like React perfectly fine. Um, I think it's not as good as like resu like it's not optimal for like subcomponent hydration and resumability. But like I would never pick React apart because of that for e-commerce side. I think on the interactive side, React is also perfectly fine. Other solutions are slightly f faster. The only reason I give React grief is, um, is I personally don't find the model as like intuitive, but I, if technology wise, React is generally fast enough. So like even with your dashboard, again, I, if it was a big, large table, big dashboard, I think fine green reactivity is a better fit for like nozzle or ag grid or any of that stuff um things with really interactive multi touch points all that stuff so that that's on that extreme yeah i could say you get to a point eventually where signals is probably better than react model but everything before that react would be good at if it weren't for the page load scenarios around it yeah yeah I mean, and the problem is there's a legacy there. So everyone is doomed to this kind of thing eventually, especially when you have customers and are all around the world and big companies and stuff. Um, eh. Yeah, I don't know. I, I At this point, yeah, I would mostly skip Webpack. Like, I don't think bundlers are an interesting area particularly like they're interesting in what you can do with them. But if I, if my goal is, if you're interested in bundlers, be interested in bundlers and look at it. If my goal is just to build applications. Then I'm not terribly interested in bundlers. I, I mean, what's cool about Veet is it uses uh, like a very universal, same as roll up plugin system. So if you click and understand how to use it and what it does, I think you see enough use cases to be fair, unless you're like building plugins yourself. I don't know if I'd spend much time. Yeah. Web Webpack. But I mean, there's Turbo Pack as well. Um, we'll see what that looks like. I, I I don't know if Bundler is where I spend a lot of time as long as I understand the the concept behind it. Yeah, yeah. This this is fair, right? Like if you if your company uses Webpack and you need to understand how the configs work, then there there is value there. I'm more talking from like a. I'm building something new, but yes, if, if, again, if you have a reason to learn about it, then you probably, you learn about it. That's fine. You learn on the job though. That's the situation. You always learn on the job. I mean, you could hedge, I guess, but I mean, that's speculative. Okay. So we talked about why this was a mistake. Let's keep on going. Um, we talked about tan stack. Okay. Yeah. Last stream, I kind of went off on about how you need to know about the serialization boundaries. And I had a whole proposal on how to improve reactance, uh, server components. And people were generally receptive of 
what my proposal. And I actually think it's kind of beautiful in a way. It's symmetrical. It makes sense. Um, but I'm going to, I'm going to backtrack. I'm going to backtrack. I was convinced by Nikhil that there's some value in the React API. And I actually started, uh, I started kind of uh, looking into it. Obviously, being able to use all the existing tools is valuable, but it's because, again, it was kind of like what we talked about earlier. I'd convinced myself that I've solved a problem that probably isn't solvable. And he, he told me the, the solution for knowing, you know, the, all you need is an indicator. He actually literally said to me, even before this tweet came out, he was like, yeah, I just think that the IDE should highlight the different colors of the components so that, you know, at a glance you can go like, oh, okay, this is server component, this is the client component. The tooling is, can very easily walk in and find the use client for you. So then, you know, but the problem of putting on the outside is, um, you know, like obviously there's the benefit of not having them do wrapper files, which I still like. So like Nikhil was like support both and I'm like, eh. but I, the, 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 the problem of uh, putting it on the outside is largely like you will probably end up using it more than you want to. And uh, Nikhil actually came up with a good example of this. He's like picture a third party component library that has um that's ready for server components. Which ones are shared component? Like you would probably import everything as client or import everything as shared. Like how would you possibly know which components were which type when you went to go import them? And you, you'd go look at each component for use client, essentially. It, like, sure, they could enforce it on their time, side, but after a while, you would probably get lazy and you just start importing everything as use client from that library anyways, because there's some interaction downstream. Like the identity property of, of this is actually important because the receiver needs to go check. And I said, well, the argument there is only the first person who imports it needs to go check. Everyone else who uses it later knows what's going on. And and Nikhil's like, well, look, this can tell you what's going on, essentially. He didn't show me this. This hadn't come out, but he shared this with me yesterday because he was like, they should do this. And then, then like two days later, someone's like doing this. Um, but yeah, I want to talk about a bit about serialization and the locality of thinking because I, 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 we focused a lot about uh, on this, but serialization is a completely different beast because with read write segregation like immutability you know the, that the from data flow simply like what you pass out of your components nothing terribly bad can happen because you control what gets written to you control both sides but you do give up control of the read right but for serialization is different because we don't know what people are going to do with your data downstream, right? We, you, we want to know about secrets. We don't want serialization to magically fail and crash our application, right? While we can take comfort when we know our serialization boundaries directly, any component in between hides that knowledge from us. Did I did I publish this one? Yeah, it is published. I'm going to I'm going to throw this in the chat too so people can see it see this. But yeah, what I'm saying is consider you have a server component. Inside it, if we have a client component that requires one field, we, when we adopt the package, we look at it and we see that and we're like, "Okay, it's going to make sure we don't send anything, you know, that can't be serialized there." But then we install an update and now there's an additional client component inside that requires use of other data that we're already passing through. And we as a consumer don't know that anyways. Stuff will go to the client that we don't know about, even though we can see, you know, like 
we don't own the server, any place where we don't own the server client divide, someone else can still choose what they're serializing for us without our knowledge. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Is that like a cross between wiser and wizard? Yeah, I, I know. I, I Wiser with a Z is not a, is not a thing. Um, anyways. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so secrets can even leak with the best of intentions, right? So we, we, we need to guard it at the source. That's why, you know, the taint API is your server dollar sign. You know, we can help keep people happy by forcing things in separate files, but one level of interaction and we, like, we, know, we no longer know what we're looking at. So it is important that when we go in to a specific location where those, uh, you know, that we can, see, you know, hopefully see where the differences are. But once we step away, there's, there's basically no guarantee. So anyways, I was trying to say secrets are basically not guardable. Um, and serialization is also a pain because, I, I mean, picture two com different teams using the same component, like team A, team B is using component C and D inside the client component. Again, changes to what happens inside because team B needs a change of requirements is could cause A to fail because now data that was passing to C that didn't need to be serialized needs to be serialized. It's the same example of the example before. So we want that early detection essentially. Um, so like I'm picturing like what if D became suddenly a client component C, right? Like if you didn't, if B did that change, A isn't aware of it. You could argue that imports on the outside is good because now suddenly it will fail and they'll have to address that the change happened. But again, with what I said earlier, one level removed, they don't see it. Um, close your extraction, you know, makes things difficult because it's invisible. What I was trying to argue ultimately here with, the, with this, with this thing is that the best guarantee we have is our TypeScript, um, contract essentially. Like if we know that something needs to be serializable, if we can define that the best we can in our types, then a change of types will hopefully inform the owner of the other component. And hopefully as long as we're very specific in this sense, um, we can, we can basically trust not that something won't get to the client, but that it will be serializable. And in that case, it's okay that we don't know because as much as I'd like love to just like look at a file and know what's going to go to the client, it's basically impossible without going down the tree. Um, unless you're looking at specifically the boundary yourself. So yeah, I, I, I feel like I was probably a little bit overzealous last week. Like we need, we can't stop. We can't know absolutely what gets sent to the client. We can only really make sure things that shouldn't be definitely aren't. So locality of thinking can't apply to serialization. So it's questionable the value of adding friction here when, um, you know, it's, it, it basically just isn't solvable, right? Like, and I don't mean in the way that like, when you have like, uh, like react, someone can go mute, even though it's supposed to be immutable, someone can go mutate that data and cause bad things. And you, just because that's the case doesn't mean it's not solvable because you can set a convention and perfect instructions and say, don't do that as a pattern. And if you employ that pattern, you won't get in trouble. Whereas with this serialization problem, you could try and give people the perfect instructions and it can still leak out because there's no way when you're dealing with multiple people that like, you know, someone without inspecting it themselves can take responsibility. There's, there is, the contract is not as, um, you know, strict as we're used to with like our local thinking with unidirectional flow. 
So basically, I'm arguing that the way you know what's serializable has to be through the types of the props. So this is a large justification for React Server Components API, essentially. Like, the awkwardness of defining it, like you, the identity piece on the inside is important and the awkwardness from the outside doesn't ensure the stuff anyways. So you're, you're it, to a certain degree, you're making people do no, more work for not much gain. You, what you want is for them to be able to see the difference at a glance, but they can't depend on it anyways. So you need different mechanisms and maybe, you know, a helpful syntax highlighter. So th that's just where I'm, I'm at on this. I'm, this is why when I've shown the examples earlier, I was using use server. There might be other way. We need to think about how to solve some of the missing pieces that we have in Bling, but I'm probably, there, there's benefits to adopting React APIs from a tooling standpoint, even, instead of trying to fight them on it. And I'm having a harder time justifying not using that direction once, you know, you start kind of, you know, I, I've been going back and forth on this. There's something about it that doesn't sit with me right, but it's also like, I don't know if it's a solvable problem. Cause like, ideally you could maybe get to a world where use client isn't necessary. Like you can analyze and basically like do smarter things, but as an API, it's not a bad place, I guess, like given all the options, which is surprising myself saying that. I mean, we can't guarantee that. That's the pr problem. Like some things aren't serializable. And while I would love to have an interface um, where we know these things, um, and props do give us that to a certain degree. It's it's when when there are boundaries or components. I mean, Marco and Quick have a different problem because it's much more sub level. At a certain point, um, it, this really gets in our way of just writing code that does stuff. So, no, I don't. I don't. Some things just aren't serializable. A lot of things are, we continue to work on making things serializable, but when you get in, into like references of functions, like so functions that return functions, you get into a zone where it's like can be solvable, but it's, it's very complicated. I mean, I suppose if you get to a place where everything was serializable, I don't even know if you'd want to serialize it. Um, but yeah, that's, this puts more context on what Michael was talking a lot of it, a bit on serialization earlier in the stream. Yeah, yeah, they wrote some stuff up, but I don't think, I think the thing is they understand that, that what their audience is. My need of their explanation of why they went that way is probably different than the need of the, the people who would use the API. Cause like their picture if their explanation was kind of like the way I talk about this stuff. I think most of the consumers would be like, what the hell are you guys talking about that? Well, that reasoning doesn't make any sense. Yeah, file extensions are pretty quick to throw out the window. The problem is, like, fundamentally, client components are the special thing, which means it's a complete reversal. And it's not even that they're server components, it's that the most components are shared components. You know, this even goes with that uh, HackMD I showed earlier, where I was like, I can't tell if this is a client component or a shared component or whatever. Because my point is, data fetching if data fetching shouldn't be the criteria for whether something be, is a client component, um, it's it's the use of, uh, and I know this looks a lot like a like a hook or something. So it's hard to come to come come up with heuristically with a clean um, thing. That's an, another reason for using a different convention or a different name for for these kind of these pieces. But data fetching shouldn't be the determinant whether it's a client or server component. What should be the determining factor is global state, because that can't be shared, because it can't go across the boundaries. 
and without severe uh, costs. And I could argue that's it, like context API is the only thing that differentiates it. But I can understand if somebody has like on mount or create effect and it doesn't run and they didn't import it as a client component, they're like, I expect this to work. Um, that's another reason. Um, but nothing else actually matters. Like having something like a signal, like I guess an event handler is something like if, if you see an event handler, there's an expectation that should get to the browser. But like other than effects and event handlers, um, and as I said, we SSR those today and they don't run on the server. And context, client context, there isn't really any difference between like something that has to be a client component, but um, it's enough. So yeah, I, I definitely think data fetching shouldn't be the defining factor though, um, if possible. It's just hard to come up with a universal model. Um, anyway, let's go here. Yeah, okay. Do, 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 do. So that's my talk on that. V conference talks up. Okay, last few here. Okay. RCs. This is an interesting one. I've been watching Ryan Florence a lot recently on his tweets because he's been he's been hitting a lot of this. It's like I've been trying to design an idealized what I consider an idealized server component like solution and thinking about things that I think are foot guns and then working through those and figuring out what to do. And Ryan in real time seems to be hitting all the, like at almost the same time, maybe like a, you know, a couple days behind, keeps on hitting the foot guns that I imagine that the React system would have. Like, so I'm like, hmm, I think this is a problem. I want to design around it. And then Ryan the next day is like, this is a problem. And I'm like, okay, you know, so I've been watching a lot and they've been talking about it a lot, bringing a lot of attention, but Finally, the other day, he's like, RC is farther from production ready than I thought. Time to get back to work on the current Remix APIs. I'm generally excited about RC, so given it's a clear view to build migration, blah, blah, blah. So they're actually stepping back a little bit. So I don't know. I think this is news. I think it's newsworthy. So um, I just wanted to throw that out there as something a little bit interesting. Um, uh, sorry, in, in regards to what, um, like the, the, I think what this is saying is that remix three won't have server components remix four. Well, I think they're pushing it back and they're going to do the rest of the remix three stuff that they want. Yeah. I mean, the, the remix team has multiple times said that RSCs aren't where they need to be for them. And they vet them, they spend the time to vet them each time. So props to them. Uh, they, Hydrogen had a really hard time. They have every reason to be skeptical, right? So, yeah. Um, honestly, I've never seen a technology shoot higher, faster, and then crash harder than GraphQL. What happened? Another Rackus tweet. Um, I swear I like this tweet. I bookmarked it. Whatever. Um, I don't know. I think everyone has their own theories here. I don't think GraphQL is dead, especially not in corporate or enterprise. But I think the remember we did that chart and we showed the trend of like getting to the opt like data fetching patterns and getting to the optimal peak. I, I wonder if I still have it in Excalibur. I might. I might not. Let's zoom way the hell out. Um. Yeah, I don't, I don't know if I, I don't know if I, I guess it's not in here. I guess that stream was long. Oh no, it was, it was right here. It's like, well, that stream was long, long, longer ago than I thought. Um, but GraphQL was almost like this pinnacle of the client normalized caching. It's still to this day, the most optimal solution, but we kind of went up the hill to go back down the hill because of complexity, right? So, um, GraphQL is dead. You're making me look. This is this is too much. Okay, yeah, okay. This is this is a joke, right? 
Twitter versus reality, yeah. Interestingly, though, it's, 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 it's a fairly, like, I mean, <clears throat> I'm sure the curve is a lot slower. Like, this is more variable than I expected, but yeah, no, GraphQL is no way dead, but it's escaped our mind share because of, as I said, I, it's my belief that the, the, the community that wanted GraphQL on the mind share, like the tech Twitter side, would want to replace the backends with TypeScript anyways. So they'll, they'll always go to a simpler solution if they, you know, so they just kind of sidestepped it. But I, I honest, I, GraphQL is still so huge for those who use it because there's like nothing that does what it does better. Um, it's just a question of whether we want that. But sometimes, like, it's so funny because like, GraphQL is all over the place. Like th there's a reason why, like, again, I'm talking about Netlify, Netlify Connect is like basically a GraphQL layer over your data layer, but it's even more than that. Like eBay was adopting GraphQL uh, a couple of years ago as I, was, as I was walking out the door. I, I told you I was building a GraphQL client for them to work to Marco that could leverage like the different modes of like being fetching server only, server and client and make sure that it's efficiently partially hydrated. So like, like uh, where it's used, it's, it's irreplaceable. So yeah, I don't know. It's interesting though, as like in the startup culture, it, we've definitely gotten away from it, but yeah, I don't know. I think the return to monoliths, um, for authoring, like all these meta frameworks has actually decreased it, um, significantly, uh, RSCs, these kind of patterns, it's like the benefit of the, was the cash, you know, um, and it, without it, you know, I still think GraphQL is amazing. Like everything we, 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 we want, um, to do, it can do. It's just more often than not, we can do a lot with less. Well, it's tricky because from an external API standpoint, you could argue that REST is still like more consumable for people. I'm, I'm t right. Um, but like, yeah, uh, Theo, you know, he had that graph. Everyone knows the graph. I think the graph is dead on. The tricky part is like, um, the things we talk about as hobbyist tech Twitter kind of developers is not the middle section of that graph. So from as the other sections encroach and push GraphQL in the middle tight, no one's talking about it. The truth of the matter is it's still used everywhere by huge companies. Yeah, I mean, it's the bet, like it's incredibly powerful. Nothing else does it. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah, that's a great use case for it. Um, yeah, it's just, we're, we're not going to be talking about, it. we're going to be talking about these data action loader things because we're trying to simplify. The problem is it got to a point where everyone's like, oh, I need a GraphQL server. Like back when it's like, oh, I need an API server and I need an app server. And then it's like, okay, how do I build that API server? Well, I should build a GraphQL. There was a time period where like the getting started instructions were kind of insane. People talk about the complexity of web dev right now, but the truth of the matter is like, um, like with tools like beat and like, you know, these meta frameworks out, it is the, the, the ground zero is a lot easier than it was. Like it's doing more, maybe harder to explain to people what it does, but the ground zero and what you get for it is, is a lot higher now than it was even a few years ago, considerably. Um, okay. One last topic. I was supposed to talk about this last week and I forgot about it. Um, Burke here has been going into the JS framework benchmark and adding a bunch of libraries. Oh, it got merged. This is the perfect time to talk about it then. Um, basically, he added a bunch of signals implementations 
for libraries that supported signals because they were kind of missing, like Preact signals, not in here. Why not? Um, you know, and what does Angular look like with signals? And can you guys guess what the general trend is going to be here? Dropping signals version now, we're still working. And the frameworks, a lot of them are like, kind of like, I don't want to talk about signals yet because they're not ready, you know. But can you, I, I just, I just want to throw it out there. Can you guess? All right. Okay, so here's the update. Wasm bind gen 108. Solid 1.8. They got it already right behind it. I don't know what silicon web is. Lit 3. Oh, nicely done lit. It looks like lit 3 has actually Im um, improved the performance uh, considerably. Uh, lit was always around 1.2. Now they're about 1.8. It's, it's like a couple percentage, but like you don't ex expect to see this often. Is this, is this official results? This, this, this seems, these, these, these numbers seem, wow, I wasn't, oh, Ember 5, okay, at 2, yeah, so these are official results. OWL, this is the block DOM framework um, that, that uh, build on block DOM. So this is the full framework version sitting there in the mid. Okay, let's, let's, let's look at the actual full results here instead of just the one snapshot. I, I, the, the trend that I want you to kind of notice here, and I, it's so, you always try to explain this to people, is adding signals to a library makes it slower. <laughs> okay, I will zoom in, yeah, that's, that's a problem. 720p is bad for this, okay, I will, I will zoom in, give me a second. Okay, let's look at the current results and we will zoom in. See, the actual results are much bigger. I'll, I'll give one more zoom level just for you at all. But um, the, there's too many frameworks now. Um, look how many React. React signalless. I don't even know what that is, but let's, let's remove all of these and then put in things that we care to see. So we need... A bunch of angular ones because I want to show the difference between the different angular ones. Oh, what did the did the angular non did the angular signal stuff not end up in the final release? We're gonna have to go back to the issue then if I want to make that. Let's do Svelte four. Let's put React in there. Um, not that one. I want React hooks. Um, let's put in Inferno, um, let's put in Solid, okay, so yeah, the, this, damn it, this hasn't been updated, I'm gonna have to go back to the other one, because these are all, uh, okay, never mind, I have to go back here, we, we will, uh, We'll zoom in. Yeah, yeah. This is what I this is what I wanted to to see though. Just kind of get a, a, an idea here, because Angular No Zone is pretty freaking fast, and this is No Zone I gathering with or this control flow. People don't realize that like if you kind of avoid Angular's update cycle completely and manually wire it that like the performance of it is actually considerable, right? Um, but Angu Angular Signals is, you know, a little bit behind there. Um, Vue Pinya is in here, but Vue by itself is a little bit faster, so it's about 125. But here's a good one. Preact classes, Preact hooks. Oh, is Preact Signals not in here? I d wow, hooks actually, reduce the performance for Preact? That's interesting. In a few key places. Sorry, this is just interesting to me. Same creation time, same replace time, slightly slow, slower um, 
uh, partial update. Swap rows. Swap Is this swap rows? No, yeah, select row, sorry. Select row. That's a significant difference. And then that's swap rows. Oh, interesting. And then the rest is about the same. So yeah, the fine grain changes actually impact the hooks versus the classes for Preact. This is interesting. Um, let's let's step back out here again because there's some other there's some other one. If you wonder what the control flow is, it's like the new control flow stuff. I think that they're doing. Um, yeah, here's a direct signals comparison. I think this is a local machine run. Yeah, so NG4 is, I guess they never had the optimal swap rows in Angular, which is why it was always back there with React, which also doesn't have the optimal swap rows. So the new swap rows puts Angular considerably further up in the table. And again, signals drop it considerably because of the over select row. Interesting. This tells me a lot about Angular's implementation of signals because this is what view problem used to be. You'd think that select row would be optimized for signals, but this is where it's paying the price of being both top down and fine grained. Um, view used to have this problem for the longest time where, yeah, okay. This is, this is cool to see. Anyways, the, I, the point of my story is if you look at anything here, uh, let's see if I can find the PR for the Preact. Uh, let's go pull request. Is Preact signals in here? Close. Because I, I could have sworn that I saw add Preact signals and hooks. Yeah, so it kind of splits the difference. I guess because signals uses hooks, it's actually much slower. That's interesting. My point is add signals to any, actually what's, does Marvin actually have a thing? The, this is expected to be here. The benchmark case is this only measure how quickly an update reflected in the DOM. They only measure how, raw rendering performance. Yes. They don't measure not because the reason why an app might be slow. Yeah, sure. Signals were written over the other 90% were reflected in the repository. But in terms of for tuning parts of the firmware, they deal with updating the DOM, but not much of that. Many apps that the reason is bypass and blah, 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 Okay. Yeah, so basically they're not adding signals for DOM performance. They're adding signals because it's more, changes are more isolated, which means that it's possible that you can update a lot, bypass a lot of the virtual DOM cycles when you get more large and complex applications. Um, Yeah, so, I mean, to be fair, the, yeah, signals are just good in general, but adding signals to a framework at a raw level does not make it faster, it makes it slower. It's what you can do with them that's important. So th this was fun to see a bunch of updated benchmarks here to, to really, you know, nail that. Why keyed? Um, because uh, a keyed means you keep the references to the DOM with the data and you're not like, you, there, there's a whole article about this, but it's the same reason why you use key props in React. Being keyed is very good. It should be the default. Any frameworks that don't make it the default, I'm always call a little bit sus, but like, you know, Re React might like, tells you that you should be keying all the time because of how important it is. And it, it's because, the DOM inherently has state, whether it's from CSS or whatever. So like at a certain point, you do want to replace the elements and not try and hijack the ones that are there because it bleeds, it leaks, weird stuff happens. This benchmark was one of the places where people first understood that because they were getting better performance in this benchmark by using non-keyed because it, it would just like update text nodes rather than swap DOM elements in a table. But, this led to 
us really like almost all the framework authors deciding that keyed was an important thing. If you go to his blog, uh, Stefan, early days, he wrote an article. Oh, I got to go way back. Uh, let's say like January. It was between. How far back? Benchmarking, round one, round two. Okay, maybe it's, let's go July, round three. He wrote an article um, about this. September, or why am I not finding it? Yeah, keyed versus non-keyed. This has tons of great links about about like they're thinking about it. But I love this example. He shows the difference between between keying and not keying. Like he can test it very easily by just setting a color, not using the framework. But obviously, that's not a realistic scenario. This one is a little bit more realistic. He's showing an animation state on a X and showing that when it's keyed and you click the X the item just gets removed. Whereas it actually with non keyed, the animation actually, tr it's still, the X is still animating on the next row. Um, anyway, enough of that. But I thought that was just a fun thing to see um, that essentially um, signals have benefits, but it like mechanically they are an overhead. And it's okay because of what they can accomplish um, if you let them, right? But just taking your favorite signals and go, or f favorite framework and jam signals into it, doesn't make it slower it's, or faster. It's the same reason like when you add state management to React, you make it slower, generally speaking. Like, so, all good. <laughs> this, this one, yeah. Four separate meta framework implementations later, I think I found the correct abstraction for building JavaScript server apps. <laughs> yeah yeah now this is the last thing i saw before i jumped on the stream and uh yeah no i think he's onto it too i think vinci is great um i can't wait to get the solid start beta out but i ran way over time so i blame michael we were talking too long so i think i'm gonna cut the stream today um still figuring out stuff for next week so have nothing to say about that, but I will advertise them in next week. So until then, have a good one. Have a great weekend. Bye, everyone. I tried to be quick. <laughs>